Hello, I'm Svetlin Naku from SoftUni, the Software University. I'm very excited to introduce this first part of my free full Java Foundation course, which teaches important concepts from Java programming, such as data types, arrays, lists, methods, strings, sets, and maps, one them streams, classes and objects, and object-oriented programming, OOP principles, exception handling, and common Java APIs. And it prepares you for the Java Foundation's official exam from Oracle. Exam number 10811. Let me introduce myself first. I'm Svetlin Nakov, a PhD and an experienced programming instructor who helped more than 100,000 young people to begin coding, learn software development, and start a tech job. Just Google my name and you'll find more about my me, my achievements, awards, programming books, video lessons, software academies, conference talks, and other teaching activities. Check out the self to need alumni on LinkedIn to see the profiles of my students who have already learned programming and started a tech job. I will teach this course together with my colleague, George Gurkiev, who is a senior Java developer, our twinner, and an experienced programming instructor. I should warn you that this course is not for absolute beginners. So, if you have no prior experience in programming, make sure to go over my full Java Basics course first. Uh, you can see the link in the description box below this video. In this first part, part one of three from our Java Foundation course, you will discover many interesting programming concepts such as data types in Java, primitive and reference types, and type conversion. The next topic will be working with arrays and lists to process sequences of elements. And the next will be about defining and invoking methods, methods with parameters, and returning results from a method call. In the next two parts, we shall cover the rest of the course topics, which are maps, which hold key value pairs, which are also known as associative arrays, also sets, strings and text processing using Java Lang string and the string builder class in Java, objects and classes, uh, defining simple classes, instructor, uh, constructors, instance and static members, methods and properties, etc and the principles of object-oriented programming, OOP, encapsulation, inheritance, abstraction in interfaces, and polymorphisms, the exception handling concepts in Java, the try-catch-finally construct, and Java exceptions hierarchy, and how to throw exceptions, and basic Java APIs, such as the math class, random, arrays, formatter class, big decimal and big integer, and the Java time API. All these topics are essential for your further development as a software engineer, so make sure to solve the hands-on exercises in addition to this video. To learn coding, you should code, no other way. Exercises are more important than the videos, so solve the exercise problems, submit them in the judge system, and you'll get the practical skills and experience from this course uh, lessons and topics, not just the knowledge. In case you have a question or a difficulty solving some of the exercise problems, or you have a bug and you don't know how to fix it, we are here to help you. Join the SoftUni community at softuni.org and ask for free help from our mentors. Yes, you can ask everything about this training and you'll get a free answer. Now, let's start with this course lessons. Let's start with the course content. What shall we learn from this Java Foundation's practical training course? We'll start from Introduction to Java, where we'll talk about the basics of Java programming, things such as the Java syntax, uh, creating simple programs, using the integrated development environment, the IDE, comparison operators, the ifs, uh, switch case statements, creating expressions, statements, and simple calculations with Java using the logical operator operators like the, uh, if, else, uh, switch case, etc. and whoops using the for loop, the while loop, the do while loop and other whoops, the break operators and also debugging Java programs uh, using the, the built-in debugger and using breakpoints, uh, watches and, and others. 
The next topic will be about data types and variables. Data types uh, in Java, including the in integer, the real numbers, four double, int long, uh, and also type conversion and type casting, how to switch between types. Uh, for example, how to cast uh, double to long or in the opposite position uh, direction. And uh, I will also introduce the Boolean and character data types and the string type from the uh, built-in Java types. Arrays uh, is the next topic. Uh, we'll talk about processing sequences of elements, ordered indexed sequences of element. I will, uh, will explain how to read arrays from, from the console, how to process arrays, how to iterate over arrays, how to use the for each uh, loop, uh, which goes through each element uh, from the first to the last, how to print arrays, uh, and some simple array algorithms, such as finding the minimum, the maximum, and others. The next topic will be about methods and what is a method, uh, declaring and invoking methods using parameters, passing arguments to the parameters of the methods, value types and reference types and what's the different, method overloading and returning values from the method. <coughs> this will be in the first part and in the next part we'll continue with lists which are edit, editable sequences of elements uh, where you can append, you can insert, you can delete an er element and we shall explain how to work with lists, how to read elements, how to print elements, how to process lists, uh, some basic list algorithms such as reversing list, traversing a list, finding minimum, maximum, finding subsequences, sorting lists, sorting arrays and similar operations. The next topic will be about text processing in Java and working with strings. I will, I will introduce the Java lang string immutable class. We'll explain how to we do we read uh, strings from the console. How do we print and uh, format uh, printed uh, and print formatted text as well as printing strings. How we process strings by finding substrings, fi finding some uh, occurrences of something in a string, uh, for example, a word or a letter, uh, how we can extract a substring, how we can uh, uh, do some other operations like removing a portion of the string and some other uh, things. Uh, we'll talk about the Java Lang string class and using the st its standard methods and also the Java Wank uh, string builder class, which is designed to build strings and it works faster than uh, Java Wank string because it's not immutable. The next uh, topic will be about associative arrays, the so-called maps, and one of the functions and the streaming API, which allows to process with less code uh, sequences of uh, elements called streams such as uh, for example arrays, lists, maps uh, and others. We'll talk about the map data structure which uh, maps value, uh, key to value and holds key value pairs and its implementation the hash based maps hash map and the linked hash map and tree map which are three different styles of implementing a map the map interface. We'll then talk about lambda functions, which are anonymous functions, which take some arguments and transform them to some result. And then we'll uh, deep dive into the streaming API, how we can filter a collection of elements, how we can map a collection of elements to uh, another collection of elements, maybe from a different type, and how we can process sequences, maps, and others. Uh, this is a very important topic because it's it's about processing elements in Java. The next topic uh, will be about objects and classes. It is the first from the OP object-oriented programming uh, sequence. Uh, we'll talk about objects, classes, the built-in classes in Java, and how to define simple classes, how to define uh, uh, constructor, um, method, and other 
uh, pieces of the class and how to instantiate the class uh, from and create objects from it. In the next topic, we'll, uh, which will be in the last part of this uh, course, we'll talk about defining classes, how would we work with constructors, fields, properties, public and private members, uh, how to define getters and setters, uh, how to implement encapsulation and hide the uh, internal object state be behind uh, getters and setters, how to use instance methods, constructors, uh, and also using static members such as static uh, uh, methods, static uh, fields, and also static constructors. In the next topic, we'll discuss in details the, with a lot of examples the principles of OOP object oriented programming. Uh, which are encapsulation, inheritance, abstraction, and polymorphism. We'll talk about encapsulating data behind and hiding data behind properties, uh, getters, and setters, inheriting classics and interfaces to transfer uh, fields and data from and methods from one class to, an, to another, to a child class. Abstraction and uh, working through interfaces and abstract classes and polymorphism, uh, which allows uh, a variable to hold uh, um, a, a base type to hold data from a child type. And also we'll talk about uh, object comparison, abstract classes, abstract interfaces and class hierarchies and also about uh, how to use the equals uh, compared to and other common uh, object uh, related functionality in Java. The next topic is about exception handling. We'll talk about exceptions in Java, how to catch an exception, how to use the try catch construct, or try finally construct, try catch finally in its full form and how to throw exception using the throw keyword as well as defining a custom exception class and also using uh, declaring uh, throws in the method uh, signature and how do we deal with this runtime exception, also the uh, compile time exception and, and the others. Finally, the last topic from this course will be about Java API classes. We'll talk about the Java Lang math class and basic mathematical functions, uh, random numbers and Java U2 random class, the arrays class, uh, which uh, works with uh, arrays and provides some utility function functions, formatter, which uh, allows system out print ln and string dot format, uh, formatting a string by pattern and calculating with uh, high uh, precision and with big integers uh, using the class big integer and big decimal and how to deal with money calculations and others and why we should be careful about this and finally we'll talk about and demonstrate how to work with dates and time and all, all of this uh, time-related calculations such as parsing dates, such as a calculation of the dates between two dates and, and some others. So uh, let's go ahead with this course topics because I believe they are, will be interesting for you and as a developer you need to understand them very well. Before the start, I would like to introduce your course instructors, Svetlana Nakov and George Georgiev, who are experienced Java developers, senior software engineers, and inspirational tech trainers. They have spent thousands of hours teaching programming and software technologies and are top trainers from South Uni. I'm sure you will like how they teach programming. George Gurgiev uh, is a senior technical trainer at SoftUni. Most of this course will be taught by him. He is a senior software engineer with many years of experience with Java, JavaScript, and C++. Joyce, jo uh, George enjoys teaching programming very much, and uh, it is he is one of the top trainers at the Software University. He have uh, delivered over 300 technical training sessions on 
the topics of data structure, algorithms, Java Essentials, Java Fundamentals, C++ Programming, C Sharp Development, and many others. Uh, he is a developer at the virtual racing schools uh, where he writes Java, JavaScript and C++. He has uh, six years of experience in training, maybe more, and more than 20, maybe more than 15 years of coding because he codes from uh, school years. And he wrote a driving simulator in the high school from scratch without Unity or a framework. And he played around OpenGL, um, physics, SDK, WinRT, and many others. I have no doubt you will benefit greatly from George's lessons, as he always does his best to explain the most challenging concept in a simple and fun way. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Svetlin Nakov, uh, PhD. Uh, an experienced software engineer, programming instructor, tech entrepreneur, and motivator for thousands of young people to learn programming and become software engineers. You can look at LinkedIn in the Soft Uni alumni to see how many people have been influenced by me and Soft Uni to start uh, programming and uh, get a tech job. I love teaching programming and I believe that everyone should try coding and see if it could become his passion and profession. Over the last 20 years, I have spent more than 3000 hours teaching coding and software development. I know how to explain complex topics with simple words and real world examples. Over the years, I have written more than 15 books along with my colleagues on computer programming and software technologies. And I have a bachelor and master's degree and doctoral degrees in computer science. And tech education is my passion, my real purpose in this world. I'm co-founder of three successful tech educational initiatives attended by more than 200,000 students. The National Academy for Software Developers, which I started with colleagues in 2004. The Telerik Software Academy, which were formed in 2010. And the Software University Soft Uni, which I found with colleagues in 2014. And Soft Uni is the biggest of these initiatives. It is the largest tech education provider in South Eastern Europe, and it is expanding globally. Over the last 20 years, I have developed an award-winning practical training methodology for software engineers based on high-quality teaching content, intensive hands-on ex exercises, and hands-on projects that combines computer science, engineering concepts, and software technology to build solid developer skills. I like my students to get everything required uh, by the software companies and then start a job. I'm happy to teach programming all over the world and I have helped thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of students to uh, learn coding and start a job. So that's why uh, it's my passion to train software engineers and to give them a profession and job. That's why I'm teaching this course because I want to share my knowledge and skills and I'm really happy when I see my uh, students to become good software engineers, uh, start jobs and get a career growth over the time. Before we dive into the course, I want to show you the Soft Unit Judge system where you can get an instant feedback for your exercise solutions. SoftUnit Judge is an automated system for code evaluation. You just send your code for a certain coding problem and the system will tell you whether your solution is correct or not and what exactly is missing or, or wrong. I'm sure you will love the Judge system once you start using it. Thousands of students are using the Judge every day and I'll show you how um, useful is it for, uh, for you as a beginner in the software development with Java. So you can test your code at the judge system uh, using the link provided in the code lessons. 
and uh, it looks like this and you put your code in this field here and you click the submit button and you'll get uh, an answer. I'll get, I'll make a demonstration for you. So you open the judge system and there is a contest. This is called contest, which consists of set of problems. And these problems are uh, here. So you click practice and you choose a problem, for example, this one or this one, and you write your code and in, in IntelliJ IDEA, you paste it here and click submit. And once the submission is sent, you wait a bit, you click here, refresh, and the result comes here. So your code could be either correct or not. And if it's not correct, you can see what are the mistakes. For example, here, the mistakes are that you have one zero in addition, uh, which is not required in the output. So looks like it is correct but you have one zero uh, exceeding zero that is not needed and you should check uh, change change something so for each problem we give you as a hands-on exercise we have one separate uh, problem and you paste your code and you submit uh, it to, to check your solution so the judge system is very very helpful for you this is something which obviously doesn't work so use the judge system because practice is very 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 important in fact people were coding by coding not by watching videos so you are highly encouraged to solve your hands-on exercises and submit them in the judge to check them for correctness this first lesson aims to briefly go over the material from the Java Basics course and revise the key concepts from Java coding. If you have basic experience in another programming language, this is the perfect way to pick up on Java. If not, you'd better go through the Java Basics full course. We'll go over Java Basics syntax, input and output from the system console, Conditional statements such as if else and switch case, whoops, like uh, for, while loop, and do while, and debugging and troubleshooting Java code. If you are well familiar with all of these concepts and you don't need a revision, feel free to skip this section and go to the next one where we talk about data types and type conversions in Java. If you don't have significant experience in writing Java code, please solve the hands-on exercises in the judge system. Because learning coding is only possible through coding. You cannot become Java developer without writing significant amount of Java code. Let's start. Hello everyone, this is George. I am your technical trainer and today we will be talking about the Java programming language. We will see uh, its basic syntax. We will learn about the ways we can declare variables, the way we can branch our execution of the Java code we're writing. We'll talk about how we can loop our code, meaning execute it multiple times. And we'll see other interesting things we need to know about Java before entering into the full part of its features. So most of the topics for today you should already have some idea about but we will do a brief overview of all of them so that we're all on the same page and we can get everyone up to speed so we can then continue on to the more um, more specific and uh, di more difficult topics so what are we going to talk about today we're going to start with the introduction to the java programming language and its basic syntax things like the de de declaring variables where the entry point of your program is and so forth then we'll continue on to the operators and specifically the comparison operators, meaning how you can uh, do operations with data inside Java with basic data types. Then we will see how we can branch our program because every reasonable program has some branching in it. It's not just a sequence of events. It's a sequence of events that split off into different sequences of events depending on some conditions or some input. 
And then we'll see how we can use the logical operators to extend that branching and do more complicated checks and decide what needs to happen in different circumstances. Then we'll talk about loops, meaning how we can execute a piece of code a random number of times. In, and in random, I mean a number of times which is not determined while writing the code, but rather determined, uh, for example, at execution by input from the user or by some other uh, conditions which are generated during the program execution. And then we'll finish up by talking about debugging and troubleshooting our programs. Now we will be doing some debugging and troubleshooting throughout the lesson, but uh, we will focus at, in the last part of the lecture on the tools which the Java integrated development environment, which we'll be, we will be using called IntelliJ offers us. So we'll see what that gives us, how we can use it, how to use it optimally and so on. Okay, so let's get started. These are topics which you should have some understanding of, but we will cover them again, just so we're sure that everyone is on the same page. So what do we need to know about Java? Well, Java is a modern programming language which has a huge community behind it, uh, an international community and a non, um, let's say, non, not exactly monetized community, meaning it's uh, the, the specifications for Java are generated by a sort of an open committee. It's a modern language which gets updated all the time. There was uh, an, a period in the early 2000s what, in which Java didn't really get a lot of updates, but currently it's uh, getting updates every year or so. So it's really an up to speed programming language which has a lot of the features other newer programming languages have introduced. It's flexible, meaning that you can write code in different paradigms and in different ways, although the, the preferred way of writing code is through object-oriented programming, which we will cover further on. Uh, it's general purpose, meaning that it isn't specif specifically for, let's say, games or specifically for business or specifically uh, for desktop applications. It's a language that can be used for pretty much everything you need, although its major uh, usages are in business applications, um, in um, larger company software, um, although it does have some um, entries into the uh, world of mobile development. Actually, a lot of uh, mobile apps are implemented in Java. Uh, and it has some really neat uh, libraries which allow it to even function as a client-side scripting language like JavaScript. So there are libraries and frameworks which allow you to write Java code which is executed inside the browser directly. Although it, it is actually Java code translated into JavaScript, but let's not dive into that right now. So the preferred way of writing Java is object-oriented programming. And Java is actually object-oriented by nature, meaning that everything you create in Java is a class or an object. And classes and objects are concepts which, which are created in programming to represent the real world. So we will be talking about that further on. But for now, what we need to do, we need to really know is that Java is statically typed, meaning that once you create a variable of a certain type, for example, an integer, that variable remains an integer. It will always contain an integer inside it. It can't contain anything else, meaning that Java checks for incorrect assignments of data, meaning if you have a variable somewhere and you accidentally assign it a value which isn't of the type of that variable, you will get a compile time error and compile time errors are good things because you don't have to debug them. The compiler just tells you what's wrong. Whereas runtime errors aren't that easy to debug because you need to execute the program again and again until you find the issue. Okay, so. Java is also a compiled language, meaning that there are two steps in running a Java program. The first step is compilation, meaning that you compile, you gather up all the code you have written and you create an executable file from that. And then after compiling that, you run the Java program. So during compile time, you can uh, the, the Java uh, compiler can detect errors in, for example, data variable type assignment. Uh, or other stuff which uh, will help you write your code error free. And only then after all of the, the compile time checks are done, does the program run. So there are, in compiled languages, there are also two um, descriptions of uh, time, let's say. Uh, there's compile time and runtime, 
meaning that compile time is when you see when you hear that something is known compile time it means that it is known while you're writing the code for example if you're executing something 10 times and it's always 10 times it doesn't depend on user input or some calculation that's compile time information that's uh, information that is always the same regardless regardless of um, the execution of the program whereas if something is runtime for example user input is runtime then you don't know that during uh, compilation meaning you don't know that when you're writing the code it is something you need to handle during the execution meaning that your code should be able to handle different situations uh, of user input and, and handle them correctly so when we're talking about compile time and runtime, that separation comes from the fact that Java is a compiled language. Okay, so how does a Java program look? Well, every Java program begins with a class, some class. It's usually going to be the class main in our examples, but further on, there are going to be other classes once we cover the subject of objects and classes. And inside that class main, you will have a public static void main and this is called a method. This is the entry point of every Java program, meaning that it doesn't matter what code you have in your program, your program will always start from here. It will compile everything else, but the execution, the runtime of your program will start from here, from the first line inside this static void main method. Okay, and here, of course, we now write our source code so we can implement Java code. Further on, we will learn how we can create other methods which accept parameters and have return types. We will see how to use them, how to call them from main and so on. But for now, all we need to know is that every Java program starts over here. That is the first instruction executed by any Java program. Okay, so when writing Java, we will be using the latest uh, Java development kit, which is the JDK 12 currently. However, uh, you could even fall back to JDK 8. That's what I'm using currently. Uh, the, the subjects we will be covering in this course will not be needing all of the advanced features from Java 12. That's because a lot of the code which we're going to be using is fundamental uh, computer science uh, concepts which have been implemented in Java since a long time ago. However, we will be using some new stuff like lambdas, for example, which are available in Java 8. So you will need at least Java 8 and preferably Java 12 so you can access all of the new functionality if you decide to use it, but we won't be requiring you to use it. Okay, so what will we be using for development? We're going to be using IntelliJ IDEA. This is a powerful, very powerful uh, development environment for Java. This is how it looks like. Um, it's a product of JetBrains. It's one of the best editors I've ever used as a programmer, and I've used a lot of them, uh, including a lot of uh, Microsoft ones, a lot of open source ones. Uh, IntelliJ is pretty good at um, guessing what you're uh, about to write and uh, giving you hints on how to write it faster and saving you time doing that. So, you know, as programmers, a lot of our work is actually typing in code. Well, IntelliJ helps you type in less, meaning that it can auto-generate a lot of code you, you would be needing. Okay, so IntelliJ, will, we will be seeing it in a bit, and for using IntelliJ, you would need to create a project. So in IntelliJ, everything is bundled up inside projects. How do you create projects? Well, you open up IntelliJ, and you're going to get this screen if you haven't created any projects yet. If you already have created a project, you will probably get that project loaded in. And you can say file new project, which creates a new project. Now, for now, we will only be using the default uh, Java project type, meaning that you don't need to be selecting anything over here. These are frameworks which are uh, for more advanced application development. But for now, we're going to be writing code which executes and reads input and writes output on the console. So we will not be needing any other frameworks to add into our project. So you pick your Java version here. If you've installed JDK 12, that's what you're going to get. Because since I'm using JDK 8, well, my JDK version is 1.8. That's how Java numbers them. Okay, and then you click next. 
you don't need to use a template. We will be doing command line applications, but you don't need to be generating the com command line template. We just need a simple project and we're going to type in next here and then we will, we will just create our classes one by one. So once you have that created, you will just have a simple package generated over here and then you will have a main class generated here and this is actually what our code will look like. All of the code we're going to be writing in the first few lessons is going to be located inside this public static void main method. This is our entry point. So any code you write here will be executed. You start your program by using these icons on the top here, top right. Uh, the play icon you see is just executing your program without the debugging feature, meaning that you execute your program the way it would execute on a normal PC if, you're, uh, if you've deployed that to someone's computer, if you've deployed your program to someone's computer. My suggestion is that you use primarily the debugging mode, which is this icon over here, which allows you to place breakpoints uh, to inspect uh, the data types of variables and their values and so on. So my suggestion is use the debugging mode, although you could use the run mode if you are confident that your program is running correctly and you won't be needing to analyze any errors it might run into. Okay, so if we just run it, we'll, we will see that this, this progr program executes and it actually does nothing. It just finished with ex exit code zero, which means it finished successfully. Uh, it does nothing because we haven't entered any code over here. Now we'll see how to do that in a bit, but before that, let's see what else we have to discuss from the slides. Okay, so this is how you create a new project. Oh, you could, if you want to save up uh, generating classes, you could select the command line application template that will generate you uh, this main class. Otherwise you would have to add it manually. So if you don't generate, uh, if you don't use the command line app template, you would need to go over here on the source folder, uh, add a new package, name the package in some way. In this case, we just got a package automatically, which is named com.company. That's the standard way of uh, typing uh, packages in Java. You usually begin by your program, your company website in reverse. So if your company is named company, you, you go like com.company.something. That's just a convention. It's not really necessary. Your code will still compile if, even if you don't write it that way, but that's sort of convention that that's how people usually do it. Okay. So uh, from there on out, what do you do? Well, you click on this package over here, which you've just created and you just say new Java class and pick the name of, name of that class. In our case, we automatically got a main class generated because we chose the command line program template. And then you just need to write the main method inside it, which is just this called public static void main, these parameters inside it and the method body. Now we will be talking about methods and what all of these public and static and void mean later on. But for now, all you need to know is that you need to have this method so you your program can be run by the Java runtime and your code comes over here. Okay, so from here on out, what do we do? Well, let's see how we can actually do some programming over here. Now, you probably know that programming is just creating and it's actually processing information. It's not exactly creating information. It's just processing information from one type of information into another type of information. So one type of input into some type of output. Okay, so how do you process information? Well, you need to get that information into processable items. You need to have an item which you can process. And the items which you use in Java to process information are called variables. Variables are things which you let's say read from the console or initialize with some value. And then you can use to edit that value, to access that value, to print it on the console and so on. So the typical way of initializing variables in Java is naming the data type of that variable, then telling the Java compiler what you want that piece of information to be called, meaning that you can, if you want to store integer numbers, let's say you want to um, calculate the sums of integer numbers or calculate um, 
um, how many apples you have left or something, you would create a variable called int number of apples. So what we tell the compiler here is that we want an integer data type, meaning that we will have the integer numbers inside this variable and name the variable in some way so that we can refer to it later on. So Java knows how we call this piece of information. And then after we create this variable, we can give it a value, meaning we can place apples inside this number of apples. And let's say our apples are six. Okay, so doing this will create a piece of information inside the computer. It will name it number of variables that will be um, allocated somewhere on the program stack in the RAM memory of your computer. And in that piece of memory, the value six in binary will be added. And you can use that value six from here on out with this number of apples variable. For example, you can increase it by saying number of apples plus plus, meaning increase the number of apples by one. This would initialize, uh, this would change the value of the of number of apples of the memory, which is uh, pointed by number of apples. It will change that uh, memory address to contain the number seven. Okay, so this is how you create variables. And again, this is something you should already know by now, but we're covering it just in case. So here's an example of initializing an integer number, which has the value of five. Okay, let's actually do that in the uh, IntelliJ uh, IDE. By the way, IDE, whenever I say IDE, what I mean is integrated development environment. What does integrated development environment mean? Well, you could actually write code in just notepad, meaning that you can start a notepad and copy this code over here, and this would still be valid Java code. However, you would need to manually, using the command line, uh, call the Java compiler, tell it to compile this file, first off, save this file, then tell the Java compiler to find this file in your file system, compile it, and after compiling it, you would need to manually call the Java runtime to execute this the compiled class file you get from uh, your Java code file. So there's a Java code file, this is the Java code file, in this case main.java, and actually I have some other Java code files opened up here, in the IntelliJ editor, for example, this is another Java code file somewhere in the Java libraries. You can guess that by the fact that it's that it has a yellowish background. Okay, so this is a Java code file somewhere in the Java libraries. And if I want to use that Java code file, I just type in, let's say in this case, random, which is the name of the Java class and the Java code file, random, let's call it random, let's just import this. and IntelliJ automatically imported it, meaning that IntelliJ automatically told the compiler that it needs to go and fetch, fetch this Java code file when it's compiling my main.java Java code file. Okay, so when you're writing code like this, if you're writing in a simple notepad, it's still Java code. It can still be compiled by a Java compiler and you can do it manually on the command line. You, you type in if you've installed Java and the Java uh, development environment, the JDK, Java Development Toolkit, uh, you just type in Java C, as in Java compile, Java C, and then type in the path to the file, and that will generate the compiled class file from your .java file, meaning that you will get a main.class file somewhere next to your main.java file. And then on, you can use the Java runtime environment to execute that class file. And in each step of writing your code, you would need to be manually adding the uh, features you're using from Java. Whereas if you're using an integrated development environment, the development environment does all that for you. So you don't need to think about um, typing in stuff manually or compiling manually or debugging manually or uh, attaching uh, files together and so on. So this is all handled by the integrated development environment and all integrated development environments have such features. Okay, so this uh, brief uh, sideways explanation was um, uh, intended to um, demonstrate that actually you don't need a program to write another program. You just need, you, you just need a way of writing text and create and converting that text into 
into operations which are executable by your uh, machine, meaning that you need to convert it into machine language in some way into ones and zeros. That's something that the Java into that the Java IDEs do automatically for you. So that's why we're using them, using them, but it's not obligatory to use them, although it's almost obligatory if you want to be uh, a fast developer. Okay, so uh, let's create some variables. Let's create our int number of apples and we can uh, shorten it like this. It, it's, a, it's a fine way to shorten it. It's understandable. Num is uh, a frequent, frequent enough um, usage in programming that people understand that num means number. Okay, so num apples, this creates a variable. This creates a piece of data and we will be talking about data types later on. This creates a piece of data inside our, our uh, random access memory of our computer and names it numapples, meaning that every time we access numapples in some way, for example, increasing it by one, this increases the number of apples by one, increases this variable by one. Every time we access it, it will access that part of memory for which this uh, variable was allocated. Okay, now you don't need to initialize a variable immediately after uh, creating it. You can also have this split. So you can have an integer number of apples and then followed by a semicolon and then have the number of apples set to some value and you can set it to values as many times as you want. Okay, so this is how you create variables and this is how you give them value. And if you want to do that in a single step, you just say number of apple, int number of apples equals the number you want to initialize it to. Okay, so that's initialization of variables. Now, if we start this program, it will still do nothing because we haven't, it will actually do something, but we won't see the result of it doing something unless we inspect memory. Okay, so let's continue on from here. Now the, the code I just write contains an integer data type. This is the type of your variable. Remember when I said that Java is a statically typed language, meaning that this number variable will always be an integer. It will never, never be another data type. It will never contain anything else than integers. Okay. And this is its name by which we access it on, in our code. And this is its value, which is the data which we write into the random access memory of our computer. So this number variable name actually isn't really seen by Java. It is only available compile time. Runtime, this number variable is just an address in memory. So the computer just sees this as an address in memory and addresses in memories are just numbers. So your random access memory is numbered one, zero, one, two, three, and so on. Uh, and every variable you create is translated into one of these numbers later on in, in compilation. Okay, so once we've created our variables, let's see how we can use them actually, because I, I actually did use my variable, I increased it by one, I changed its value by one, but since we're writing console applications, there isn't really any way to view the results of our program unless we, unless we use the console input and output functions which Java provides. So Java has a built-in scanner class and other libraries which allow you to read and write to the console. Now, in our case, the console will be this part of the IntelliJ, IntelliJ integrated development environment, meaning that this over here is the console. But when you're deploying your application to actual users, which won't have IntelliJ, you will be sending them files which are executable through the uh, Java runtime. And if they start your program from the Java runtime or from its icon, if they're using, for example, Windows, and they double click it and they have Java installed on their computer, uh, their program will start in this command prompt or something looking like this command prompt uh, window. So it will look like this. So your program will be execute, executing in something like this if it's running on Windows. So this is just a text input and output system which your program will access to read its input data and to print its output data. Okay. Now, how we will be deploying applications to actual users, we will cover further on. It's not something we're 
really interested in right now because we're just learning how to use the Java code. But uh, we will learn how to read and write our input so we can see what our programs are doing. Okay, so Java has the scanner class which allows you to write and read from the console easily, meaning that instead of writing your own code to uh, access the console and um, read bytes from it and so on, you have a java.util.scanner which if you import you will get that Java code file compiled with your Java code file when you start the compilation process and you use this scanner to read input from the console. Let's do that actually. So instead of having her number of apples initialized with a compile time value of 6, which will always be 6 if I don't change it to something else. Instead of that, let's use a scanner. So I'll say new scanner, which initializes an object which reads from somewhere. Where does it read from? Well, well I supply that as an argument to this scanner initialization. So I'm saying Scanner, please read from system.in. This is the standard input output for the system, meaning this is the console input. The Usually the standard input output for a system is the console. Okay, and now once I've asked Java to create this reader, I can say, okay, once I've created it, I want to be using it. In order for me to be using it, I need a variable by which to use it. Same way as when I had a number of apples, my six apples when I had them, if I wanted to touch that number and change its value, I needed a variable for that number, which holds the value of that number. Well, in the same way, I would need a variable which holds the value of this scanner, so I can use it to scan. Okay, so what do I say? I say this is a scanner scanner. I'll just call it scanner because that's the name of uh, the class. Okay, so scanner equals new scanner reading from system.in. And now instead of initializing my apples with a fixed number of six, I can say scanner dot give me the next integer from the console. Okay, so let's now increase this number of apples by one and now put a breakpoint over here. Now we'll be talking about debugging at the end of the lecture, but briefly, when you start your programming debugging mode, it will stop its execution on each of these breakpoints you place. You place them by simply clicking between the line number, between here and the start of your code. So you click somewhere in between. You know, placing a breakpoint here will cause the program to stop its execution over here and wait for you to allow it to continue it, its execution. Now why would you do that? Well because when you stop at the breakpoint you can examine the state of your program meaning you can examine the value of the variables which you have in your program and their values. Okay so starting this what are we going to get? Well our program is now waiting for input from the console and now we can input a number, for example, 42. And when I press enter, it will, it will finish executing this line of code. It will get the integer from the console and write it into this variable because I said that this variable needs to be initialized with this value. Okay, and then it will stop before it, increme it, before it increments the number of apples by one, meaning that number of apples will be whatever I entered on the console. Okay, so if I enter 42, the program will stop here and I can see in this variables view down to the right, I can see that I have a num apples variable and its value is 42, which I entered on the console. Okay, and if I want to continue on, I would need another line of code and another, another breakpoint. Let's see if we can do it like this. Now, to continue to the next breakpoint, what you do is you either press this resume program button up here to the, to the left or you just press F9 and this continues on to the next line of code and since we have a break uh, it continues actually to the next breakpoint in your code and since we have a breakpoint on the next line well we stopped over here and now we can see that number of apples is actually increased to 43 and uh, IntelliJ also lists this in line so you can see over here I have a num, num apples uh, column 43 describing the value of apples currently and you have the other variables too so here over here we have a scanner which is something a bit more complex but still it's a value which uh, IntelliJ shows you so you can view it more easily so the variables inside the program once you've stopped at the breakpoint can be viewed from this variables window 
And in addition to that, you can also write expressions, expressions here. So you can go over here and say insert or press this button. Okay. And say, let's say, for example, num, num apples plus 10. And this will just calculate this sum. So this will return 53 in this case. So here it says num apples plus 10 gives the result of 53. Okay. So that's what uh, that's what the what that's what debugging actually is. You stop your program at breakpoints and examine the values of your program at that breakpoint. Okay, continuing on from here, we had a program which read an integer from the console, assigned it to the variable num apples, and increased that num apples by one. All things that you should have seen by now, but we're cover covering them so we can formalize them a bit. Okay. So you have other ways of reading input from the console. The scanner, in addition to reading integers, can read entire lines. So you can say, instead of reading uh, apples, you can say scanner dot next line. And this will read the so-called string variable. And let's call this variable line. So a string variable just contains a sequence of symbols. So a line from the console is a sequence of symbols. So you can enter anything you want on the console and then read it with next line and that will give you that sequence of symbols. Okay, so if I pr place a breakpoint over here and start this program now in debugging mode and I enter some line on the console, let's say hello, and I press enter, the moment I press enter, the next line uh, operation will finish. It will get its value and set it to the line variable over here. And now if we examine the line variable, we will see that its value is hello. And again, we can examine it from here down also. Okay, so that's how you read from the console. Next line gives you strings and you can use that string either to say, for example, a name or some other input, some other sequence of symbols input, or you can convert that input. For example, if someone enters a number, you can get the number, let's say 42, and this is a string currently because you read it with next line, and to convert it into the value of 42, notice the lack of uh, quotes in this value over here, you use integer, integer dot parse int, parse int, and you supply this value inside parse int, and it returns an integer variable. Okay, so one way of reading numbers from the console is using nextint. Another way of doing it is by using scanner.nextline and then converting that into an integer. Let's say int um, number is equal to integer.parseInt and you supply the line you just read. Or you directly say scanner.nextline and you place it over here inside parseInt. Both will both would work. This is a bit more descriptive. So now if I start this program, we will see that line will contain the string 42, whereas number will contain the number 42, the integer value of 42. So I type in 42. And here I see that line is the string 42. It's just a sequence of symbols. It can't do arith arithmetic on it. However, number is the number 42 and we can do arithmetic on the number variable. Okay, so that's reading from the console. And of course, there are things like next double, next line, or simply scanner.next like this. This will read the next um, sequence of characters, which isn't separated by some of the separators. Now, what are these separators? Well, spaces, um, new lines, tabs, and so on. Other white space characters are separators, meaning that if I say uh, scanner.next and I initialize a vari variable string input equals to equals scanner.next, what will happen if I place a breakpoint directly after that is if I write hello space world and I press enter, what I'll see is that input got only hello. And if I say scanner.next again, I can do that actually while I'm in a breakpoint. I can insert the watch here and say scanner.next. And this just read world. And if I edit it and press enter again, it will get the next value and then the next value and then the next value. So scanner.next reads words. You can think of it as reading words, reading by a word. Okay. So let's stop this program. We don't need it anymore for now.
you can also parse lines into doubles by using double dot parse double or you can use scanner dot next double which effectively does scanner dot next and then parses it into a double through double dot parse okay so how do we print to the console well you can use the system dot out uh, libraries or system dot out um, collection of methods and there are various ways various ways of printing to the console system dot out dot print just prints whatever you uh, give it so if you add a number it will print a number if you uh, supply a string like this one it will print a string and so on print line will print the same way as print does however it will add a new line character at the end it will just move the cursor on the next line after printing whatever you supplied to it okay so the more interesting usage of printing is formatting. So you can do system.out.printf, f short for format, print with a format, and then you supply the format string, meaning how you want the values you're printing to be displayed. And in this case, we want to have the string name followed by a space, followed by some string, which is the string. Well, the first string after the format which we described. So this over here is the format. The first variable, in uh, the first thing we supply to printf is the format. And then it starts accessing the variables after it. So over here we have this format for which contains the string name and contains the digits described by age over here. So this is what printf does. It just prints formatted output. So if we wanted to say, um, enter a number and write on the column. So let's uh, read the line with the scanner, read a num read the read the number from a single line on the console, parse it into an integer, save it into the variable number. And then I want to print out system dot out dot print F. You just entered do, uh, column and I want to print my number over here. How do I do that? Well, I need to tell Java where I need this number to appear in this format. Well, I need it to appear at the end of the format. So if I start this program and input a number, I will have that I will have this message printed. You have you just entered and the number I entered. So if I enter 42, I got you just entered 42. Now notice that from here on out, we don't have we don't have a new line. Why don't we have a new line? Well, because printf doesn't print a new line. If you wanted to print a new line, you say percent n, which means print a new line over here. So if I start this over here, like this, I actually just click the start with code coverage, will, which will uh, uh, do some stuff I don't really need to. Uh, starting with code coverage just analyzes which parts of your program are executed. We don't need that right now. So let's start the normal debugging uh, mode. So if I enter 42, now I got you just entered 42. And the other messages on the console, which I get due to the debugging mode are printed on the next line. And that's thanks to this percent and I enter, I added at the end of the format string. Okay, so this is how we print formatted output. So printing with the symbol D prints digits, integer digits, and you can pad that with a certain amount of leading digits if you want. And if you add F, that prints a floating point number. So D is for digits of an integer number, whereas F is F, uh, digits of a floating point number, meaning a number like 5.3, let's say. Okay, so if you want to print with the string percent zero three d that means percent the num uh, write the number i supplied to you but pad that with zeros so that it has at least three symbols in it meaning that in this case we got zero five five instead of just five five on the console and for printing floating point numbers you have the point two meaning write this number with two digits after the dot of the floating point number. These are just specific formatting strings and then you don't need to really remember them. You just need to know how to look for them. How do you look for them? You type in Google Java format strings or Java format floating, floating point. 
into string or Java format floating point string and that will give you a lot of results on how you can print in various ways. Okay, now string.format does the exact same thing as system.out.printf, however it doesn't print to the console directly, it just generates a sequence of symbols, it just generates a string. So exact same, uh, exact same mode of operation like system.out.println, exact same way of supplying parameters. However, it doesn't really print to the console, it just creates a string, which you can then print to the console or use for something else. The use of string.format is to create a string which you can use for other purposes, for example, to connect it with other strings. Okay, so we have a task here and we'll do it briefly. We will have three input lines entered, a student name, an age and an average grade, and we need to print it in this format. Okay, and we want the grade to be printed to two decimal places, meaning that we would need what? Percent dot two F. So we're printing a floating point value and we want that floating point value to be printed with two digits after the decimal point. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we already have our scanner and what we need to enter is what the student name, their age and their average grade. And each of these will be on a separate line like so. Okay, so let's say that the string name is equal to scanner.nextLine and the uh, age is equal to scanner.next we could use next in but let's use next line because we're informed that it's going to be an entire line containing just that number so let's read that entire line and convert that into a number using integer.parsent and the last thing we need to enter is the grade meaning that we need to enter double grade which is equal to double dot parse a double from the next line after that. Okay, and how do we print that out? Well, let's use that string dot format function and then print the string we just got. So we will do string dot format. And here we will have the uh, input string and I'll just copy this I got here and then I'll convert it into a Java uh, format string. So I'll paste this. I'll provide the parameters, the name, the age, and the grade we want printed. And now I'll just change whatever I need so I can get the correct output. Okay, so instead of name, how would we print a string? Well, percent %s. How do we print digits of an integer number? We say percent %d. And how do we print the grade? By the way, I would guess that uh, there's a missed column here. So the grade, and what do we have here? We have percent %f for pr printing a floating point number, but in order to print that to two decimal places, we need to say decimal places two. Okay, so running this program will just allow us to input information like the one we have here. And I will actually copy that and paste it into the console over here. Uh, and what did I get? I didn't get anything. Why didn't I get anything? Well, because I just formatted the string, but that doesn't print to the console, that generates a new string. So this is a piece of information I'm not using. Why am I not using it? Well, because it's not sent into a variable. I need to send it into a variable and then send that variable to the console or directly send this result to the console. Meaning that here we just gener generated a result, but we're not using it. Okay, so let's use it. String uh, output equals string dot format this and then system dot out dot print print a line let's print a line with this output okay so print this output on the console and now we're using this value so we have a value somewhere in memory and we're telling the java runtime that we're going to be addressing this value through this variable so we when we talk about this variable we're talking about this value Okay, and now we're just saying print this value on the console. So if I start this code again, and if I copy the input again, and paste it into the Java uh, console, when I press enter, I'm going to get name John, age 15, and grade 5.40. Is that correct according to the input over here? Yes, it seems correct. Okay. So continuing on, we can test this program a lot more, of course, but let's not play around with it right now. We have uh, other stuff to cover and here we have a solution, which is pretty much similar, similar to what we already did. However, in this case, it's printf instead of string.format and then print. Okay, 
So another thing we need to discuss are comparison operators in Java. So what we had up, to, up until now was just reading variables. Uh, if we want to do something with these variables, we use operators. So we use operators which operate on the data which we have. Operators are just parts of Java syntax which uh, execute actions on some data we have. Now, comparison operators and specific are things which can compare values inside our Java code. Now, of course, we have the normal operators which are adding numbers, subtracting numbers. So if you say um, int sum equals five, four plus three, well, this is an operator. It's an ar arithmetic, arithmetic operator, which sums two numbers, which are to the two sides of that plus operator. So these operators, the, ar the arithmetic operators are the same ones you're used to from uh, mathematics class. So it, they're, they're nothing special. Well, what are comparison operators? Well, comparison operators are a way to examine values against other values in Java. So what you have is equality checks, inequality checks, greater than, greater than or equal, less than and less than or equal. So the mathematic operations basically, however, they're, uh, the way we write them is a bit different. So if you want to check for equality, you use double equals sign instead of single single equals sign why well because the single equals sign just changes the value so this is this single equals sign means change the value of the memory which is pointed to by this name variable whereas the double equals sign checks whether two things are equal and that returns either a true result meaning that two values are either equal or they are not equal. So there are only two possible answers to the question A equals B. So this is just a check. And the result of this check, since it's only two possible values, is a Boolean result. So R equal equals A equals B. So this is this might seem a bit confusing at first. So what we're saying here is you just need to know that you don't you shouldn't be reading this as equals. Is it is assign you use this uh, equal sign here as the word assign so we're, what we're saying is r equal this piece of information gets assigned with the value of does a equal b and this is either true or it's false and in this example it's what it's false right because 5 isn't equal to 10 so the r equal var variable will contain the value false Okay, so you can save that into a Boolean variable and then print it out, for example, or use it in, an, in, a, in a conditional statement. We will see that further on. Or you can just print it on the console. So if you say, is A, equal, is a less than B, then you'll get the result true for these two variables. And here we have other examples. You can play around with these ones uh, at home if you want and you can check other values. But again, this is something you should already know by now. So we're just formalizing this information and uh, gathering it up in a neat little place where you can go and check later on because what programmers do isn't remember. What programmers do is remember how, how to search. So pro programmers are good at searching for information, not at remembering for information. So that's why we have an entire lecture which has this information summed up so you can find it easily if you need to. Okay, so we've reached the conditional statements which will give us the answer to why do we need to compare numbers? Why do we need these comparison operators? We saw what conditional operators are now let's see how we can use them in if-else statements. Now what is the if-else statement? It's something which you see in this picture. So an if-else statement, a conditional operator, a conditional uh, operation, a branching operation in programming, is where you check for some condition, for some comparison, for say, let's say, between two variables, and then you output either uh, you execute either one piece of your program or another piece of your program or you just do nothing so this is what the if else st statement does this is the way you can branch your program now typically programs don't just read input do calculations on that input and write output that's not a program that's a calculator you know that's what calculators do now 
computers can be calculators, but, but they can also be much more than calculators. They can do different things based on different input, meaning that they can handle different input differently. Okay, so what does the if statement do? It tests for some condition. Now, like we had over here, we entered a name, an age, and a grade for a student. And all of these are potential targets for an if statement where, you, where we can check something about those variables. Now, let's simplify these examples a bit and let's just see how the if statement works. So the if statement is just the if keyword followed by these curved brackets and then followed by these curly brackets. And inside that if statement, you place the condition which you want to check. So if you want to check something, for example, let's say you have two numbers, the number A, which is, let's say, 5, and the number B, which is, let's say, 10, like we had in the slides a bit, uh, a bit back. If you say, if A less than B, then system.out.print B is larger. What will happen if we execute this code, we will see that the output B is larger is printed on the console. Okay, so now we have that on the console. Now, if the values were different, if the values were reversed, let's say, what would happen is that this code will not be executed. So we have a branch of code over here. We have our program running and doing sequences of operation, operations, and then it does a check. And if that check is true, it executes some other code and then it returns to wherever it was. So it returns after it executes that code. Now, this is just a con an if check. So this code will only be executed if A is less than B, which is always true in our case since that's what we create uh, as variables. That's why, by the way, IntelliJ marks this code in a deeper yellow indicating that this value is always false. So IntelliJ warns you about stuff like this where you might not be doing what you're thinking you're doing. Now, if these were uh, numbers that are read from the scanner, next int, and b is also equal to scanner.nextint, if these two are numbers read from the scanner, read from the console, this warning highlight disappeared because now this isn't something that's always going to be true. In this case, it might be anything. That's actually the use of conditional statements. You check for conditions which are usually determined by the input in some way. So the user, for example, in our case, enters two numbers and we check which of them is larger. Now, if this isn't true, the rest of the code will just execute. So if we say system.out.print, dot just print line uh, program exiting, this code will be executed. So whether or not A was less than B, this code will execute normally just like uh, it would have if the if condition didn't exist over here. So now if we want to, let's say, read two numbers and then print um, uh, in one case one output and another another output. So in this case, if we print, if we say, um, five and 10, like we had initially, we're going to get B is larger. And now we, I noticed that we missed the new line symbol in this output. So we're going to get B is larger in this case. However, if we input them in another way, let's say 10 and five, we're not going to get anything. We're just going to get program exiting. Now, if we want to print A is larger, if A is the lar larger value, well, that's the case in the else statement in the else branch. So the else branch gets executed only if the if branch didn't execute. So if you say if and this expression over here is false, then the else branch will execute without the if branch executing. Okay, so now what would we want to print here? Well, we want to print a is larger than larger than B or equal to B. Why do we say that? Well, because if A isn't smaller than B, so if this is false, then A is either equal to B because this would be false if A is equal to B, or 
a is larger than b. So we can't just say a is larger because if they are equal, well, they are equal. So executing it like this, what we what we'd get is if I enter 10 and 5, I'd get a is larger than b or equal to b. So only this part of the code executed. Now, uh, one thing you can do with if else statements is uh, use if you're going only to have one line of code in them, one statement, not exactly one line of code, but one statement, one thing that gets executed, one uh, piece of code followed by a single semicolon, that's uh, a neat way of figuring it out if it's one thing or more than one thing. Each thing, each, each statement in Java ends with a semicolon. So if you only have one semicolon, that's only one thing. Okay, so in this case, you can remove these brackets. So you can say if no brackets, else no brackets, because both of these do just one thing. If they do just one thing, it's okay for you to um, use no brackets. Now, my suggestion is don't do this. It's really easy to make a mistake if you don't always add your bodies. These, these are called the bodies of the um, conditional statement in this case, but it can also be the body of a loop or the body of a method like we have here in main and so on. So always add these because it's very easy to make a mistake. It's very easy to add another statement over here and think this other statement is part of this else, but it actually isn't. It's a, co a part of code which will always execute if you add it like this. So always place the brackets so you are absolutely certain which parts of the, ex the code are executed when. Now, that actually gives us a uh, neat way of chaining if and else method, uh, if and else checks. Now, before we see that, let's try to separate this into um, a more specific output. So let's say that if A is less than B, then uh, if A isn't less than B, then we want to print precisely whether A is larger than B or whether A is equal to B. So in, in our current situation, we print one or the other, but we want to be specific. We want to be concise, whether it's equal or it's larger. Okay, so how do we check that? Well, if A isn't less than B, then there are checks we can do. What check can we do? Well, we can check if A equals B inside this else. So we only enter this part of the code if A is not less than B. So this code will only execute then. And then I say, if A is equal to B, then execute this code. Which is this code? Well, this code is going to be system.out.println and this line is going to be A is equal to B. That's what I'm printing. And if it isn't equal to B, what's left? Well, what's left is that A should be larger than B because we know that if we got to this part of the code, then A wasn't less than B. And if we got to the else over here, so if we got to this part of the code, then then A wasn't equal to B. Well, the only other option is for A to be larger than B. Okay, so you can place if else's inside other if else's in any way you like. It, this is just a part of code that executes. When the code reaches here, it doesn't really care whether it's in an if or an else or whatever. It, it doesn't know, it just executes. So you can nest these all you want. Now, a uh, more optimal way of writing this, so it takes a place space and is a bit easier to read, is what did I say about uh, not having to add these brackets when there's only one thing over here? Is there only one thing over here? Well, yes, this is only one thing. It might seem like two things, but it's part of the same if-else statement. So this thing goes together. Yes, there is code inside it, but the whole piece doesn't have any uh, semicolons after it. Now, if there was another statement over here, then it wouldn't be a single thing. But there isn't. There is only a single statement over here. So this else only contains a single statement. And I can remove the braces from this if statement, and even IntelliJ allows me to do that automatically by pressing Alt and Enter over here. And if I do that, look what I got. I got an else if. There's actually no such thing as else if like a keyword. It's not a separate keyword. It's just a sequence of an if 
followed uh, an else followed directly by an if which has its own else. So this code is absolutely identical to this code. So what am I doing here? I'm saying if a is less than b, then print whatever whatever message I want to print. Otherwise, if a is equal to b, so otherwise if this wasn't true, but if this is true over here, then print that they are equal. And and if this thing isn't true, what well, what's connected to this not being true? Well, this else over here. So we're chaining them. You can think of it as a chain. You check this, and then you check this, and if nothing matches, you go to the last else. Okay, and how it gets structured in code, I just showed you uh, by typing them out before I remove the braces. Okay, so if I start this program, it will now list whether A is larger, equal, or less than B. Okay, so if I enter 10, what I'm going to get, am I going to get something? Well, I'm not going to get anything because I haven't entered the other number. Then I'll enter 10 again, and what did I get? I got A is equal to B, so I got this part. And if A gets larger than B, if I say 10 and 9, then I'll get A is larger than B. Okay, so this is what conditional statements look like. So here's another example. We're reading something from the console and we're checking whether it's larger than a certain number. And if it is, then we print something out. Otherwise, if we want to do something else, we can, print, we can use an else condition. If we want to react to the statement not being true, the, this check not being true, we add an else statement. In some cases, we want an else statement. In other cases, we don't. So in some cases, we only want to do, uh, we only want to execute a piece of code if, it, if some condition matches. And if, it, if that condition doesn't match, we just don't execute that part of the code. In that case, we just use an if. If we want to execute, execute one piece of a code if the condition matches, but another piece of the code if the condition doesn't match, well, then we need an else. Okay, so this is, was the example for um, passing a grade. Let's see what we have here as a task, as a programming problem. So we have an hour entered, uh, a time entered as an hour and um, an, an amount of minutes, so hours and minutes. And what I need to print is 30 minutes after that hour. Now, there are a lot of ways to do that, but let's do that with if, if else, since that's what we're um, learning right now. So we're doing that with if, if else. How are we doing that? Well, uh, what's going to happen? Let's, let's solve it in the simplest way possible. So when you're trying to solve a programming problem, you don't need to think of the entire solution at once. You just need to think of the parts of the solution and then, then wire them together. So I'm still going to have two numbers. The first number is going to be the hours and the second number is going to be the minutes. Okay, and what am I supposed to do? Well, I'm supposed to calculate 30 minutes from here on out. So if I get the zero hours, zero, uh, one minutes, I need to print out zero for, followed by 31, 30 minutes after uh, this time. Okay, how do I do that? Well, I just increase the minutes, right? So I say minutes equals minutes plus 60, right? Okay, well, uh, not 60, but 30. We wanted 30. Okay, and I would print this. Again, this is not the complete solution. It's not accurate yet, but it doesn't need to be. Let's implement a, a sort of working solution which can read the input and write the output, and then we'll figure out how to fix it. Okay, so system system.out.printf. Why, why am I using printf? Well, because I'm going to be formatting a string. I'm going to be printing the hours and the minutes. And I also need the minutes to be padded with zero, zeros if, uh, if there aren't enough digits in them. Okay, so how would I uh, write this format? Well, I have an integer over here, the digits of an integer, followed by a uh, column, and then followed by the digits of another integer. But I want these digits of the second integer to always be at least two and padded by zeros. Okay, and now what do I need? Well, I need that integer, those integers. So the first integer is hours, the second integer is minutes. Okay, so let's see if this program works correctly. It won't work 
absolutely correctly, but it will get some of the job done. So let's enter some input. Let's say zero and zero one, like we had in the second example. Okay, so we printed zero column uh, 31 and I don't have a new line over here. So let's add that percent n. Okay, so we know that part works correctly, but what part doesn't work correctly? Well, if I overstep the minutes, so if the minutes get more than 60, so if the sum over here gets more than 60, if I enter uh, 159, for example, or even 131, or even 130, if I enter 130, 30 plus 30, uh, actually the input is like this, if I enter 130, well, 30 plus 30 is 60. So if I press enter here, I get uh, one and then 60, but there's no such thing as uh, 60 minutes past one. There's 59 minutes past one, and then 60 minutes past one is two o'clock, right? Two with zeros after it. So how do I calculate that correctly? Well, uh, what would I do? I would need to check something. You know, if, if my minutes change in such a way, normally I just sum them up. But in some cases, they will, in half the cases actually, because uh, in any case after 30, from 31 to 59 inclusively, what would happen is that I'd need to change not just the minutes, but the hours. So when the minutes change above or equal, if they become above or equal to 60, then I'd need to change the hours and to reduce the minutes by what? Well, in this example, 160 would become 200. Okay, so what happened? Well, I increased the hours by one and I reduced the minutes by 60. Okay, so let's do that. Now, when do I need that? Only when the minutes are larger than or equal to 60. Okay, so if the minutes are larger than or equal to 60, I say minutes equals minutes minus 60, or I can shorten that into minute, minutes minus equals 60, the same way I can shorten this one to minutes plus equals 30. Okay, and what else do I need to do? Well, I need to bump the hours. Okay, so hours plus plus. Okay, anything else? Let's test if this code works correctly. We started, we wait a bit for it to execute, and I enter 130 and I get two o'clock. By the way, ignore this error over here. Uh, this is just uh, an error coming from the uh, debugging uh, software in IntelliJ or the debugging environment in Java. It doesn't really matter. All you care about is this green input and this black output you have. All the other messages you can ignore. Okay, so two o'clock, that's correct. Okay, is there a, a case in which this code won't work? Well, look at what I'm bumping. Like, when I'm bumping the minutes, there is a case in which I need to also bump the hours. Now, if I'm bumping the hours, I'm changing something else in my uh, in the state of my program. So I'm changing the hours. Is there a situation in which when I change the hours, they aren't a valid number for uh, for time representation? Well, there is. If it was 2330, so if I start this program, and enter 2330, what do I get? 24 o'clock. But there isn't such thing as 24 because the time begins from zero, uh, zero hours, zero minutes and ends with 23 hours, 59 minutes. So 2400, that thing doesn't exist. We've gone to the next day. So 2400 is actually what? Zero, 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 right? So what I need to do is after I've changed the hours, after this code has executed, if it has executed, I, actually, I don't really care if, if it has executed, I just need to check. Okay, so the hours here have changed. And now I can add another if statement. This if statement is unrelated to this if statement. It's just another check coming after it, which is if hours are larger than uh, 23, or if hours are larger than or equal to 24, then what do I need to do? Well, I need to reduce the hours by 24, the same way I reduce the minutes by 60. Now, in our task, I can just set them to zero. So I can just say hours equals zero because I'm only adding 30 minutes. But if, if I want to be adding uh, 
not just 30 minutes, but any number of minutes, well, then I'd probably need to uh, subtract 24 from the hours because we could jump up with more hours than a single hour. Okay, so it could become more than, uh, let's say, 30 minutes past midnight. Okay, but in this case, it's completely sufficient to just know the hours because I know that I can't get to uh, 1 o'clock in the morning by just adding 30 minutes from the previous day. It's not possible arithmetically. Okay, so let's test this situation. Waiting a bit. 23, 30, and I got 0, 0. Okay, so seems like my program works correctly. And of course, I should test with all of these sample inputs and try to think of my own sample inputs so I can test out my program sufficiently. But since we're in a lecture here, we won't be wasting that time for that too much. So the checks over here are pretty much the same, which we had in our program, and the logic is pretty much the same. Okay, now, in addition to to branching using the conditional statement if, you can also do branching with the switch case statement. Now, the switch case statement is usually applied to situation, situations where you have a fixed number of values, which you want to handle in a fix, fixed number of ways. And you can easily count these values, and each of these values has a distinct way of being handled. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's say we have a task where we get a day of the week entered from the console, like uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and we should print the uh, we should print the name of that day of the week. How would I do that? Well, using just branching conditional uh, conditional the, the conditional statement if, what I do would be if day of week equals one, then I'd print on the console system dot out dot print line print on the console a single line containing Monday. And now if it isn't Monday, then it's going to be something else. What else could it be? Well, it could be Tuesday. So if day of week, if it, if day of week isn't one, but it's two, then system.out.println Tuesday. And so on and so forth for all the values of the week. And after all the checks, I would have an ending else. So I would have other checks over here. So there would be other if day of week equals three, if day of week equals four, if day of week equal, equals five, and so on. I won't be writing all of these down. But at the end, I'd probably have system.out.println unknown. Because if someone enters eight or nine or minus one, well, what should I print? I don't know. I don't know what day that is. So I should inform the user in some way that the, their input wasn't correct. Or maybe I should say uh, incorrect number, pre please enter a number between one and seven. Okay, so this is a way to solve that test, but it's a bit of a hassle. Why? Well, because I'm doing a lot of if else -ing. Now, since we're checking against specific values, exact specific values, what I can do instead is to say switch use this day of week as a switch which has positions that's where switch comes from so this is my sweet switch my day of week is my switch like a switch in a in a control room a switch for something okay and in the case in which the switch is in position one meaning day of week equals one then do the following and then break now this break is very important and i'll explain it in a bit okay so case one break so if uh, day of week is equal to one, do some stuff over here. I'll implement it in a bit and then stop, meaning exit this switch case statement. Okay, so break out of this switch, exit this switch. Okay, so the cases over here say that uh, if this value equals this case, then start executing the code from here downwards. Okay, so what do I need to execute? Well, I'd execute system.out.println Monday. And then the other case would be for value 2, system.out.println Tuesday. And so on. And my final else, which is the unknown case, 
is handled by the default case. So anything other than the cases I mentioned here will enter this code. By the way, I forgot the break here and I'll explain, explain why I really need this break over here. So uh, the default case would be system.out.println unknown and another break again. Okay, so this effectively replaces the, the if else's I had downward. Okay, so the if else's I wrote previously are completely replaced by this switch case. Okay, so starting this code, what I'd get is if I input one, I'd uh, get Monday. If I input two, I'd get Tuesday. And if I input anything else, I'd get unknown. Of course, there are other cases to be added here, but I won't be adding them now so we don't waste time on that. I think you understand the concept up until this point. Okay, so that's what switch case does. It just checks values of a variable against specific cases and executes the code following that label of the case. Now, why do I say that you always need to add break? Well, because if you don't add break like this, what happens is the code continues to execute. So let's say I remove this break over here. Instead of printing just Monday, this code will also print Tuesday. Why? Because that's how switch case works. Switch case just enters over here and starts executing code from here on out. It doesn't care about the other cases. So the, the cases are actually just markers which say start from here. Let's uh, see this in action. So if I um, enter one, Instead of just Monday, I get both Monday and Tuesday. Why? Because Java saw that case one starts here and it just started executing code from here on out. It doesn't do any more checks. And the break I add, the break I want added here is, uh, is a signal to Java to get out of this switch and continue after it. So that's what break does. Now, in some cases, you do want to continue executing downwards, but in most cases you don't. So the way I suggest you write switch case statements is always case, then the case you want, and then immediately break. And then you can start creating uh, the code you want to uh, have handled that case. So always the case, then the dots, then the break, and then in between you add the code. Now in some cases, again, you would want to fall through to the other case like we just demonstrated without this break. In some cases, you would actually want that behavior, but in most cases, you won't. So let's uh, ignore that for now. Okay, so this is the switch case statement. Uh, and what it does is just handle a specific value of a specific um, variable. It's just an equality check. You can't use it for range checks. For example, if you're testing whether a person is... Um, less than 18 years old, you would need an if statement for that, or you would need to write 18 cases in a switch, which isn't, which isn't really practical. And that's for a relatively small number. Let's say if you're checking a person, whether they are uh, 65 and older for, you know, some, um, some program, which uh, calculates uh, something about, you know, um, uh, coupons for, let's say people which are in retirement for example. Well, in that case, you can't really do that with, uh, with the switch case because there are a lot of switches you, and a lot of cases you need to write, which you need to handle. Whereas, so if else statements are used when you have range checks and other more complicated checks, switch case, switch case statements are only used when you have very specific cases which you need to handle, like these months of the year we have over here. Okay, so... We have a problem, which is if we're given a country, we need to, well, if we're giving, given a language, we need to print the following countries for that language. Okay, so for English, we need to print England and USA. And for Spanish, we need to print Spain, Argentina, and Mexico. And for others, we don't know. So if we get England, we should get English. If we get Spain, we should get Spanish. So, so this is a bit, uh, the, the description is a bit in reverse of what the input actually is. So we get England and we print English and we get USA and we print English again, 
Remember when I said that switch case uh, has some situations where you actually do want to not have a break? Well, this is exactly one of these situations because for two different cases, we will be ex executing the same code. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, we're, got, we're getting a language, uh, we're getting a country. Since we're getting a country, we're getting, this is what, a string, a string variable, a sequence of symbols. So here's a string country, which we're reading from the console. So country is equal to scanner, give me the next line from the console. Okay, and I'm switching my country now. And the switch for my country will be, if the country is England, then I'll do one thing. I'll figure out what that thing will be later on. I'll write out all my cases and then I'll see how I can handle them and I'll, and I'll write them with breaks. Why, why am I writing them with breaks? Well, because I don't know how exactly I'm going to be handling it. And I already said that when I'm writing a switch case, until I figure everything out, I just place breaks everywhere. Okay, so what are the other countries? USA, um, then Spain, Argentina and Mexico. Okay, so this thing. We get it copied, we paste it, we say Spain, then we say Argentina, and then we say Mexico. Okay, and it, do we have a default case? Well, if we get something else, we get unknown. So we should probably print unknown or something. Okay, so we can check that output, what it should exactly be, and in uh, a well-described task, it would be a bit more specifically stated, but let's print unknown like we have here only they had it with lowercase letters. Okay, so now do what do we do? Well, we start printing. So for England, we do system.out.println English. But for USA, we do the same, right? So we do the exact same code. Now, since switch case can just continue on downwards, we can do this. Instead of breaking on England, we can just say, if the, the country is England, start executing code from here. And that will come over here, execute the print and break then. Okay. And then if we get USA, it will still start from here and break then. So in both cases, we will actually execute the same code. And for Spain, Argentina and Mexico, it's the same deal. So if it's Spain or Argentina or Mexico, then system.out.print of what's the language? Spanish. Okay. So that's the solution of this task. Now, one thing I still don't like about this uh, program and about the one we had for the days of the week is that I'm repeating code. Where am I repeating that code? Well, I'm repeat repeating system.out.println. So here and here and here, I'm doing a repetition of code. The only thing that changes is the string I'm printing. So whenever as a programmer, you see something repeating, and if the repeating thing is a value, if, some, if a value repeats, what you need to do is extract a variable. So let's create a variable language. And now we'll just say, instead of printing it, we'll say that language equals English in this case. Otherwise, language equals Spanish. And otherwise, language equals unknown. And then I'll have a single print after the switch case. So here is the beginning of the switch case. Here is the end of the switch case. And now I have a single system.out.print line and supply that language as a parameter. Okay, so now I eliminated the repetition of the system.out.print line code. And it could have been longer code. This is just an example. It's not, it's not like this was a really big issue of repeating code but the concept applies. If you see that a piece of code is the same and it only has its value change, well, extract that value into a variable and then add the piece of code after the different values of the variable are determined. Okay, so now if I uh, type in USA, I should get English and that's what I got. Of course, I should test out this program a lot more and I suggest you do that at home. But for now, we're going to continue on with the lecture. Okay, so this is pretty much what we have in the slides uh, for the solution for this problem. Okay, now, we've already seen the logical operators, uh, the, the comparison operators, uh, and we've seen how they can be used in if statements, in conditional statements. 
What we need to add to that are the logical operators. The logical operators are what allows us to combine uh, true and false values into a single expression. So let's say that um, we had, uh, let's say we have the following uh, situation. We're going not to be reading uh, countries from the input. We're going to be reading, um, we're going to be reading the age of someone and their money. What am I implementing? I'm implementing a bar. So we're going to be having a bar and in this bar only people which have enough money and which are of legal age can buy a drink. It seems, seems logical. Okay, so what I'm reading from the console is I'll read an integer which is the money of the person. We'll not go into specifics of whether this is cents or something. We'll just have a heart limit on the uh, price of the drinks. And this is the age of the person, scanner.nextInt. And what is my task? My task is to determine whether this person can buy a drink which has a price of, let's say, 50. 50, we don't say what. Let's say, let's just say 50. Okay, $50, for example. Okay, so the price of my drink is 50. And the age needs to be larger than or equal to 18 for the person to be able to buy a drink. So I need, if I don't have the logical operators, how would I do that? Well, I'd say if money is larger than or equal to 50, if the person has uh, enough money, and then if the person has enough age, let's say, if, if they are legal age, then I'll print system.out.print uh, can buy. Now, if they aren't at least 18, I need to print that they can't buy. So this is going to be, um, let's say, get out. Let's say we're, we're getting this, we're forcing this person to leave. Okay. And if their money isn't enough, we're also printing get out. So this is a solution to this task without using the logical operators. But as you see, first off, we're repeating code over here. In both cases, we're printing get out. And this code is using nested ifs just so we can, it can check a sequence of things. And it does, it, it does the same thing if one of the checks fails. So if one of these checks fails, it, does, it prints get, gets out. And in both cases, it basically prints gets out if one of the checks fail. So it's actually a single expression, right? Both of these need to be true in order for the program to print can buy. Otherwise, it will print get out. So this is a single expression. It, it, uh, or it acts like a single expression in our program. So what we have for handling such situations is instead of uh, writing a separate uh, branching so we can check each of these and imagine if there are three variables or four, four variables we need to check it would get uh, even harder to uh, read and to code so what we have instead are logical operators logical operators combine boolean expressions like this one combine combine checks like this one into single expressions so if i want to say that their money needs to be larger than 50 and at the same time their age needs to be larger than 18 this is how i do it now the ant operator requires both both of these to be true in order for the entire thing to be true so if one of these is false the entire thing will be false regardless of the value of the other thing okay and by the way the uh if the ant operator works like this, if it sees that this is false, it's not going to execute this part. It doesn't care. If the first part isn't, uh, isn't true, it doesn't need to evaluate the second part. It doesn't need to waste time evaluating the second part because the entire expression will be false regardless of this value over here if the first part is uh, false. So this is called short circuiting. Uh, it wants it knows a result it doesn't care uh, from there on out now if this is true if this part is true then it needs to check the next part because that one could be false okay so this is how we solve that task with the 
uh, and operate the uh, logical operator and and there's also a logical operator or that one is the less restrictive one so that says if either of these is true the result is true whereas for and it's if both of them are true then the result is true so if both of them are true the result is true otherwise the result is false here the only way for the result to be false is if both are false. So the logical or is sort of like a reverse of the logical and, a reverse in concept. And in what cases do we need to use that? Well, let's say um, we want to check uh, if the person has money or they are of the correct age uh, and they're of the correct age, or if they aren't of the correct age, they may be getting, uh, they, they may have um, a person with them, uh, so someone which is of the correct age, which can buy them the drink or something like that. So if there's another person. So in cases in which if either condition suffice, that's when we use the or statement. Okay, and in addition to that, there's also the logical not statement, which just reverses a value. So if a value is true, it reverses it to false. Okay, so we have a task over here, which uh, requires us to check theater promotions. Well, how do they work? How do these promotions work? Well, if the day is a weekday, we use this part of the table. If it's a weekend, we use this part of the table. And if it's a holiday, we use this part of the table. So what does it look like? This over here is what? These are three fixed values, exactly three fixed values. And in each of them, we have different handling for different ages. So we have a weekday, uh, we have a day or whatever we call that. We have a day and we have an age which are entered. Okay, so for one weekday, for, for one day value, we have the check of whether the age is uh, larger than zero or less than 18. And then we have the check for between 18 and 84 and 64. And then we have the check for between 64 and 122. Okay, so how does this look like? Well, to me, it looks like a switch case in which the first case would be weekday. And then in that switch case, I check the age for being in one of these ranges. And since I'm having ranges, what will I be using for the check? Well, I'd be using an, a conditional statement. Okay. And in each of the checks, I just determine the value of uh, the, the price of the ticket. Okay, how do I do that? So let's say we have the string for the day entered. So we have a string day, which is scanner dot next line, read the next line, and then the age is scanner dot next int. And what do I need to do? Well, I need to switch on the day. So this day is going to be in my switch. And I'd say, if it's, uh, by the way, it's not exactly clear whether these are capital case or lower case or capital case or whatever they are. One way to check without caring for uh, lower case or capital case and so on is just switch the day, but not exactly the day, but the day dot to lower case, which will convert this day to lowercase symbols. And then each of my switches will just be a case lowercase, in this case, weekday with lowercase. Okay, and then I add the break here. And then I have a case for um, weekend, weekend, and then I have a break again. And then I can have a case for um, holiday and then I have a break again and I probably have a default value which prints uh, for example no such result okay so what do I do for these oh, and I forgot the break over here so what would I do here well if it's a weekday now I just need to check the age if the age is between 1 and uh, 0 and 18 then I need to say that the price is $12 then I need to say well it's if it's larger than 18 then the price is $18 and so on Okay, so how would I do that? Well, that's simply a sequence of if statements. If the age is larger than or equal to zero, and now there are two checks. The age is larger than or equal to zero, and it also needs to be less than or equal to 18. So it needs to, we can't just check if it's larger than zero. We need to also check if it's less than or equal to 18. 
So how do I do that? Well, how do I combine checks in, in Java? Well, I use the AND operator if I want both of them to be true. So, and if H is less than or equal to 18. So this would give me a price of $18, right? That, uh, actually $12, sorry. That's what I have in the table. And the next check will be else if, that, if the above isn't true, if the H isn't within that range, but it is within the range of H being larger than 18. By the way, why am I adding this since the H is definitely not in this, uh, in this range? Well, I'm adding it because someone could have entered minus one and that won't get into this check. Okay, so if the H is larger than 18 and the H is less than or equal to 64, then I'd be doing then I'd be printing out the $18 tax. And so on, I'd do the last else for uh, if h is larger than 64 and h is less than 122. Okay, and then I'd be writing some code for the $12 tax again. Where are my dollars? Here are they. Okay, here they are, actually. Here are are my dollars okay so of course this is this isn't the actual code this would be printing to the console or setting a value to a variable which i'd prefer and then printing that value on the console over here okay and we need to do the same for the weekend and we need to do the same for the holiday i'll leave that to you to do at home so uh, i'd expect you to handle this oh and here we have what happens if there's a negative value so we need to print error so uh, there's going to be a last else over here, right? So in this else, there's the case error. So in this case, we need to print error like this. So what I do is create a string variable, variable which is uh, string ticket price info or something. I will intentionally not give it a value and I'll give it a value in each of these places. So in this case, it will be tick ticket price info equals $12 as a string. And I do that the same for 18 and I do that for error too. And now if I go over here and print it, system.out.print line and provide um, ticket price info, notice that it underlines it as an error. Why does it underline it as an error? Because it might have not been initialized. Why might it not have been initialized? Well, because I'm not initializing it here, 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 and in each of these cases, I'm not initializing it. So in this way, you're ensuring that there's always uh, a value for ticket price info. So you're, in this way, you're ensuring you're not missing a case, basically, because everywhere you need to set a value to ticket price info, otherwise you, your code won't compile. And that's how you know that you've met every uh, condition correctly. Otherwise, if you miss it somewhere, for example, we miss it here, well, this will be a compile time error. You won't need to start your program to find out that it doesn't work. The program will check for itself and see, okay, you haven't given a value to this and I can't print it. And you will just find where you, can, where you haven't given a value to it and fix that. Okay, so I'm leaving this to you to finish up. They're just the same checks done over and over again. Okay, so this is the code for the solution. You can check with it if you uh, don't manage to solve it. By the way, this code is different what, than uh, what I just wrote. It's if else checks, so that's fine too. But since we have fixed values, I'd use the switch case. So play around with one of these two solutions and write them yourself. yourself. By the way, any task we uh, encounter here, you really should uh, solve by yourself. It's really important, even if you've seen the solution, to write it by yourself with that and try to not look at the solution while you're writing it. The only way you become a good programmer is by programming. There, there is no shortcut. There is no way you can just listen and learn. It just, it, it's just writing code. You just need to write a lot of code until it becomes so intuitive that you don't really need to think about the more simple concepts like how do I write an, a conditional statement or how do I write a loop, which we'll be talking about in a few moments. So really, 
do the tasks which you see in the lectures and do them by yourself. Now, if you can't manage it by yourself the first time, help yourself with the code which is in the slides and see what you missed, see what why you didn't think of that. And, ne and then do it again, and then do it again until you manage to do it not by learning it by heart, don't, lo don't learn it by heart, don't learn which part of code follows which part of code. Learn to think, learn to uh, examine the problem as a, a, a collection of parts which you need to assemble together and which you need to build. You need to build each part and then assemble these parts together. That's how you solve programming tasks. Anyway, now we already saw how to branch our program and that's a very important part in uh, coding in order to have something more complex than a calculator and something that actually reacts to input. Uh, but how do you uh, handle uh, code which needs to execute multiple times? So let's say you want to print the numbers from 1 to 10. Well, what you do is you use a loop. Now, you'd probably say, okay, well, I can actually print the numbers from 1 to 10 without using a loop. I can just, uh, let's get rid of this code. I can just say system.out.println1, and then I could do print line 2, and then I could print line 3, and then I could print line 4, and so on until I reach 10. So that's a valid way of printing the numbers from 1 to 10. So what do loops give me? Okay, so they're another part of Java and of programming languages in general, which allow me some, to repeat some code. But what do, why do I need to repeat code with a loop when I can do it manually? Well, first off, manually really doesn't you know, look very well because you just have repeating of code and repeating again and again and again. And second, it actually can't achieve everything you want. So if you don't have a loop, you have no way of reading a number and executing a piece of code that number of times. Like, I, I guess you could do something like read a number and uh, number to which we want to print. So max number. So let's say we read that max number from the scanner and then we print until we reach the max number. So you could you could hack it so you could say int current number equals zero and then if current number is less than max number well system dot out dot print line print that current number and then increase that current number and then write another if which is exactly the same and another if which is exactly the same and another if which is exactly the same and so on and so on and so on but do you know when you need to stop well if you know what the max number could be and let's say if it's 100 you could repeat this if statement a hundred times and yeah that would probably solve the task because none of the following if statements will execute you will only execute as many if statements as increments you'd need but that really isn't ideal you know because that's only if max number is 100 well if it's 1000 or 100,000 or 4 billion you know that this could be a very large number so and it's really hard to write code which executes a fixed number of times in the uh, in the program also it's not efficient if you're if you have 4 billion as the maximum possible number which could be entered on the console you need 4 billion if ifs which would create a pretty large program but in addition to that uh, running that will always do the 4 billion operations whereas if you do it with a loop with a structure in java which allows you to execute a variable number of times variable meaning a number of times coming from a variable instead of non compile time like like this code is, that loop will, will only execute as many times as you need instead of 4 billion each time. Okay, so uh, loops are actually if statements that repeat themselves. So a while loop, let's use the while loop. A while loop is just what we wrote previously, 
So the multiple ifs chained one after another. So we had an if, and then we had another if, and then we had the same if, and the same if, and the same if, and the same if, and the same if, the same if a lot of times. Well, that's exactly what a while loop is. Oh, however, you don't write it multiple times. You write it exactly once. Oops. Let's return to the while loop version. Okay, let's delete this if. Now, instead of writing multiple ifs one after another, you just write while. What does while do? It checks for the condition, just the same way an if statement does, and executes the code if that condition is true. But then, instead of continuing the execution of the program after uh, the end of the body of this while loop, it returns to the, st to the condition again. The if statement doesn't return to the condition, while the while loop returns to the condition. So the while loop is exactly the same as the if statement. However, instead of continuing on, it returns to the condition. And the while loop has no else, obviously. Okay, so it returns to the condition and checks the condition again. Now, if we read a number like this and we start this program, what would we get? We'd get the uh, number, the, the number starting from zero up until that number printed out up until less than that number actually so if i enter four i'd see zero one two three so here's what i get i enter four i got zero one two three again only focus on the dark part of the output ignore these blue messages from the debugger okay so that's what um that that's what a while loop is it's just an if statement which repeats its check until the checks become uh, until the check becomes false uh, as opposite to the normal if statement which just uh, you know calculate uh, calculates the expression once and if the expression is true it executes it so yeah an if statement that returns to the check so uh, that's that's how while loops work and they're the simplest type of loop so what are loops actually loops are so-called control statements the same way that the conditional statements if and else are control statements they control the execution of your program you know uh, an if statement branches your program and does one thing or another thing whereas a loop a loop does one thing if the condition is true and then repeats to check the condition and if the condition isn't true then it breaks out of that loop okay so that's what the loop does and there are several uh, versions of loops the most popular version of a loop is the for loop. The for loop is actually a, a bit more complicated version of the while loop, meaning it's a while loop, but it has an, an initialization and an increment automatically added into it, whereas the while loop, you just continue on until something happens. So for loop, those are generally... Uh, used for doing something a fixed number of times like in our case we have a fixed number of executions which is clear at the moment of input so when the user enters the this number we need to execute our code that amount of times so a for loop is ideal for that purpose whereas while loops execute until a condition uh, changes to false which is what the for loop also does but the for loop is sort of designed for fixed number of time situation and the for loop and the while loop are completely interchangeable you can do anything with the for loop with the while loop and vice versa and there's also the do while loop which is only different from the while loop by the fact that it always does something and then it checks so it will execute at least once so in in our case a while loop will first first check the number whereas a do while loop do while and the while goes after the body of the uh, loop if we now enter zero the do while loop will print zero whereas the while loop will not print zero because it will immediately check this and not enter the loop so if i start this the do while loop will print if i enter zero it will print at, at least one zero meaning it executes at least once whereas the while loop the simple while loop will not print zero because it will immediately check okay current number is equal to max number so it isn't less than max number so this is false so we continue on after the loop 
Okay, let's test that and see that that's how it behaves. We enter the number zero and nothing gets output on our console. Okay, so that's the difference between the while and the do while loops and do while loops aren't really that used. The, the main usage of loops uh, concerns while loops and for loops. Do while loops are, they're a bit weird to read and that's part of the reason they aren't uh, used a lot. It, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't use them, but in most cases you would find yourself preferring the normal while loop. Okay, because in most cases you actually need to do a check before you do something. Well, just like the if statements, you don't do something, then do the if statement, then do it again. That's what, that's what the do while loop does. There are some specific situations in which you would want a do while loop, but anything you can do with a do while loop, you can also do with a while loop by just repeating the code in the while loop's body. You know, this code right here is the exact uh, equal to the code do while and leave only the, the method, the uh, loop body. Do while and so. So the, your, your main uh, approach to writing loops, loops will be either write a while loop or write a for loop. Now, what is a for loop? A for loop is just something that is built to execute a fixed number of times, starting from an initial position and ending in a specific position and doing that and incrementing the variable it uses to uh, iterate on each uh, execution of the for loop. So a for loop is just this while loop, which we just implemented, is absolutely equivalent to writing the following. For uh, int current number equals zero, current number less than max number, current number plus plus. And I'll unzoom a bit and hide these a bit. Okay, so actually we don't need this project pane at all, so I can hide it. Okay, so now it highlights the current number over here because I've already already have a current number initialized up here for the while loop. So it can't allow me to create the same variable name. But otherwise, if this while loop doesn't didn't exist, this code over here is absolutely identical to get this code over here with one small exception. The current number variable here declared here is visible after the loop finishes, whereas a uh, number initialized inside the for loop is not visible outside the for loop. So this exists for the entire execution of the for loop, but it's not accessible outside it. Okay, so this is a for loop. A for loop has an, in, an initialization. It has a check and it has an incrementation and this part is executed last after the body just like it is executed last over here in the while loop uh, the body is before it so here we have the body and here we have the for loops body and this current number plus plus is executed after the body executes and that's how the for loop works the point of the for loop is when you have a specific range of values which you need to iterate that's how you do it. The typical way would be to do a for loop. You use a for loop whenever you know the number of iterations and it doesn't change. Whereas a while loop you do if you need to execute operations on some data until that data changes in some way. Okay, so that's the for loop and this, uh, of course I'm missing the printing part, the actual body. Now this code is exactly equal to this code with again the exception that the current number initialization over here is only visible inside the for loop if it's a for loop, whereas the current initialization, a uh, current number initialization here is visible in the entire main method. Why? Well, because it's outside the while loop. Okay, so that's how the for loops work. You have initialization, which gives the initial value of the so-called control variable of the loop. Then you have a check. This check can be anything. It can be, it usually is a range check. It, it checks whether the control variable is less than something or larger than something. And this part usually increases or decreases the control variable, but these two can be anything. This can be any expression, which changes the control variable, or it can be no expression. You can miss this entirely. 
in that case your loop will probably never finish but you can and this part over here can be any boolean check just like you can add any boolean check in an if statement or in a while statement you can do that in a for statement over here so any check over here is valid but usually your check will going to will involve the control variable of the loop and will probably include a range check for that control variable okay so Let's uh, print all the numbers that are divisible by 3 and all of them from 1 to 100. How do we do that? Well, it's a pretty simple task. We can do it with a while loop and we can do it with a for loop. So how do we do that? Well, we have our current number. Let's ignore this max number or we can just say max number is 100, right? Because we're going from 1 to 100. Actually, since we're checking like this, let's say... 100 plus 1 because we want to reach to before max number just like we're doing over here okay so until we reach max number how do we print those which are divisible by 3 well we simply do if current number divided by 3 gives a remainder of 0 so that means it's divisible by 3 because 3 divided by 3 is 0 and 6 divided uh, 3 divided by 3 gives a remainder of 0 and 6 divided by 3 gives a remainder of 0 and so on so that's uh, that's our check and what do we do we just print the current number we only print the current number if it is divisible by 3 if the remainder when it gets divided by 3 is 0 okay and how do we do that with the for loop well we do the absolute same Thing in the body but we have the initialization inside our um, for loop and the incrementation inside the for loop instead of at the end of the body and our task wanted to us to print everything from 1 to 100 not from 0 to 100 so current number would start from 1 so this is the while loop solution and this is the for loop solution and since it includes the max number 100 I'd actually prefer not doing the plus one over here, but actually doing less than or equal to max number over here. Now, you've already seen loops in one way or another up to this point, so we won't be uh, chewing on them much more. But here is the solution to this task. We have three, we have six, we have nine, because that's how the for loop works. On each iteration, it increases the current number and then checks uh, actually, it starts from the initialization, so it checks. It, it starts from current number equals one, then it checks the condition, and then it goes to the body, and then it increments the current number. So this part is last. So if you write a for loop like this one, it would be exactly the same if I remove uh, this current number incrementation from here and place it at the end of the body. It's absolutely the same that's what java does it takes the code you have uh, over here after this semicolon and places it at the end of your body that's that's effectively what it does okay so this is what our for loop does and you can do the you can achieve the same uh, result with a while loop just as i showed you a few moments ago now instead of writing an entire for loop what you can do is you can say for i you can just type in for and then use the suggestion for i press enter and this creates a for loop for you and then you can just fill in the blanks which it left behind now my suggestion is don't use the auto generated code write the code yourself because you need to be able to write a for loop uh, without thinking it should be automatic the same way when uh, you're learning to drive a car it's sh your driving should be automatic and then turning the wheel, pressing the accelerator pedal and so on. So try to, for now, try to type a lot because typing a lot, first of all, uh, increases your speed of typing, which is important when you're in a hurry. And second, it teaches you to not think when you're implementing loops and conditionals and so on. It needs to be automatic for you to write code quickly. Okay. So when you type in for i, if you're in a hurry for some reason, you can use this template for live generation of a for loop. Okay, another task. We have a program which should 
print the first n odd numbers and then print their sum. Okay, how would we do that? Well, since we're doing n odd numbers, that's a fixed number of odd numbers. Okay, so how would we do that? Well, my solution would be the following. If I get 5, I know that I need to execute my loop 5 times. So that's what I'm going to control based on. So I'll start from the 5 times execution. And then I'd figure out which the odd numbers are based on where I am in my execution. So what, will, what does that mean? That means that if I have n entered from the scanner as an integer, what I do is I start a for loop, which simply executes n times, meaning it will start from zero and end at n. Okay, and how do I uh, handle it from here on out? Well, I need to find that odd number. How do I find that odd number? Well, there are a lot of ways to do it. Um, one thing I can do is keep track of the current odd number. You know, we have this current odd number, and which is the first odd number? It's 1, right? And what did I also need to keep a track of? I need to keep a track of the sum. So I need a sum, which starts from 0, and the current odd number, which is 1. And for each iteration, what I do is I'd say the sum is increased by the odd number, meaning that we add the odd number into the sum, and then the odd number needs to change, right? I need to go on to the next odd number. So how do I go on to the next odd number? Well, I just say odd number plus equals 2, meaning increase odd number by 2. Why? Well, because odd numbers are 2 apart. So 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and so on. So getting from 1 to 3 is an increment by 2. So I increase the odd number by 2. Oh, and I also need to print that odd number. So system dot out dot print line that odd number. Now this is one way. Another way is to, to just use the mathematical formula. So what would the mathematical formula be? Well, I have i and i times 2 plus 1 will give me that odd number. So for the zero, for execution 0, I will have 0 times 2 plus 1 equals 1. For 1, I'd have 1 times 2, which is, equal, which is 2, plus 1 equals 3. And then for 2, I'd have 4 plus 1, 5. And then for 3, I'd have, you, you get it, you know, 6 plus 1, 7, and so on and so forth. So that's another way to do it. And again, how did I think of this uh, that quickly? I, I haven't uh, thought about the solution before I just saw the task. I, I just thought it up on the spot. How did I think it up on the spot so quickly? Well, I have implemented a lot of loops. At some point, you just uh, get an intuitive feeling for what the loop should do. You just need to solve a lot of these programming problems. And initially it's going to be a bit slower, but from then on out you will start figuring it out. But the, the main thing you need to do is focus on the number of executions and determine your operations based on that execution on which you're on currently. Okay, so this will solve the task and I can print the output system dot out dot print line. Uh, I already printed the number and now I already I only need to print. I'd actually print formatted and that format will contain some column and then the digits and a new line of that sum which I just calculated. So starting this again, I will uh, enter five just like we have in this example. So I'm entering five and I see one, three, five, seven, nine. Okay, that's five executions, correct? And the sum is 25, and as they have described for us in this PowerPoint slide. Okay, and I test for three and so on, but I won't be doing it now. Now, what I'll show you in addition to this solution is a for loop can have multiple uh, initializations and it can have multiple increments. So, what I can do is since I'm, you see that I'm using that odd number too. It's not, it's not the, it changes the same way the control variable of the loops changes, right? It, it increments on each iteration and it increments at the end. We've already used it. We can consider this part the body 
and this part the increment we've already used it with its value and then we increment it the same way we do for i right and the initialization is only once again the same way we initialize for i so what i can do if i want although this is a bit harder to read and i don't really suggest you do it but you can so if you initialize i like this you can also place a comma here and initialize odd number here equals one and remove it from over here no or maybe i uh i misled you okay so maybe we can't uh oh no we should be able to let's see yeah uh you place a comma over here and then you initialize and then another number of the same type that's your limit you need to initialize variables of the same type so you initialize i with the value of zero and you initialize odd number with the value of one and over here we can do odd number plus equals two and you can remove it from here so summary you can add multiple initializations and you separate them with a comma but they all have to be of the same data type and you can do multiple increments and you separate them with a comma now this is a bit harder to read but i demonstrated what it looks like by writing it the first time i just now i just compacted it into the for loop uh, none of these is faster or slower than the other one or at least not significantly so based on the input um, so my suggestion is use the first option if you're going to solve this task in this way and avoid multiple in initializations in a for loop and multiple increments in a for loop but keep in mind that you can do this so i'm showing you uh, this uh, way of coding a for loop because you might encounter it somewhere not because i'm uh, endorsing you to do it my suggestion is don't my advice is keep the body a body and keep the increments only for the control variable of the loop okay so that's uh that's how our for loop works and let's continue on we solved this task let's continue on to whatever we have next after this so i already introduced you to the while loop but just to recap a while loop is something that executes until a condition changes so it executes while a condition holds true in this case this condition will hold true 10 times why well because n is 1 and the condition is n less than or equal to 10 and n gets incremented in the while now this is the equivalent of a for loop which starts from i equals 1 continues until i is equal uh, is less than or equal to 10 and has an i plus plus in it and thus system dot out dot print line does this operation over here that's a while loop and while loops are usually used when you operate on some piece of data until it changes for example one thing you can do with a while loop for which a while loop is good is printing out the digits of a number so how do you print out the digits of a number well let's do it it's an interesting task so let's read the number from the console let's call it number and let's read it from the console and let's print out its digits separately so we want each digit on a separate line now starting from the last digit so if we get the input of uh, 142 what i want printed is 2 then 4 then 1 so print the numbers in reverse how do we get that well we can do the following we can say while that number is larger than zero we will do the following we will tell the number to give us our the remainder of that number divided by 10 what is the remainder of a number divided by 10 well that is the last digit of the number because in our numeral system our decimal numeral system what happens if you have 142 if you divide it by 10 that gives you what 14 10 by 10 multiplied by 14 equals 140 and we have a remainder of 2 so 10 times 10 times 14 140 plus 2 equals 142 okay so this is the remainder so 2 is the remainder if we do uh, 142 percent 10 that gives us 2 
okay? And then if we say uh, 142 divided by 10, that gives us 14. And we've just removed the last digit. So using percent 10 gives us the last digit and dividing by 10 removes the last digit. So it removes this too. So this operation of division removes the two and it leaves us with just 14. So what can we do? We can repeat this operation now and do it for 14 and get by 10 the remainder when it's divided by 10 and that would give us 4 and then we do 14 divided by 10 so we get 1 and then for 1 we do uh, get the remainder with for division by 10 and that would be 1 and then 1 we would divide by 10 and we'd get 0 and for 0 there is nothing more to do we stop it here so that's why I said well, we will start a, for a while loop which continues until the number reaches zero. Now there is um, a catch here. We need to have an additional check. If the number be uh, starts from zero, we need to print zero because the digits of zero are zero. So there would be another check over here which says if number equals zero, if number equals zero, then just system dot out dot print line zero. Print print at least one digit for this number otherwise if it isn't zero just start printing the digits so uh, while number is different than zero it, while it's larger than zero and that would work for uh, positive numbers of course but it would actually work for negative numbers too it's pretty much the same logic you can test it out so you can see for yourself okay so the last digit is the number divided by 10 and from here on out what do we do well we print that last digit system dot out dot print line the last digit and now we need to change the number so we get rid of the last digit we already got it and printed it now we want to get rid of it so we just say number becomes number divided by 10 and if i start this program it will continue until it displays all of the digits of number and then number will, will reach zero and the while loop will stop so if I enter 142, I just got 2, 4, 1, and the program ended after that. So that's how you uh, split up a number by its digits. And that's useful for when you need to convert it into, for example, a string, or if you want to encode its digits in some other way. Okay, so that's uh, usage for the while loop. While loops are usually used when they process some part of data, or some part of information, uh, some piece of information and change it in some way so they need to recheck what happened to that information that's a pretty vague description but we need more specific tasks so we can see more specific examples of that okay so we have another task over here we need to implement a multiplication table what do we need to do well we need to display the multiplication of a number by uh, its multiplier. So we have a number we read from the console and then we need to display uh, all multiplications of that number from one to 10. Well, how would we do that? I'd actually do that with a for loop, not a while loop, uh, but we can also do it with a while loop. We read the number, we start from times equals one and continue until times reaches 10 and then just print the number, multiply the number, the multiplier and then the number multiplied by the multiplier and then we need an increment so somewhere over here right because right now does times change no it doesn't so this code will actually execute an infinite number of times this uh, code over here has a bit of a catch to see if you're uh, paying attention so this code will execute an indefinite number of times because we aren't incrementing this times variable. So there should be a times plus plus somewhere. I'd add it at the end of the while loop. Or I just lose use a for loop, which starts from times equals one and reaches times less than or equal to 10 and does times plus plus on each iteration. Okay. Oh yeah, so here's the catch actually. We, uh, I showed the part of the code up to here and then here's the catch. If you don't do the times, this loop will execute an infinite number of times. Here, however, since we're uh, incrementing the multiplier and that's what we check for the range, well, that's uh, the reason this while loop will actually terminate at some point. Okay, so that's one way to do 
the uh, multiplication table. Again, I prefer the option with using the for loop. Okay, and the do while loop is just something that does operations regardless of, uh, so it's the same as a while loop, but it always executes at least once and then it checks and then it executes again and then it checks and executes again and checks and so on. Whereas the while loop first checks and then executes. Okay, so we have another uh, version of the multiplication table where we have uh, the number of multi the number of multiplications we need to displace entered from the console and this is pretty much the same task but done with a do while loop so this will always print at least once so even if you enter uh, times uh, starting from 10 you would still see uh, actually times starting from 11 if you enter time starting for, from 11, this uh, do while loop will execute once and display the number multiplied by 11. Whereas the normal while loop will not do that. And it really depends, depends on what task you're solving, whether you really want that printed or not. Actually, our example with the uh, number, uh, with the division continuing until the uh, number reaches zero, the case for zero can actually be omitted if we change this into a do while loop because for zero it will still print the last digit so you can play around with making this into a do while loop that's one application of the do while loop okay so uh, now once we've talked about loops enough we have uh, the finishing part of this lecture which is how do we debug code now what is debugging actually? Now we've done it in this lesson already. Debugging is the process of finding errors in a program and fixing them. And it's pretty important that you notice the first part of debugging. As I said, finding errors. A lot of people, uh, when they start learning programming, start by trying to fix an issue. You know, you, you write a program and it doesn't work. And your immediate thought is, I didn't write something correctly, let's change this line of code. But you still haven't actually found what you didn't write correctly, what you didn't code correctly. So always keep in mind that there is no such thing as a correct and incorrect pro program. There is a program which does what you want it to do and there's a program which doesn't do what you want it to do. Programs always do what you tell told them so they do exactly what you wrote but that doesn't mean that you wrote what you needed to write so where where am i going with this well uh when you when you have some code execute and it doesn't behave the way you expect it the reason for that is that you didn't code it correctly so you you shouldn't start changing stuff you should find why does it do what you don't expect it to do so when you're searching for errors in your program you're actually searching for uh, code which you entered which does something different than the thing you expected to for it to do so programs don't make mistakes programmers make mistakes so so don't think of your programming as, as something that's doing something wrong think of your program as something that is very explicitly following your instructions and doesn't really know uh what what it should be doing the program just follows instructions it doesn't understand what it means to uh solve a problem so when you're when you want to debug your application when you want to find errors in your application what you need to do is find out which part of your code doesn't behave the way you wanted it to behave, meaning which, are, which part of the code you didn't uh, implement correctly uh, in relation to what you wanted to happen. So for your first uh, part is finding where the error is. So actually the first part is noticing that something isn't correct in your, for example, output, and then you need to find which part of the code causes that error in the output. And when you know that, you, you can start fixing that code. And always when you're fixing something, think about, uh, if I change this, will I affect something else negatively? So any change you make to code that already exists, you need to consider 
whether that change will break something else in your code. And after you've done the fix, you start testing and you, and in addition to testing whether you have fixed the problem you noticed, you also have to test everything else which you know works because you could always have uh, broken something that previously worked with your fix. And debugging is pretty iterative and repetitive and you just do it. Uh, um, there's a joke in programming that 90% um, of the program is written in 90% of the time and then the other percent of the other 10% of the program is written the other 90% of the time so you always have you, you always waste more time than you expect because you have debugging because you can't um, you can't foresee what errors you're going to introduce into your code while you're writing that code so always leave yourself a lot of time for debugging even if you're very sure of what you're coding so there can always be bugs you, you you by the way you probably have noticed that in the tasks we solved i uh, repetitively missed um, adding the new line symbol at the end now that's a small issue but it's still an issue and i saw it and i knew where it, uh, what was causing it and i fixed it so even if you're an experienced programmer you will still be doing debugging debugging is is 50 percent or more of the work of a programmer you writing code is fast actually once you get the ha the hang of it writing code is fast debugging isn't it's just th something you you get better at because you start getting better at uh finding errors that's the slowest part of debugging and once you get faster at that fixing them is a bit easier but it's always going to take time so don't uh, don't get disappointed if initially you're having a lot of issues debugging your code and writing programs that work correctly that's actually good for you because you will teach yourself debugging no one can really teach you debugging uh, as a concept we can just show you what it is and how you do it and how you can use the tools and IntelliJ to do that but it's really uh, up to you to do a lot of debugging and examine the state of your program a lot of times in order to find errors so you can really learn how to effectively debug your code okay so IntelliJ has what's known as a debugger now what does debugger what do debuggers do unfortunately they don't fix your errors automatically but what they do it, it should really be called a state examiner a debugger is something that examines the state of your program so if I start if I place a breakpoint over here and I start my program in debugging mode that starts the debugger and that will stop the program at this breakpoint after I enter my input because there is no breakpoint up to this point so I enter my input which is 42 and the program stopped over here now I'm I'm in the process of debugging my program now again it really should be called examining the state of the program during its execution. A debugger is simply a tool which can stop your program while, while it executes and it can display information about the data in your program. So in our case, uh, in our case, this uh, IntelliJ process seems to have failed for some reason, but we'll, what we do is we place breakpoints and once um, once a oh yeah i think i know what uh, caused the failure over here let's start it again uh once we get um once we have some state in our program in this case the state is all of the variables that are visible at this breakpoint we can examine that state so if i had an error well what's the usual case for an error well some of the variables which I have don't have the correct value Th that's what an error is in in programming an error is simply a variable in your code does not have the correct value that it should have had at that point and once you find which variable that is you just check what changes that va variable and where did it get that wrong value and then you just start searching so you notice one variable that isn't correct okay you see how that variable is calculated and then you see the variables which are used for its calculation then then continue on to them and examine at each step and at each step again and at each step again and see if 
you find something that isn't correct in the code itself. And you usually, again, you usually find that by just looking at values of variables. You think of what should the, val the value of the variable be at this point of the execution of the program? And if it isn't that value, well, what causes it? And then you find the code which causes it and you fix it. Okay, so what does the debugger offer you? Well, it offers you th this exact thing. It offers you examining values. Now, a moment ago, my debugger froze. Why did it freeze? Well, because I had a line which I added in the start of the lecture, which was scanner.next, right? I had this in the uh, variables over here as an expression which gets evaluated. Well, the debugger froze because it couldn't evaluate this because I wasn't entering any input because this reads from the console. So be careful with expressions like this one. I'd suggest that you don't add something that reads from the console directly as um, a variable here, but definitely use the variables which are already listed. These are the values of the variables you're looking at right now. Now, if I place a breakpoint over here and press F9, we will reach this breakpoint and I will also have another variable over here, which is last digit. So if I had an issue with my code, which was uh, finding the digits of my number, well, I'd look for it here because if I wasn't getting the digits correctly, let's say if I would, I didn't do the correct division, then I'd see that last digit was zero if the division here was uh, non-remainder division, it was, if it was just division. I'd see that the last digit is zero and I'd ask myself, okay, so number is 42 um, and I'm dividing it by 10 and I'm getting zero. Uh, it's actually not zero, it's four. In this case, it would be four. So last digit is four. And I'd say, okay, so I have 42 and I'm dividing it by 10. Why am I getting four? Well, I'm getting four because that's what I'm telling the program to do. I'm telling it to just divide by 10, which is four. But what I actually want is to get the remainder of that. So that's one way I can find an issue. If I had an issue over here, if I had used the incorrect type of division, well, that's how I would find it. And if I had used the incorrect type of division over here, or if I forgot how to uh, remove the, if I forgot to add this line, well, I'd add a breakpoint over here and I'd say, aha, uh -huh, so uh, I'm not reducing my number if this line was missing. And so on. Th that, that's the process of debugging. Debugging is just placing breakpoints, telling your program to continue to the next breakpoint and examining each variable. Is the variable, which I'm looking at, uh, containing the correct value it should be at this point of the program. And if it isn't, what's causing that? And if I can't find it on this run, since I've skipped over it, well, I stop it and then no, okay, this variable doesn't, didn't get the value correctly. So I'll pr place a breakpoint earlier. If, if here it was already with the wrong value, well, I'd probably need to look for the uh, reason for the wrong value in the start of the program. So that's what debugging is. It's just jumping around places in your code, using the debugger and navigating between breakpoints. How, how were we doing that? Well, we place a breakpoint where we want the program to stop, actually to pause, and then we just uh, continue on to that breakpoint. If it's the first breakpoint, we just start our program, enter our input and so on. And then when the program stops at the breakpoint, we examine the state of the code in this variables window. Notice, by the way, that when you go into debugger mode, the console gets hidden. This is the console. There is a different tab for the console and you can go back to it by clicking on this tab down left here. Okay, so you can switch between console and debugger through these tabs. Okay, and then you check in the variables window what variable has what value. And you can even write expressions. I showed you that you can do, for example, number plus 10 and see what that does. Okay, so this is what debugging is. It's simply going around in your code, checking values of variables and deciding, is this value correct? And if it isn't, how can I fix it so that it can become correct? Okay, so that's uh, what we uh, need to know about debugging, uh, at least up until this point. Now, ah, another thing which, you, uh, which would be nice for you to know, um, if you start the program and that program doesn't finish, for example, you, th that would probably mean that you either are waiting for input somewhere or you have an endless loop somewhere. Now, one thing you can do 
is use this pause function. What that, what that does is navigate you to the current position in the Java execution where uh, the program is located. Now, once you do that, notice that we ended up in some file input stream class and we got paused over here. Okay, so how do we find where that is in our code? Well, we go back to the debugger and you look at this frames window, this the left part of the debugger. And this, all of the yellow text here are inter internal Java functions. The first non-yellow backgrounded uh, text is the place in your program where this is located. So if I click here, I can see that, aha, uh -huh, so this read bytes function, which I was uh, sent to earlier, is part of scanner.nextin because look, in main, someone called nextint. That's how uh, the sequence of calls in programs work. We will discuss that in detail when we get to um, talking about methods. But this is how the sequence of operations works. You have main, and then on top of that, you have the call to next int, and that calls something else, and that calls something else, and so on, and so on, and so on. And if you pause the code somewhere like we did, you get to the bottom of where it was paused, where, where it's waiting for input in this case. And if you want to find your part of the code, you just find the topmost white background in these lines and select that, and that would navigate you to the position where uh, you stop the program. So if you're searching for which while loop didn't end, well, if you're seeing a program which you've entered all the input and it keeps executing it and it doesn't print anything, you probably have an endless while loop or for loop or something. And then you just examine with uh, the, the debugger, you pause the code and you see where you're located. And then you can figure out, okay, so why doesn't this end? Well, what are the variables? Uh, what, what are the values of the variables currently? What should they be? Which variable doesn't have the correct value? Uh, why is it getting that incorrect value? And so on. Okay. So IntelliJ has this debugger. It has these breakpoints which allow you to tell the program to stop at certain location and it allows you to trace what happens after what, meaning you can jump around breakpoints. There are also other features like um, jumping over parts of code and jumping into parts of code, but really the you would mostly be using the breakpoints. At least that's what I do. I just place breakpoints where I want my code, my code to stop. And the most important aspect is it allows you to inspect what values you have in the variables at that point in time. Okay, so there are shortcuts for starting without a debugger. Over here you have this button starts without a debugger. This will not stop at breakpoints. The bug symbol over here will stop at breakpoints. This is starting with the debugger. Okay, so F8 will just uh, continue your execution of the program from the position you're located. Uh, you can add stuff like conditional breakpoints too. So you can add a breakpoint and you can tell this breakpoint by right clicking on it. The condition for this breakpoint is if a number, for example, is less than zero. Only then stop at this breakpoint. Don't stop at this breakpoint in any other condition. Now, this is something you won't be adding regular, regularly, but it's something you could use for... Uh, conditional breakpoints are actually used when you have a lot of executions of for example, a for loop, and you don't want to stop on each one of them. You only want to stop on a specific execution of a for loop, for example, when the index is 5 or when the index is 130 and so on. Okay, so let's examine this program and find what the bugs in it are. I'll copy the program and I'll paste it into my main method. And I'll try to find what causes this program to run incorrectly. Now, what's the point of these uh, of this program? Well, it should find the first n odd numbers and print their sum. So this is the task we, which we were solving uh, a while back. Okay, so what does it do? Well, let's uh, try some input for this program and see what, uh, what it doesn't do correctly. Okay, so let's input something which we already know. Let's start it and input something which we already know. What is that thing that we already know? Well, um, we already know that the sum for 5 was 25 and the numbers for, were from 1 
to, to nine, right? So one, three, five, seven, nine, that those are five numbers and the sum of those numbers is 25. So what's get, what gets printed? Well, one, three, five, seven, nine, 11 and the sum is 31 okay so there are there seem to be a lot of errors over here so when you can fix something simple start by doing that what's the simplest thing we can fix well all of these are printed on the same line so we can find that pretty quickly we don't need debugging for that so we need print line over here now if we start this program again we can test it and let's see if it works better than previously okay so now it goes one three five seven nine eleven and then 31 okay so why does it reach 11 so the the first issue over here we have to solve is why does this program reach 11 it should print only five numbers but instead it's printing six numbers okay so how would we check that well we place a breakpoint here we start the program and then and then we check each of the conditions which happens so the first condition uh, first we need to enter five so initially we can see that i is equal to zero and n is equal to five so that seems correct um, and then we're continuing continuing i is one and n is five so let's see how this will since it start since i started from zero uh, and n is 5, I should reach at most 4, right? So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 are exactly 5 executions. Be and we want exactly 5 executions. So we should reach at most 4. So let's see what happens. I becomes 2, then I press F9 again, I becomes 3, and it stops at this breakpoint again. Then I press F9 again, and I becomes 4, and then I press F9 again, and lo and behold, I becomes 5. This is the sixth execution. Now, do I want the sixth, sixth execution? Well, I want exactly five executions. And notice how I'm adding numbers. I'm using the formula 2 times i plus 1. So for i equals 0, actually, I can calculate it. I can say, OK, place, place this expression inside this variables window. And let's see what that generates. OK, that generates 11. That's the number I didn't want generated. Okay, so, so I should have placed it, this actually in the beginning of the debugging process so I can see w what value is what. Okay, so I get 11 and I get that printed. So I don't want 11 printed. So why am I printing 11? Well, I'm printing 11 because I become 6. Uh, I becomes 5. So I should never become 5 because it started from 0. And if I was 0, so if I get this expression, I copy it and I replace i with 0. That's the correct value for the first odd number, right? So for i equals 0, this is the correct value. So the formula is correct. The thing that isn't correct is i. i is 5. And it shouldn't be 5. It should never reach 5. It should start from 0 and reach 4 inclusively. Since uh, Why should it reach 4 inclusively? Well, since we have 5 executions and the number of numbers from 0 to 4 inclusively is exactly 5 numbers. Okay. So why are we reaching 5? Well... If we're reaching i equals 5, since i is the control variable of the loop, one reason for reaching it might be that our condition wouldn't be correct, or our increment isn't correct, but the increment looks correct. So what remains? Well, the condition. And yes, if we look at that condition, if, and if we copy it, and if we paste it over here, we'll see that that condition is true currently for i equals uh, 5. Why is it true when it shouldn't be? Well, because we're using less than or equal instead of just less than. Okay, so we're changing that and we're going, we're going to start the program again and see if the, issue, the issues are fixed or if there are other problems. Okay, so we enter 5 and we got 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. So the output for the uh, odd numbers is correct. But what isn't correct is the sum. So I have 21 as the sum. Why do I have 21? Okay, so let's do this again. We'll place a breakpoint over here and we'll see what do I print and what do I add into the sum? Because I know that the sum isn't correct now. So the sum should be 25 if you, re if you remember from the last example. So we're going over here and okay, let's see. I'm printing the correct number. So I know that this is the correct formula for the current number. Am, am I adding this? 
to the sum. Well, no, I'm not. I'm adding something different. So this exp I don't need to debug any further because I see that I'm printing one thing and I'm adding another thing into the sum. Now, if you're going to be adding the same thing to the sum and to the printing, well, don't have two expressions. Have a single expression. Mark the expression. Say control alt v. That would extract a variable and I'd call this uh, the odd number. This is my odd number which I'm adding. So the issue over here was that I wasn't adding the correct um, the, the correct number to the sum. I had the formula copied, but I didn't copy or whoever wrote the code didn't copy the entire formula or didn't uh, uh, code it correctly. Maybe they coded it once and then they tried to write the same thing again, but missed adding the plus one over here. Okay, so let's try it again. Always when you're reusing some expression, you should, well, not always, but almost always when you're using some expression, you should have a variable for it. You don't need to write it over and over again. That's what variables are for. Okay, so let's enter five. Okay, so now we got one, three, five, seven, nine, and the sum, the sum is 26. Why is it 26? Well, we know that we're adding the correct numbers because we're printing the correct numbers. So the only reason for the sum to be incorrect is if it doesn't, if it's not, so it's not in the loop. That's what I'm saying. It's not in the loop because what we're printing, we're also adding. So if it's not in the loop and it's not, if it's not after the loop because this is just a print, it's got to be before the loop. And if we notice, sum starts from one, but what should it start from? It should start from zero because we don't know if the sum is one. We'll, we will only have the sum of one if, when we add the first number. And that should be the last fix in our uh, program and that should finish the debugging session we have now. So entering five, we'll see one, three, five, seven, nine and the sum of 25. Now notice how at each step I examined the variables which there were in the code. So you've pro if you were watching carefully, you probably noticed all of these bugs before I mentioned them. And I, I did too. I, actually, I didn't notice this one. I noticed it at the end. Uh, but I noticed all of the other bugs previously, but I wanted to demonstrate how I go step by step into the code and look at the problem spots. So the obvious problem spot initially was the lack of new lines. Then the next obvious uh, problem spot was the incorrect iteration of the numbers. And then the next problem spot was the incorrect sum. And that finished up my debugging. So I went piece by piece uh, and line by line in my code. And I found each obvious problem. I found what caused it. I found the values which it used. And I used that to debug the program. Okay, so that's how you debug a program. And the again, the pattern is find an issue, find an error. Notice that there is an error. After noticing there is an error, find which part of the code causes it. How do you do that? Well, you start debugger and start examining values of variables. You examine the exact places where you expect there to be uh, an incorrect value of these variables. If you can't find it, you just look for it. You go step by step in your code and look for values that don't match up with your expectations. And then you just make the changes required to get the correct values. So we talked about how we can declare variables and we talked about how we can print them on the console. We talked about what uh, the structure of a Java program is, and we talked that the entry point is always the main method. We talked about conditional statements and how we can branch program logic. We talked about how we can repeat code multiple times based on input from the console or any other uh, calculation. And we saw how we can use the debugger. Thanks for listening. As always, uh, ask your questions in the channels we have provided. And I hope this was helpful for you and see you next time. In this lesson, your instructor George will explain and demonstrate the primitive data types in Java, how to declare, initialize and use variables, and how to perform time conversions from one data type to another. He will explain the integer types, int and long, the floating type, point types, float and double, the text types, char and string, and the special types, boolean and object. Along with the live coding examples, your instructor will give you some hands-on exercises to gain practical experience with the mentioned coding concepts. Are you ready? Let's start!
Hello everyone, this is George, I'm your technical trainer and today we will be talking about data types and variables. Now, by this point you already know what variables are, but we haven't formally been introduced to them in connection to the data types they have. So today this is what we're going to cover. Now, what are we going to start with? We're going to start with uh, what data types are and how do they relate to variables in Java because in different programming languages some concepts are different uh, depending on whether the data whether the programming language is statically typed like java or not like javascript so we will be talking about that we will discuss the integer and the real number types meaning integers and double and float we will also be talking about type conversion meaning how you can convert from one data type to another with and without losing data we will be talking about the Boolean data type, which we've seen when we have made comparisons with uh, the comparison operators when we're doing, uh, for example, an if condition. Whatever you place in that if condition is actually an, a variable of the Boolean data type. So we will be discussing that. And we will be discussing the character and string data types and how do they relate to each other and how we can use them. So. Let's talk, let's talk about data types. What actually we need to know about data types is related to how computer uh, science uh, operates on information and on how computers actually access information. So computers in their most basic uh, form and their most, more, most general description are just machines that process data in some way, they, they process information, they, they get information from somewhere, they um, do some operations on it and they output information somewhere else. So uh, to, to handle this information, to process this, this information, computers need to store it somewhere. A computer needs to have a place where it puts information and then works on that information so it can give the results uh, it gives after its computations. So what typically happens is you have some uh, data coming in, some information coming into a computer. That information gets con converted into computer memory through uh, using the binary numeral system, i.e. you get ones and zeros in the computer's memory. And that those ones and zeros are actually uh, stored into transistors, which are the computer's uh, basic memory unit. Each transistor has either an on state or an off state, meaning it either uh, that's simplification. But let's say it either has current flowing through it or it doesn't. It's more complicated than that. But simply put, it the there's an easy way in electronics to represent two values. Uh, uh, a, a 1 and a 0, let's say, and that's why computers use the binary numeral system to represent information because it's easy to uh, implement in electronics from an engineering perspective. So the hardware limits the way computers uh, access data to 1s and zeros. So a computer contains all of its memory is 1s and zeros. Now, how it handles the information it has determines the data types we're using here. So, ones and zeros are ones and zeros. They don't care about what you're representing in them. It, they're just ones and zeros. But how we handle those ones and zeros, how we treat a bunch of ones and zeros, determines what uh, operations we can do on those ones and zeros. So, when you have a bunch of ones and zeros sitting somewhere, what you can do with them is create a variable for them, name them in a certain way, and set the, that variable's data type. So when you have uh, a piece of memory like, for example, 00000101, here's a piece of memory. This is actually a single byte because it contains eight bits, eight ones or zeros in a sequence, one after another, and this actually is the binary representation of the number 5. So this is the number 5, our decimal number 5, uh, in, the, in the binary representation. So 101 zero, one is 5. Now how that formula, uh, how, how we get from 101 one to 5, how, how does the formula work, we don't really care that much currently, but simply put, you just add 
powers of 2 where you see 1. So here you, you add the 0th power of 2. So this is uh, index 0, this is index 1, this is index 2, this is index 3, and so on. Well, whatever the index is, you if there's a 1 there, you just add 2 to the power of whatever the index is, whatever the position is. And then over here, we won't be adding anything because there's a 0. And then over here, we will be, we will be adding 2 to the power of, since this is index 2, well, to the power of 2. So that's two, 2 to the power of 0 is 1, plus 2 to the power of 2 is 4, and that gives us 5. Okay, so that's how an integer would be represented, an integer number, a positive integer number would be represented uh, in memory in a computer. But if that exact same memory is of a different data type, it will be treated in different ways. So if we tell that piece of memory to, uh, get, to get assigned by the value 5, that's what we're going to see in, in the first byte of that memory. So we're going to see exactly that uh, 1, 0, 1 sequence. However, if um, the, the exact same sequence is interpreted as another data type, it will be some other thing. It won't be the number 5, it will be uh, for example, a symbol, so, some symbol from the uh, ASCII character table. So when we talk about variables, we actually, and, and specifically data types, we actually talk about not different storage into the uh, computer. What we're talking about is different ways of treating that storage, different ways of treating a sequence of ones and zeros to get a different representation in the, for example, on the console. Okay, so you assign variables, and you know that already, by using the operator equals. So if you want to assign an integer variable uh, named count with the value 5, just like we had, uh, in this case, the byte containing the value 5, what would happen is an integer variable will be created, the memory for an integer variable will be created, that memory will contain exactly 4 bytes for integers in Java, we will uh, cover this a bit further on, but 4 bytes will be allocated in computer memory, each of these will have 8 bytes, so this will have 8 bytes, this will have 8 bytes, this will have 8 bytes, and this one will also have 8 bytes, so uh, 8 bits, sorry, 8 bits, a byte contains 8 bits, and the integer data type is a 4 byte integer representation. So when you say integer, that's 4 bytes. Every integer you create assigns 4 bytes of uh, computer memory to your program. And assigning a value to these bytes will set the uh, appropriate bytes to the appropriate uh, values so that they match the binary representation of the number 5 in this case. So this is what happens when you create a variable. Creating variables actually allocates memory, meaning it takes memory from the system and gives it to your um, program. Okay, so this is uh, an allocation of a 4-byte integer on memory, and this is what happens when we assign it a value. The sum of the bytes in that memory change, so they represent the value from uh, our program. So what... Uh, what we call an integer, an int here, is the data type. This is called the data type, and this is the variable name in this case, and this is the variable value. Okay, so if you do any operation with this variable, in order to keep the result, you need to either write it into the same variable or write it into another variable. So doing operations on data requires you to save them back into memory. Each operation a computer does needs to be saved back into memory or otherwise printed on the console or sent over the network or something so that that value is contained. Otherwise, what happens is that the processor creates that value and if there's nowhere to send it, it just loses it. Okay, so the data type, in this case integer, in this example integer, a data type is just a domain of values. It's, it's the type of values and the way we treat them that uh, that determines the data type. And it's it's not even the type of values, it's how we treat those values. So the same ones and zeros can be treated like an integer, they can be treated like a character, they can be treated like a string, they can be treated like a floating point number, and so on. It really depends on the data type you're using, but otherwise, underlying all of it is just the binary numero system and ones and zeros in transistors in computer uh, parts. Okay, so each data type 
from the point of view of a programmer, it's a domain of values. So you see the you see a data type as the possible values a variable can get if it is uh, initialized with that data type. So if you initialize something with the integer data type, you know that this variable can get values which are integers, positive and negative integers in a certain range. We will discuss that range later on. Okay, so for example, we can store one, two, three, or minus one, minus two, minus three. Um, those would be the integer data type. If we want to store characters, we would be using the character data type, which is written like this, char or char. Uh, you, you can find different uh, uh, readings of this uh, type. I would just call it char for now because it's easier to read like that. But this is the character data type. That's where, where char comes from. Okay, and you could also have Monday, Tuesday, another uh, real world objects into uh, your programs and we will see how we can add those to our programs later on. Okay, so what does a, what does a Java data type contain? Well, it contains typically a name, the name of that data type, for example, integer, uh, string, um, enumerations, uh, character, float, double, bytes, uh, short, and so on. It has a size, each data type in Java has a specific size which represents it meaning how much memory that uh, data type uses. I already mentioned that the integer data type has a size of 4 bytes, whereas the char data type has a size of 2 bytes. Okay, and it also has a default value. Now, these default, default values will come into play when we talk about arrays or when we talk about objects. From, for now, these default values we can ignore. Creating a variable directly will not initialize it with its default value, so these default values we don't really care about for at this for this uh, uh, part of the lessons we have. Okay, so integer is a four byte integer represent uh, a four byte representation of an integer number. If we say int, this is a primitive data type. Primitive meaning that all other data types, uh, all data types which are not primitive are based on the primitive data types. A primitive data type is a data type that can be directly um, processed by the CPU. So it, it's just a sequence of uh, bytes which are uh, usually a representation of a number in one way or another. So primitive data types are data types which are just chunks of uh, information and int is one of them, float is another, double is another, string however isn't a primitive data type. Uh, we will uh, discuss that in detail later on. Okay, so it takes up 4 bytes or 32 bits and we'll uh, talk about that later on and its default value is 0. Typically, the default value of each primitive data type will be either zero or something that resembles zero, that, that is effectively zero um, in computer memory, meaning just a sequence of zeros and no ones is bits. Uh, and that, that rule applies for the floating point data type and it also applies for the character data type. Now what does it mean for a character to be zero? Zero? Well, we will discuss that when we reach uh, the part of the lecture that discusses characters. Okay, and since we've already created some variables, it's a good idea to now discuss how we name those variables so we match the conventions in Java. Now, every language has some conventions about how variables should be named. And depending on the language you're using, you should be using that convention, that the, or at least the common convention in that language when you're naming your variables. In Java, what's accepted is that variables are camel case, meaning that each word is connected to the next word without any separators like underscore, for example, or uh, something else. And each word in the in the variable name is capitalized except for the first word. So the first word has a small uh, a lowercase letter and each of the next words uh, in the word in the variable name is capitalized. Okay, so hence camel case okay, because it looks like a camel with a hump in, the, in its middle. Now you should try to name them with nouns and possibly adjectives plus nouns so uh, if you're having um, a variable which is mm, preferred weight or something, or uh, preferred color, 
you know, preferred is the adjective, and noun is color. So, uh, or just a noun, for example, apples or students or number of apples. That also kind of follows the adjective plus noun concept. You have uh, a descriptor of what the next word means. But these over here don't uh, really pay that much attention to them. You will get used to um, the examples we're giving in our lessons and those examples will be descriptive enough for you to, um, to, to sort of parrot what we're doing in your variable name. So the most important thing is that the variable should explain what that variable contains. So when I see your code, if I haven't seen it before, I should be able to understand, okay, so this variable is called uh, student, so it, and it's an integer. So it probably contains the number of students uh, which have been, for example, read from the console. Okay, so this, these are examples of good names or okay names. Again, how descriptive a name should be depends on the context in which it is used. So if you have a short program, you don't really need that, that much of descriptive names, but it's good practice to try and uh, code descriptive names so that you have um, a good idea of how to do it further on when you um, create larger programs. Uh, and depending on where your variable is declared, its name can be shorter or longer depending on the surrounding code. For example, a for loop, which just executes something an n amount of times, is completely fine. it's completely fine to use uh, just int i there, like i short for index, uh, because it's something pretty standard in programming and other people will easily understand what you mean. However, if it's not obvious what your variable means, like for example full bar p1 uh, populate or last name like this, uh, last name in this case isn't uh, non-descriptive but it starts with a capital L and it would confuse um, potential readers of your code with other types of variables because there are um, things in Java which you name with a capital L in the start and they're called classes and if someone just sees a variable named like this they will be confused whether that's a variable or a class and they would have to look at that variable again and see what it does where it's initialized and so on. Also in Java avoid uh, underscores like this. Java uh, code doesn't typically include underscores in names of variables so avoid them. And again these last ones are okay descriptions but they are not okay for matting, well as these don't really tell us anything. So avoid names like this unless, for example, for P, unless you have some very short piece of code which, let's say, calculates the area of uh, or the perimeter. Let's say you calcul you're calculating the perimeter of a circle or of something else. Well, in that case, since P is often used in maths, you can use P, but again, it should be a short piece of code, a very short two or three lines at most, and if it isn't, you should probably name it a bit more descriptively. Okay, so continuing on from here, uh, once we know how we should declare these variables so they are uh, easy to be read from uh, other users of our code, we should talk about something we haven't yet met in uh, programming and that's scope and lifetime of a variable. So scope is where you can access a variable. When we're writing code, let's open IntelliJ, when we're writing code and declaring variables, let's say we declare a number variable here and say its value is five, five that, va that variable is visible from the start of this main method to the end of this main method. So all of these lines are um, that, that's actually that's the the scope in which the variable uh, is accessible. However, you can actually only I'm actually talking to you about lifetime. You can only access the variable after you've declared it. So the scope of a variable is actually the uh, method in which it exists, or the largest block of code in uh, the smallest block of code in which it is placed, and that's okay so this this entire part and then you cut from that the part to which uh, the part before which the variable is initialized so this whole thing 
is a part of code where your variable isn't visible. It becomes visible to other code once it gets declared like this. So if you have int number, even if you don't give it a value, from here on out, you get the scope of your variable. So the scope begins from the declaration of the variable, from the place where you say, here's a variable of this type, and the scope ends where the uh, block of code in which your variable is declared ends. So the scope of the variable ends with the uh, end of the block of code. And a block of code is just um, the code between two curly brackets like this one. It doesn't matter if these curly brackets are the brackets of a method or the brackets of a condition or, or the brackets of a loop or the brackets of uh, a class and so on. So every time, every time a variable is accessible within the brackets in which uh, it is created. To access it from other places, you would need, depending on what those places are, you would need different code. So by default, the scope of a variable starts from where the variable is declared and ends where the first closing curly, curly bracket appears, the first closing bracket which matches uh, the opening bracket in which the variable was declared. So, if we have an if here and say, uh, let's say number is 5 over here, and we have an if here and say if number is larger than 1, then create a variable int x which is 2, and then we go over here and say system.out.println number. Now, this is uh, code that doesn't really do anything, but we're illustrating a point here. Now, the point we're illustrating is the following. I initialize the variable and it's visible outside this if statement. It's also visible inside this if statement and it's visible up until we reach this closing bracket. It's not, however, visible over here. You can't say if number larger than 5 over here. Why? Well, we're in the same block of code, but we are before the creation of this number variable. So this limits the access to the number variable from the start of the declaration onwards. Anything outside that can't access the number variable. Okay, and... Here we can access number because, why? Well, because number is visible from here on out and it's visible until the end of the main method. However, if we try to print x over here, we'd get an error, a compile time error. Why would we get that? Well, because this x variable is declared inside this block of code and it's visible from its declaration onwards to the end of the block of code and that block of code ends over here. So because x is declared inside the if statement, it can only be accessed from inside that if statement. The same goes for loops. Now, an interesting thing is that if you create a for loop, from starting from i equals 0 to i less than 10, let's say, it doesn't really matter what indexes you pick, in this case, if you try to access this i variable, it still won't be accessible, even though it's not between uh, these curly brackets of the for loop. So it's not like the um, if statement. It's still not accessible, even though it's not within the curly brackets. But the reason for that is that uh, the for loop is just a shorthand construction for a while loop, and it kind of cheats. So this anything you initialize over here is only visible between these two curly brackets, only within them, not a, not outside them. So things initialized inside again, it, it's pretty much the same like uh, with conditional statements. Things initialized inside the conditional statement are only visible inside the conditional statement, and things initialized inside the for loop are only visible inside the for loop. Uh, the only specific here is where actually inside means. Inside typically means uh, the curly brackets, but for a for loop it also means these brackets over here. Okay, so that's the scope of a variable and the lifetime of a variable is how long that variable stays in memory. Now the lifetime is the entire block of code in which the variable exists. So it may not be accessible before it is declared, but it's actually in memory from before it is declared. So that's how, the, uh, that's how computer memory treats variables. So if you have a primitive data type variable in double char float and so on, 
it will take up memory from the moment the code block which contains it starts. Okay, so let's actually play around with that a bit. Let's say we have a for loop and we create a variable in uh, sum inside it and say sum plus equals i and then um, then let then what do you expect in this for loop to happen for the sum variable? What, what will the value of the sum variable be? For the first execution, it will obviously start from 0. And then we, we will add i, which is also 0. So sum will be 0. What will sum be on the next execution when i equals 1? So let's get to the point where i equals 1. So sum is what? Would it initialize again or would it add i? Now, even though I've named this sum, it doesn't really calculate the sum. Why? Well, because what did we say about the lifetime of a variable? The lifetime of a variable is between the brackets of uh, between the brackets that contain it directly. So, these brackets of the for loop contain the sum variable, meaning that this variable gets created over here. And then its lifetime ends when the loop body ends. And the loop body ends on each iteration of the loop. You know, the loop starts over here, executes this part of the body, executes this part of the body, and then the body ends. And then the body is created again, and executed again, and then the body ends, and so on and so forth. So, what happens over here is that the lifetime of the sum variable is one execution of the for loop. So each time this sum variable is created anew. So this is a new sum variable, it is created, it is assigned the value of 0, and then we add i equals 0 to it, and then i becomes 1, and then the sum variable is created again, and then we add i equals 1 to it, it becomes 1, but then it dies at the end of this for loop. And then it gets created again, sum equals 0, and then we add i, which is 2 at this point, and then sum becomes 2, but then it again dies at the end of this for loop. So if you have something between the cur between curly brackets, it dies whenever these curly brackets get executed, when, whenever the execution point of the program reaches the end of the curly brackets. Okay, so that means that you don't calculate sums like that. In order to calculate the sum, you have to have the sum variable outside of the for loop, and do the calculations inside the for loop. Now, in this case, the sum variable gets increased each time by the i variable, and that gets stored. It, it doesn't get reset again because it's initialized inside the main body, not inside the for body. And then I can use it over here to print system.out.println, print the sum to print the output. Okay, so that's lifetime. Lifetime determines how long the sum variable lives. And this means that the sum variable, if it's inside the for loop, not only will it not be accessible for print line over here, because its scope will end here, but also its lifetime will end here, and we don't really calculate the sum this way, we just reinitialize sum with the value of i on each execution. So that's lifetime. That's the lifetime of a variable. And here we have an example. Here's a string variable, which is outside uh, somewhere. Uh, it, it's actually outside the for loop, but it's inside the main method. And here we have a for loop, which has an inner string variable, and this is inside the for loop. So this gets initialized each time the for loop runs, whereas outer gets initialized only once. And outer is accessible outside the for loop because it's declared outside the for loop, whereas inner isn't available outside the for loop, and if we try to access it, we will get a compile time error. Okay, now there's another concept which isn't exactly technical, but it's uh, related to quality code, and that concept is span. Variables have span. What does span mean? Well, it means how much time the variable exists before it is accessed. So in my case, my, the span of my um, some variable is two lines, so one line here where it's created, and one line here for the for loop, and then I directly access it. Okay, so this is the span of a variable. Now, 
I can move this integer i variable outside the for loop, like so, and I can initialize it here, but I can declare it here. In this case, the span of this variable became this line, then this line, then this line. It, it became a lot of other lines, and there's a variable here, which is, it, it intersects the span of the i variable. So, uh, the span the the length of your, the spans of your variables determines how easy it is to read your code. So the shorter the spans, the easier it is to read. You notice that in this for loop it looks a bit weird, right? So I have an i variable, and that means that that i variable is declared somewhere else, and I need to look for it to see what happens with that i variable before it gets into my for loop. So Using uh, using variables like this isn't really recommended, and a good practice is to keep your spans as short as possible. So you create a variable where you need it. You don't create it at the start of your program. You create it wherever you need that variable and use it at, at that place. So for an example, here outer is its span includes all of these lines up until the point where we print it and we wouldn't we don't really need to do it like this we actually could move the outer variable here since it's being used here and that way it would only have a span of two lines and it's easier to, to search for it okay so the the main concept you should take away here is keep your variable span short if you need a variable somewhere declare it there the only exception is if you want to create a sum and yeah, we need the sum here, but we also need it outside. So try to keep the lifetime and the span of a variable as short as possible. The shorter a variable lives, the easier it is to read because you don't need to look for it in a lot of places. You only need to look for it wherever it is used. Okay, so that improves readability. It's easier to read code which has shorter spans. And here we have more examples. You can check them out later on. Okay. So, once we've covered what uh, variables are and what their span is, let's cover the integer data types which we've already used, so we can see what their properties are, what their differences are, and so on. So, there are four integer data types in Java. They are byte, short, integer, int, and long. And this, this is the order in which uh, their size increases. So byte is the smallest possible integer data type and it represents an 8-bit integer. Short represents a 16-bit integer, int represents a 32-bit integer, and long represents a 64-bit integer. Now, do you need to remember these values? No, you don't. What you need to remember is these sizes. And how do you calculate how, how many values uh, a data type can represent? Well, it's pretty simple. Let's say we have a single byte data type, a single bit data type, so one bit, only one bit. How many values can you store in one bit? Well, you can store either zero or one. Okay, how many values can you store in two bits? Well, you can store zero, zero, you can store zero one you can store one zero and you can store one one so four values we can play around with this even further what happens with three bits well you can store zero 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 then you can store zero zero one then you can store zero 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 one zero then you can store zero one one then you can store one zero zero then you can store 101 one, then you can store 110 one, then you can store 111 one, one, and that's pretty much it right so these are 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 values okay so do you see a pattern here there is a pattern over here the pattern is the following if you have one bit you can store 2 to the power of 1 values if you have two bits you can store 2 to, to the power of 2 values Right? Four values. One, two, three, four values. If you have three bits, you can store two to the power of three values. So, eight values. Eight possible combinations of ones and zeros for that length of bits. So, that's all you need to remember. You need to remember the sizes and you need to just raise that to the power, to raise two to that power. So, 
a byte can store two to the eight uh, bit, uh, to the two to the eight combinations of bits, two to the eight values, two to the eight. Yeah, and you, as a programmer, you should probably learn the powers of two. So two to the power of one is two. Two to the power of two is four. Three is eight. Four is sixteen. Five is thirty-two. Six is sixty-four. Seven is one hundred and twenty-eight. And eight is two hundred and fifty-six. So two hundred and fifty-six possible values inside a single byte of information. This represents exactly one byte of information. Hence, 256 values split evenly between positive and negative gives you from minus 128 to plus 127 and 0. I said split evenly, but since we're including 0, that reduces the maximum uh, integer value for a byte. Okay, compared to the minimum integer value for a byte. Okay, so this is how you calculate the size of a byte. And how do you calculate the size of a short? Well, it's 16 bits, so it's... And you start the calculator. You start a calculator, and that calculator, you input... Uh, you go into the scientific view, and you just say 2 to the power of 16 for short, and you get 65,536. And it's actually pr pretty close to... Uh, the 64 number which we got to, to the 2 to the power of 6, like right? So 2 to the power of 6 is 64, whereas 2 to the power of 16 is about 65,000. So that, that's a mnemonic you can use to uh, remember that. Why, why is it like that? Well, it's because 2 to the power of 10 is 1,000, which is similar to 1. You can think of that as like that. So the powers from 10 onwards are similar to the powers from 1 onwards. So 2 to the power of 2 is 2000 and something, um, and 2 to the power of 1 is uh, um, 2, simply. So um, w w I didn't mean to... Uh, 2 to the power of 11, yeah, I messed, up. I messed that up. So 2 to the power of 11 gives you 2048, 2048, and 2 to the power of 1 gives you 2, right? So they, they look similar. This is to the power of, it isn't 21, this is 2 to the power of 1 gives you 2. So the values are somewhat similar before 10, before the 10th the power and after the 10th power. Okay, so uh, that's it for short. And how does it work for integer? Well, 32 bits are about 4 billion values. And 4 billion split evenly between negative and positive gives you these values. You don't need to remember the exact values. And if you need the exact value for some reason, you can always do, let's say for integer, you can do integer dot max value. This gives you a variable, this gives you a value, which is the maximum value for an integer. So int max equals max value would give you the maximum value for an integer. And if you print this on the console, you will see this number printed. Okay, so for long, it's an even longer, bigger number. Again, what you need to remember is the number of bytes or the number of bits for these data types. And to use the appropriate data type depending on how many bits you're going to need. Okay, so here we have an example of this, uh, of using the appropriate data type for the appropriate maximal values we're expecting. So if we're going to be representing a date in the current century, one way to do it is to represent the number of centuries with a byte, because a byte can represent values from minus 128 to plus 127. So since in, we're in the 20th century currently, it's going to take a lot of time before our program starts working incorrectly, meaning that it reaches the 127th century. So we're okay with storing centuries in a byte if we're going to represent the current day. And storing years in a short because 65,000 years from 65,000 years, we're going to have a lot of time until we get to the year 65,000 since we're currently in the year 2000 or approximately in the year 2000. And days, well, when you get to days, you kind of need 
quite bigger numbers and when you get to hours you need even bigger numbers and so on so what you can do when you're solving tasks is to minimize the amount of memory you're using by picking data types which uh, can save lower va lower values but large enough values to cover your expectations for the maximum value so this is sort of an optimization it's not really done that much done that often uh, people usually use integer for everything because there's plenty of memory these days and you don't really need to optimize for each byte but if you do need to optimize for each byte well that's why you have the different data types in java and those allow you to optimize the amount of data you're storing okay so we won't be playing around with this too much you can try out creating these variables and see how uh, they work there these data types act the same way that integer does but the maximum value they can save is less okay and i'm saying the maximum value and the minimum value and i'm saying that because you need to uh, be aware of the integer overflow problem when you're using lower values than uh, lower data type, smaller data types than the values you're trying to save so what happens what would happen if i create a for loop i create a for loop but i create i create it not with a byte with an integer but with a byte and i say um run this for loop until it reaches 130 and say system dot out dot print line i so print the number which i'm which i'm at at the moment well if i start this since bytes maximum value is 127 i will never reach 130 what happens to i actually is you can notice what happens on the console the console keeps printing numbers and these numbers rotate from positive integers to negative integers and positive integers and neg negative integers again well what happens is that if you have a variable uh, by let's say that's byte x and that's equal to byte dot max value which is 127 and then you say x plus plus x rolls around and becomes it overflows this is an uh, integer overflow integer as in the type of number not as in the uh, data type int so what you get here is an integer over overflow overflow and that causes your byte to become to jump from the maximum byte value to the minimum byte value so if we place a breakpoint over here and start this program we will notice that x is now let's see minus 128 that is byte dot min value what actually happens is you can imagine um, the data types in the following way you have uh, zero over here and then you have sort of a circle which reaches for byte 127 and then it jumps onto minus 128 and then that goes back to zero so if you're increasing a value and increasing it and increasing it a byte value and you reach 127 if you add one to that it moves you to the minimum value min minus 128 now why that works the way it does is based on how uh, how numbers are represented in binary and it's got to do with something called two's complement and you can google that to see why the uh, the plus operation works that way but that's simply uh, how computers imp implement integer numbers whole numbers so by the way that means that if you're at 127 and you add two so if you say add two that would give you not minus 128 again it would give you minus 127 and the same rules go for integer and long and uh, short and so on all it's uh, absolutely the same thing so if you overflow the integer you get the negative values and by depending on how much you overflow it by you will get that integer value that offset of integer value okay so be beware of this be careful with this so when you're 
working with close close to the maximum value of your data type well you probably should uh, change to the next larger data type and use that okay so that's what you do for integer data types and that, that's why you have to be careful because this loop over here will never finish it will keep executing until i reaches uh until until the end of time until we stop the program it will never reach 130. okay so, uh, you keep this in mind and you, again, the advice is use integer most of the time. Integer is your go-to data type for integer numbers. It's also optimized to work with the processor architecture uh, of your computer. So, you should be fine using integer most of the time. But, uh, be wary of uh, larger... Um, if you have a, a programming problem and that programming problem tells you that um, the numbers which you're going to be using are, um, let's say you're going to be summing 10 integer numbers and you have to output the sum uh, and the integer numbers can be any integer value, then you probably should make the sum a long sum. Why? Well, because if you sum uh, integer dot max value plus integer dot max value minus one that will overflow so if you're working uh, with any if you're calculating a sum for integer values and those integer values can be from minus two, two billion to plus two billion then you probably want the sum to be a long sum okay now Another thing we need to discuss about uh, integers are their literals. Now what we're using over here when we say i less than 130 or when we're saying int number equals 5, this is a so-called literal. It's a literal value in the code, meaning that the value isn't read from the console. It's not uh, taken from another variable, like if we have int x equals 5 and then number equals x, well, x isn't a literal, it's a variable. But this is a literal representation of uh, a numeric value in the code, and this in this case is an integer literal. So, numeric literals written like this are by default integers. So, this is an integer, it's treated like an integer. Now, you, if you prefix that with 0x or 0x capital, that means uh, hexadecimal numeral system. So 0xf means 16. That's because f in the hexadecimal numeral system is 16. Uh, actually 15, sorry. This is 15 because it's a hexadecimal numeral system and the maximum value of any numeral system is one less than the numeral system's name would suggest. Just like the maximum digit in the decimal numeral system is 9, right? It's not 10. 10 is the numeral system. You get 10 by the digit 1 and the digit 0. Okay, so the maximum hexadecimal is f and you can have multiple. So this is 255 as a value. And how numeral systems work is another subject, which we will cover uh, further on. But it's, uh, it's not something we're going to be discussing today. And anyway, when you see 0x, that means hexadecimal numeral system. Uh, you're often going to see these values for addresses in memory. Addresses in memory are, are typically uh, numbered with this hexadecimal numeral system. Okay, so the, all of these are hexadecimal values. Now, if you see L or L capital, on uh, value that means the value is treated like a long number so instead of int when you say int x and you say that's equal to 5 well that simply uh, converts 5 into an integer and se sets it in into x but if you place an l over here that means this is an, a long number and since we're trying to fit it into an integer now we're getting an error now the reason there is such a suffix for long numbers is in some cases you want a really big number for example let's say 4 billion that's larger than the maximal int value so let's say we have a long number here and we want to set it to 4 billion that's 4 1 2 3 zeros 1 2 3 6 zeros 1 2 3 9 zeros and look what happens so up to this point we have 4 million and now we have 4 billion if we lower it to 2 billion it fits into integer 
and that's why it compiles. However, if we raise it up to 4 billion, that's larger than the maximum maximal integer value, and the compiler is not happy. Why is it not happy? Because this is an inter integer literal, and there is no integer number which matches this literal. Integer can't hold such a large number. So the compiler says, look, do you want a long literal here, or is this a mistake? So the compiler checks for us and sees, okay, this is a pretty large number, maybe he made a mistake, he wanted an integer number but a, a smaller one. So in order for me to indicate that I'm not making a mistake, I'm adding the suffix L at the end, which indicates that no, this is not a mistake, treat that as a long number and save it into the long variable x. Now using the lowercase l also works, but I wouldn't suggest it. Why? Well, because can you find the difference between 1 and L? Well, you can, but you need to look into it closely. And typically, you wouldn't be looking that closely. So use the capital L, because it doesn't look like uh, the integer number 1. OK. So uh, we have a task over here, which is to write a program which converts meters into kilometers. So we have 1,000 meters, and we should print out one uh, kilometer point eighty five. Okay, so how would we do that? We need to read, of course, that integer number from the console. We need to parse it as an integer. And since integers can't hold floating point data, what we need to do from here on out is to divide that by one thousand and save it into a non-integer number which we can display. Now. It's not so much that this task is complicated, it's that notice how we're doing the division. We're dividing not meters by simply 1000, we're dividing meters by 1000.0. Why are we doing that? Well, because since meters is an integer, if we divide it simply by 1000, an integer divided by an integer gives us a result of an integer. So, dividing 1852 by 1000 would not give us 1.85, it would simply give us 1000. So, uh, sorry, not 1000, it would simply give us 1, the value of 1. So, if we want to receive a result that contains a floating point, well, we need to divide by a floating point number. So, if we divide an integer number by a floating point number, then the compiler decides, okay, so this needs to be a floating point result because it contains a floating point in the arithmetic. So whenever you're dividing something by, uh, whenever you're dividing integers, keep in mind that integer division produces integer results. So any floating point parts will be cut off. Okay, and since we're we started talking about floating point types. The next uh, place we're going to visit is how do we create these floating point types and how we use them. Okay, so we saw the integer data types, and now we need to discuss the real number data types. Now, what do we mean by real numbers? Well, we mean 1.25 minus 0 0.38, uh, 2 to the power of uh, 17, uh, or 2.3 to the power of 17, and so on. That's what we mean by real number types. Numbers which aren't uh, whole numbers, they're numbers which have a decimal part. So these are called floating point types in computing, and these floating point types represent the data we're talking about. So uh, these floating point types don't exactly work like the integer data types, and we'll see why not in a moment, but the, the, the defining characteristic uh, for these floating point types is their precision, meaning how many how many digits they can represent after the decimal point, and how many how much memory they use, how many bytes do they use in memory. So there are two data types for floating point uh, representation of data, and those are float and double. So these float and double have different accuracies depending on their sizes, float is the smaller type and double is the larger type, meaning that double gives you a higher accuracy, hence higher precision because it uses more memory. Now even, even with double you will sometimes have abnormalities in calculations and we will see that in a few, see that in a few slides. Uh, and the other thing you uh, 
need to know about the floating point types is that they don't really have they do have a maximum value and the minimum value but their maximum and minimum aren't uh, sequential values like for integer types their maximum values can be stuff like this huge number over here and this small number over here so floating point types are actually exponential types so they, they represent a small number multiplied or a number like 1.37 for example multiplied by a very large exponent so or very small exponent so you may have stuff like 2.38 multiplied by 10 to the 20th power or something like that so that's how floating point uh, types are actually represented in computer memory so float goes from about plus or minus 1.5 multiplied by 10 to the minus 45th uh, uh, power so that means plus or minus 1.5 divided by 10 with 45 zeros that's the smallest value for float and this is the largest value for float and this floating point data type is seven uh, is uh, represented by 32 bits which is by the way the same as which data type as integer so this is the integer size so the size is the same but the way we represent data in it it's very different like i said in the beginning of the lecture data types just uh, describe how you treat the data at the variable's location not the data itself the data is still ones and zeros and float has the exact same amount of ones and zeros as integer does however it represents floating point values because it uses those bits in a different way so float is approximately seven digits precise so you can expect seven digits precision for average numbers like stuff from zero to one million for example uh, seven digits precision after the the decimal point so uh, actually not not after the decimal point seven digits precision in total so you you can expect precisions of up to seven digits and from there on out the, the precision gets lost so double is twice that and it has a precision of about 15 to 16 digits and again using the digits this way isn't isn't very descriptive uh, of what you actually represent because floating point values aren't uh, stored in memory like a sequence of digits of the number they're stored in memory like an exponent like i mentioned previously they're stored in memory like for example 1.7 multiplied to uh, multiplied by 10 to the 34th power or something like that uh, that's how integer uh, that's how floating point values are stored in memory so their precision is a bit arbitrary and how accurate they are they are is also very arbitrary so when you're doing calculations with floating point and uh, with float and double data types with floating point data types you need to always keep in mind that the calculations may be wrong meaning that they may not be exactly right they they will be correct within a margin of error and that margin of error depends on how big or how small your numbers are okay so the default values for them are respectively zero for float and zero for double and notice how we have added the suffixes f and d to these values so if you type in this literal followed by f that would mean a floating point number whereas if you type in just 0.0, .0 without the d or if you add the d that means a double literal so if these are literals in the code this would be a floating a float literal whereas this would be a double literal okay so float and double have different precision if you really want to calculate for precision you use double so if we use a floating point representation of pi we're going to get this cut to about over here so actually let's take this code and see how it works we're copying this and we're placing it inside the uh, live demo over here so what will we see when we run this code is that the floating point value will be cut off to about the middle so here we go the floating point representation of pi gets this value whereas the double representation of pi gets this value so well, what's what's the deal here well the deal is that 
Float has less memory, hence it can represent lower accuracies. So you notice the seven digits over here. So yeah, seven digits after the decimal point, although I wouldn't count on those always being seven digits after the decimal point uh, accurate, especially for large numbers. So the takeaway here is not so much to remember how many digits uh, float or double are accurate to, the takeaway here is that if you need to do more accurate calculations, quick calculations, but more accurate, you use double. If you want to make really quick calculations, you use float. Now, float is typically used for stuff like computer graphics because it doesn't really matter if one pixel is one, if, if a color is one pixel to the left or to the right. Uh, it, it's, it's acceptable in favor of uh, doubling the frame rate of, for example, a game. So usually computer graphics use floating point numbers to calculate positions, in, let's say, in a 3D game. If you have a, a game with 3D graphics, those graphics are probably running on floating points because uh, the resolutions of monitors aren't that large for floating point calculation errors to affect them. However, if you're doing more important calculations, for example, you're calculating, um, you're, you're doing a physics simulation and you're calculating forces acting on an object, then you probably are going to be using double. Okay, so uh, again, note this suffix which we have on this floating point number. If this isn't an F at the end, if we remove this F, this literal will be treated like a double literal and since double is a larger data type than float it can't directly be entered into a float because there will be precision loss. The same way we can't directly uh, write a long number into an integer number because the integer num the long number may be larger than the largest possible integer number. Same here however it's not about being the, the larger number it's more about the precision of the digits inside the number. So if you want to create a literal for a floating point number, you just press, press, uh, place F at the end of that literal. Okay, so continuing on from here, we have a task. We have a task that gets British pounds and has to convert them to US dollars formatted to the third decimal point. So if we have one British pound, that's uh, $1.31. Actually, that's the conversion rate we're using and we want to print it as we want to print it as 1.310 dollars. Okay, so we have here 80 pounds and we need to print them as 104.800 dollars. And in this case we'd be using floating point numbers. Although, uh, if you're really going on for accuracy and you're working somewhere where uh, financial operation, operations are done, you would typically use another approach and let's actually use the other approach but we're, we'll play around with it a bit. So we have 80 pounds and we have to convert them into dollars what, uh, or we have some amount of pounds and we have to convert them into dollars. What do we typically do uh, if we're doing finance, financial operations is we don't use the, the dollars direct uh, or pounds or dollars does, doesn't really matter. We're not using the uh, the, the dollar type directly, most financial softwares use cents, meaning most financial software uses the, the smallest uh, possible uh, denomination of a currency. So the, the thing that can't be divided into smaller things. So a dollar can be uh, div subdivided into cents. A uh, pound can be subdivided into pence. So that's what you would be using if you want to calculate, uh, for example, exchange rates from pounds to dollars or stuff like that. But since we're playing around with double and float, let's just use that. So we have pounds to dollars to calculate and we're going to get 80 or 39 or another number and we have to convert it into dollars. So we're getting pounds. Let's implement this code. We're getting, and since this is a financial operation, and speed is less important than accuracy, let's use double. We will be using a double and we'll call that, those will be our pounds, okay? And where will we get, where will we get that double? Well, let's create a scanner and tell that scanner to read from system.in. C, 
save it into a variable and use that scanner to read however we don't want to read an integer for our bounds we want to read what we want to read a double next double okay because we're reading from the console and we want we want parsing from the console to take in any um, decimal points which the number may or may not contain okay so we have the pounds and let's get the dollars from that dollars equals pounds multiplied by 1.31 so that's our calculation to get dollars from the pounds that's our exchange rate and now we have to print it format it up to the third decimal point so we have to print with three digits after the decimal point so how do we do that we've done that before so let's say system.out.print and we're going to print not a line but a formatted string and that formatted string will contain a single floating point number followed by a new line so that it's easier to distinguish from the debug messages okay and we'll be printing the dollars over here and what did we say we want the dollars to be formatted up to the third decimal point so we're plot printing a floating point number and we want how many decimal points we want three so we say decimal points three okay let's see what happens if our program seems to be working correctly now starting this i will input 80 and i'll see 104.800 that seems correct now it's best for me to calculate the other possible um, inputs and see if my calculations are correct but since this is a lecture we won't be playing around with that too much so the solution which we're offered here in the slides is pretty much the same which we already did we read the double number from the console multiply it by 1.31 and print it as a result now again if you're doing actual financial operations and actual uh, software which will be working with clients this isn't exactly a good idea what you would be doing in reality would be you would be reading the pounds as let's say a double from the console but you would be multiplying them by 100 and be getting an integer pence was that the multiple of penny anyway let's say let's say that it is even if we're wrong okay now yeah, th this would actually not be an input of double on the console. This would be an input of integer, and I'm, I wouldn't be multiplying it by 100. I would just be reading the pens from the console, the number of pennies read from the console. I think you can, we can use pennies in multiple uh, like this, or maybe we can't, but it doesn't really matter. So I've uh, studied it like pens before, or, or at least I think I've studied it, studied it like that before. So we're getting an integer from the console, and that would be the, the, the pens we are getting for our pound. So we're, we wouldn't be reading a double number from the console, we would be reading an integer. And then those pens would be converted into uh, cents by multiplying these pens by not 1.31 by, but by 131. And only then would we be probably dividing these cents by 100.0 because this would uh, this would be an integer too. And then we'd be dividing by 100.0 so we can get the double number to display. Now, this would be if you're actually doing some financial calculations, or that, that's one option. Another option is to use the big decimal class, which we will see in a few slides. So we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so another thing you need to keep in mind about floating point numbers is that they can be represented by literals such as these. So this literal is actually pretty close to how floating point numbers are represented in memory and it means the number over here is 1 multiplied by 10 to the power of plus 34 so 1e 1e e, e plus 34 is actually equal to 1 multiplied by 10 with 34 zeros so uh, let's use something easier to write out if you see 1e e plus 3 that's 1000. Why? Well, because that's 1 multiplied by 10 with 3 zero, multiplied by 10 to the power of 3, which is 10, which is 1000. So uh, 10 multiplied by 10 is 100 and multiplied by 10 again 
is 1000, 10 to the third power. So this is what this notation means. And if you see this notation, 20, it's the same notation, but it's a different example, 20e minus 3, that's the same as saying 20 multiplied by 10 to the minus third power. Now, if you have a negative power, what does that mean? Well, a negative power simply means that you have to divide instead of multiply. So it's what you get is 20 divided by 1000 because 10 to the power of 3 is 1000 and the negative uh, power just means division instead of multiplication. So that's, what is that? That's 0 0.02 as a value. Now, these values exist and they can be parsed from the console. So if you create a very large number and print it on the console, Java's default behavior would be to print it like such a value. And that's why we're showing you this notation so you don't uh, get confused when you get a very small or very, very large value represented like this. And you can use it as a literal in your code. And you can even uh, read it from the console. So uh, scanner.next double can read stuff like uh, 20e minus 3, and that would give you uh, 0 0.02. Actually, let's try that. Let's see if it, if it works. So let's say we just have to get a number from the console and print it back on the console. So print line um, number. And this number will be a double number, which we get from the scanner dot give me the next double. And if I start this, I should be able to enter 20e minus 3, or let's say 30e minus, let's say 42e minus 3, 42e minus 3, and that should give us what? That should give us 0 0.42 or something like that. Let's see, 0 0.042, sorry. So 42e minus 3 means 42 divided by 1000, which gives us what? Well, it gives us 0 0.042. Okay, so the reason we're showing you these uh, representations of floating point numbers is both for convenience, because sometimes you want to represent a very large number as a literal, and you can use literals like this, or sometimes you will have input like these literals, and you can read it directly from the console. You don't need to do anything spe uh, special to uh, handle numbers such as these entered on the console. Now, something we already mentioned in a few slides back when we were uh, talking about um, converting integers to floating point values is that floating point division isn't the same as integer division. If you divide integers by integers, you get integers and you lose the floating points. But if you divide an integer by a floating point number, you get a floating point number. So 10 divided by 4 and 4 as a floating point number will give you 2.5 because 2.5 multiplied by 4 will give you 10. So floating point division calculates, I'd say accurately, but it's not always completely accurately, but its concept is to calculate accurately, but due to being limited by uh, a fixed amount of memory, it can't always represent every number um, that's representable as a floating point, but it attempts to calculate without losing precision. So whenever you need to divide something into equal parts, you can get, uh, you, you can do that with floating point division. Okay, now there are other things which don't match floating point uh, division with integral division, integer division, and those are the following. If you have a number, if you have an integer number, let's say we have an integer number number, and we have an integer number divider. Now, if this number is, say, 42, but the divider is 0, and we try to print the number divided by the divider, what we'll get on the console is an exception. Java will crash and will get uh, an arithmetic divide by 0 exception. So you can't divide integers if one of the if the divider is zero so you can't divide by zero for integers however if these are floating point numbers if this is double and this is double 
for at least if one of those is double, since a, an arithmetic operation involving a double will always result in a double. So if you divide a double by zero, you will get a special value called infinity. And here we got exactly that. A special meaning if you divide by a positive value by zero, you will receive infinity. And if you divide a negative value by zero, you will receive minus infinity. And if you divide zero by zero, you will, call, you will get another special value called not a number, n-a-n. That's for floating point division only. And if you ever have a number with one of these values, whatever you do with it, it will remain its own value. The only exception being that if you divide infinity by infinity, you, you will get not a number. But if you multiply not a number by anything, it will remain not a number. And if you multiply infinity by anything, it will remain not a number. The only case in which one of these special values changes is when you um, divide infin an infinity by another infinity and then you get not a number. So those are special values for floating point numbers and you shouldn't be uh, very surprised by them. They are, they are um, a standard concept in the way computers handle floating point numbers. And the reason all of this is possible is that uh, the, is that reading uh, is that using floating point numbers and the, the, were people who are actually scientists. So when floating point numbers were created, they were created for physics simula simulation, for example, calculating the position of a planet. In those cases, you don't need centimeter accuracy when you're calculating where a planet is in the solar system. You just need to calculate approximately where that planet is located and how fast it's moving and so on. And in calculations like that, physics calculations, infinities and not numbers and exponential notation are standard practice. Hence, floating point numbers are optimized for those types of uh, calculations. So whenever you're, you're going for fast calculations which need to be semi-accurate, you're using floating point numbers. Okay, and you need to just keep in mind these special cases. Okay, now there are things which floating point numbers uh, do a bit unusually. So again, these are numbers which are... Uh, they are made for not complete accuracy. So let's have an example over here with something interesting. Let's say we have um, a double number A and a double number B. Those are the high precision floating point numbers, not the floats. So A will be 0 0.1 and B will be 0 0.2. And we can even read them from the console if you like. Okay, so let's calculate their sum. And say that sum is a plus b. Now, if we now write if sum equals 0 0.3 and print on the console the result of this sum and say um, yes, for example. Okay, so yes meaning that this um, comparison was correct. And otherwise, if we add an else which says yes but actually no what would you guess would happen in this case if we start this code let's see we'll start this code and we'll see what get printed what gets printed on the console surprise we got yes but actually no but how did we get that 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 should be 0 0.3 meaning that since it's 0 0.3 we should get into this conditional statement and print a yes. Well, yes, but actually no, because in normal math, yes, in, in human math, yes, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 is 0 0.3. However, if we place a breakpoint over here, since floating point numbers represent exponential sums, and since they are, um, they are limited in accuracy, meaning that they have a fixed number of bytes they can use to represent data, what happens is not all numbers have a correct representation in that uh, way we're saving the data type into memory. So for this sum uh, of 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, what we get is not 0 0.3, but 0 0.3 and a lot of zeros followed by the digit 4. 
Why? Well, because floating point math isn't completely accurate. There are subtle, subtle errors here and there, which typically average out if you're doing large calculations. But that means that you can never uh, compare two floating point values directly, two floating point values that have been uh, enter that have been a product uh, that, that are a product of a calculation. I would have said that uh, that have been entered from the console, but you actually can't compare floating point values if they have been just entered from somewhere. You just can't rely on a calculation of floating point numbers to give you an exact result. So what's usually done in this case, if you want to check against some floating point value, what you usually usually do is use math.apps and you subtract um, from sum this 0 0.3 value. So um, you subtract from what you uh, what you have or actually you, you would subtract from the absolute value of what you have, the value with which you're comparing, and then see if that's larger than zero, or and not zero, but larger than, for example, 0 0.1, or 0 0.01, or 0 0.0001. This way, what you're doing is you're calculating, and yeah, actually, uh, the initial uh, way I wrote it was correct, Let's say your calcul your what you want is to check if the distance from sum to 0 0.3 is less than 0 0.001, for example. What I'm doing here is I'm not comparing directly sum with 0 0.3, but I'm reducing sum by 0 0.3, and if sum is very close to 0 0.3, then the absolute value of this difference should be very small. You know, it, it's like comparing the two, but I'm not comparing them exactly, I'm comparing them within a range of this value. So if you have a programming task which expects you to do something with floating point numbers, it will usually have a so-called epsilon defined, which is the smallest number uh, from which on you, you consider two numbers equal. So if they have a difference of that epsilon which is provided in the task description, then if, if the difference of the two numbers is less than that epsilon, then they are considered equal. So in uh, programming, when you're doing such calculations and searching for equality, usually that equality is checked within some uh, epsilon, uh, some range of possible equalities. Okay, so that's one of the weirdness of floating point numbers. You just have to keep that in mind. Now, most tasks in our lessons will not involve precise calculations with floating point numbers, so you don't need to worry about this too much. But if you're in some larger project, if you're comparing, comparing floating point values, you will probably be comparing them like this. You compare the value you've calculated with the value you want to check against by subtracting one from the other, doesn't really matter in what order, taking the absolute value of that, and then checking if that uh, absolute value is less than, or actually this should have been less than, not larger than, is less than some epsilon, which basically means that the distance from the between these two numbers on the numerical axis is less than this distance over here, and that means that you consider them equal. So in floating point math, nothing is ever exactly equal, it's approximately equal. And here's another example of that with other numbers. There are a lot of numbers which aren't exactly representable in floating point. Okay, so in case you actually need very accurate calculations, but you don't need them to be fast, you can use the big decimal class. Big decimal is a special data type which provides arithmetic operations which are absolutely precise. So this is absolute precision floating point calculations. Uh, how, how high is that precision? Well, it depends on the amount of memory you have on your computer. So this uh, big decimal type isn't a fixed size type like int or float or double. It's a variable size type which can take up more memory as it needs to grow. So when you're doing financial calculations, either you're using cents, meaning the least, uh, the, the smallest denomination of a currency, or you're using big decimal to represent that currency, and you're doing the operation slower. So big decimal works 
pretty much like a normal variable, but you don't initialize it directly by giving it a value. You just need to say big decimal, like you would int, the name of your variable, and then the keyword new, followed by big decimal, and then the value of that big decimal. Or you could do uh, big, big decimal dot value of, and provide an integer from which this needs to be parsed. Or if you've got a string, you just say new big decimal, decimal, and you provide the string over here, for example, 42. Because this could be a very large string which isn't representable in integer or long or anything. Uh, or 42.3, that would also work. So big decimal and provided the string 42.3 and that will parse it into a big decimal. Or if you provided a large string which can't fit into any data type, it will still fit it as long as you have enough memory to, to fit that. Okay, and the operations you do on it are directly on the variable itself. So you don't say number plus, you'd say number dot add and you provide the parameter which is the other big decimal you want to add in. Okay, actually we have a task which involves, involves using big decimal. We have n real numbers and we need to sum them in and they could be a lot of these numbers. So n is a normal integer but the numbers themselves, so here 2 says we have two numbers and this is the first number and this is the second number and we need to add them together. How do we do that? Well, let's see what we can do. So we need to use the scanner to read the next integer from the console. And this would be our number of values. And I'm using n here instead of number of values because that is the business logic of our task. So in the task, it's described as n, which is just n, which equals the numbers which need to be read. Okay, so then I'll use n for my variable name. I can use the variable names described in the task. Because whenever someone then reads the task, they will know exactly what this variable means. And I can also uh, call it number of numbers or something. But n seems sufficient for now. Okay, so now I need to read this many numbers from the console. So I need to do a for loop which starts from zero and continues until it reaches n and does what? Well, I need to sum into a big decimal. So I'd be needing a big decimal number over here, which is our sum. And this I will initialize with a new big decimal. Now it wants a parameter with, uh, the, with the initial value and I'll say that the initial value is just zero. Okay, so I'll initialize my sum with big decimal zero, and then I can say uh, read the next big decimal. Well, how will I read that next big decimal? Well, I'll have it on a separate line, and since I have each of them on a separate line, let's read the string from the console. So let's say line equals scanner dot give me the next line. Or actually, I'd say the next number. Give me the next number from the uh, the next thing from the input. Since reading the next integer will we'll read up to here, and if I say next line, that will just give me an empty line because it's at the end of this symbol, and I would need to somehow move my cursor to the next line. So if I want to read with next line after I've done next int, I should probably do a next line over here, so I can eat up this empty line at the end. So. Whenever you read with next int, it only reads up until the end of the thing you have to be parsed. So if it's an integer, it will read to the end of the integer, but it will not read the new line symbol over here. So it will stay over at this position. And then, and then if you say next line, well, next line ends over here. So that would be an empty string. So instead of playing around with the lines, what I do is I just say scanner.next, that will give me the next string. So if I read the next int, that will read up to here. But next string will search for the next start of a string that isn't a white space. So this is a white space over here, so it will ignore it, and it will start from here. So this will be the next string that it reads. Okay, so this reads me the next string, and I need to convert it into something I can sum into my sum. So what can I sum into my sum? Well, I can say sum.add, 
and I need to provide the big decimal here. Okay, how do I provide the big decimal here? Well, I need to create the big decimal from this line. How do I create the big decimal from this line? I simply say big decimal, and here I can. I think I can provide the string. Let's see. Uh, can I provide a string value? What I did was I came with the cursor over here and I pressed Control P and I saw each of these lines is a different option of initialization for big decimal. And if I look around hard enough, I can see that I can provide a string value. So I can provide my line over here. So this will parse my big decimal into a uh, uh, my line into a big decimal and it will calculate the sum of this big decimal and this line. Now notice that doing the sum like this is the same as saying sum plus new big decimal line if plus were available. Now plus isn't available for big decimal like this for int, but it's the same concept. Now how do I uh, how do I get the actual value from here on out? Well, I need to assign it back into sum because if I, I were using the plus sign, I would be saying sum equals sum plus uh, line if line was a number. I wouldn't be just saying sum plus line, I would be saying sum equals sum plus line. Same situation here. Sum gets replaced by sum compute the sum of this with this value. Okay, so this calculates the sum. And now I can use that uh, value to print it to the console. So I can say system.out.print line and print this sum. And if I start this, I will see that it prints the sum of these big integers which are entered here. Let's use uh, big decimals, I meant, which are entered here. Let's check that. Two two numbers, the numbers are this large thing and the number number 5 and the output seems correct. So we work, uh, our code works for very large values. Let's check with these also, pasting these in. This seems that it matches the value which we have here as an example. <clears throat> and again we should test this program out with different inputs but we won't be wasting time in the lesson here. We will uh, let you guys uh, figure that out on your own at home, test it out, play around with uh, this class. Uh, there's also a big integer class. It's meant for representing big integer, uh, for integer numbers which are larger than long. So if you need to store very large integer numbers, you can use big integer for that. Whereas big decimal, you use if you need to store very large floating point numbers. Okay, so this would calculate the exact sum of a few real numbers over here. Okay, and we have a solution for that which more or less reflects what I wrote. Okay, so another thing which we need to cover is how we can convert between types. So what do I mean by that? You noticed that if I create an integer and I say that this integer should become equal to uh, a long number, for example 5L, I get an error. Why do I get an error? Because long can represent larger values than int. And if I try to save a long inside an int, well, I'd lose accuracy. So I'd lose the actual value if that value is larger than the largest uh, integer value int can represent. Okay, so I can't do this. However, I can use do the reverse. I can create a long number and assign it with an integer. Why? Well, because the integer numbers are, all of the integer numbers can be fit into long because long is a larger type. Same goes for double and float, by the way. So if I create a double number uh, double and assign that to 0.4f, and you, you remember that f means floating point, this works. It's okay because floating point is a smaller type than double and it can fit into double. Okay, but in, if you want to do the reverse, if you want to say integer x equals n, like in this case we have a long number n and you, we want to save that n into x and we know that we can. Like you see that here we have 5. We know that this is a small number. For some reason we've saved it into a long, for example, let's say uh, we've had some large calculations 
uh, and these calculations could have overflown in, but then we've got a lot of subtractions and then that those have caused the number to reduce. And we know they can fit into integer, but, our, but Java doesn't allow us to do that. It gives us a compile error. Why does it give us a compile error? Because Java doesn't know what this value could be. We could have changed that somewhere in our code to something which it can't determine compile time and hence it can't allow us to uh, assign the value directly. <clears throat> so what do we do then? Well, we do the following thing. We cast this value into the type we want. So we say convert this thing into an integer. Now by doing this we sort of uh, give our signature that uh, we're responsible for losing accuracy. If we don't, Java says, look, you're going to lose accuracy here. Are you sure you want to do this? I won't allow you to do this unless you tell me you're sure. And the way we tell Java we are sure is by just saying that this needs to be casted into an integer. And if there's any loss of accuracy, that's our responsibility because we've explicitly requested the conversion into an integer. Now, this over here, the, the assignment of an integer to a long, is called an implicit conversion because it happens implicitly. We don't have to explicitly mention that we want this conversion to happen because the long data type can contain the can contain the int data type, data type. However, since the int data type can't contain the long data type, or at least can't contain any long value, it can contain some of them but not all of them. Uh, we need to explicitly say that look, we know that we're we could lose accuracy here, but it's fine. That's what we want to do. So this is called type casting, converting one type into another by uh, by losing data or sometimes not losing data. So implicit conversions are lossless. For example, if you uh, assign a float to a double, that's lossless, or an int to a long, that's lossless. However, if you have a double and you want to assign that into an integer or, or a long and want to assign that into an integer, well that's explicit conversion. You need to explicitly say yes, I want to use, uh, I want to lose the accuracy of this data type and convert it into another data type. Okay, now in what situations would you be uh, doing that? Well here we have a problem where we, we're converting centuries to minutes, but I'll give you another example. Let's say we have minutes and we need to convert them into hours. Let's say uh, we have the task of someone needs to uh, uh, do a lecture and uh, we're, we know, yeah, let, okay, let's, let's formulate it like this. Um, someone needs to, uh, to conduct a lecture, to conduct a lesson. That lesson uh, is going to be some amount of minutes long and uh, once that um, person starts doing the lecture, they're going to spend some amount of minutes um, conducting the lecture. And then, uh, let's say we want to, um, after they've conducted the lecture and after the students have seen the lecture, we want to provide them with a video which uh, contains the lecture. So that video will have some length in minutes. But students don't really care about lengths and minutes since the lecture is long. They want to know whether that lecture is one hour, two hours, or three hours, or something like that. So let's say our lecture can be anywhere between one and four hours. And we need to get the minutes that that lecture, uh, that, that lesson uh, took, the minutes that that lesson took, and present those minutes as hours. Okay? So uh, what we need to do is convert the minutes into hours and then lose part of the accuracy. So what we need to do is have an integer number of minutes. Okay, so we're having minutes. Let's say we read them, read them from the console. Okay, and now we need to calculate how many hours these are and convert them into an integer number. So we want, we want an integer number of hours which will be displayed to our students. So they can say, okay, so this lecture is three hours or about three hours, not exactly three hours, but about three hours. So that's the amount of time I'm going to need to, to watch it. Okay, so what am I, what will I need to do here? Well, the hours 
we will first initialize as a double. Okay, so how, how do these hours look as minutes? Well, they look as the minutes divided by 60.0. Why dot zero? Because dot zero will convert this into a double number, and hence this division will be a double division, floating point division, which will keep its accuracy. And then I will convert it into the approximate hours the approximate number of hours. How will I do that? Well, I'll first round the number, the hours number. So if I get uh, 3.2 hours, that would give me three, hour, three hours. Whereas if I get 3.9 hours, that should give me four hours. Okay, but math.round, we know that this gives us a round number because that's the function of math.round. It rounds a number. Okay, but we still can't assign it to approx hours. Why can't we assign it? Well, because math.rounds returns a double number. Why does it return a double number? Because it accepts a double number and it's easier to return a double from this since it's already a double. We're just returning another double as a result because we don't know how this is going to be used. So that's what math.round does. It returns a double number. But we're sure that this is an integer number so we can cast it to an integer. We can assign uh, our responsibility here. We can say, look, I know that I may lose accuracy but I've done my math and I know that this value will be okay when converted into an int for my purposes. And then I can print those hours back on the console. And now if I start this program, I will see that if I enter, for example, uh, 125 minutes, 125 minutes, those should be two hours. So if I press enter, I got two hours. So you use explicit typecasting when you know that something can be stored as the smaller type, smaller like in this case int is smaller as uh, uh, int is less precise than double and in that uh, sense it is smaller than double. Uh, so when you know that you can store it without negative side effects for your program and that would depend on what your program is and what it aims to do. Okay, so Here's another example of converting centuries into minutes and there are calculations involved here as well and you can test these out for yourself too. Now the last thing we need to do before we go into the break is discuss quickly the boolean data type which we have. Now we already use the boolean data type but we use it indirectly. What do I mean by indirectly? Well whenever we say for example, let's have two numbers, the number a, which is equal to 5, and the number b, which is equal to 10. Whenever we say if a is less than b, what actually happens is a less than b is calculated and it provides a result. What is the type of this result? Well, if you extract a variable from this result, you will get a Boolean variable, and that Boolean variable contains the result of whether a is less than b. So this is a less than b. B, and the type of that boolean variable is boolean. So this is a result that can either be true or false and the data type for a result that can either be true or false is boolean. So this can contain any sort of comparison. Anything you do with the comparison operators, this will be able to contain its result. Now the boolean data type also can be printed directly onto the console and it prints out true or false depending on its value. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the Boolean data type. That's how it looks like. Uh, the um, one important thing about it is that if you have a Boolean variable, even though it can be stored in exactly one bit, one bit, either a one or a zero, it is actually stored in an entire byte. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros and one after them. So these are 8 bits and this would mean true, whereas false would look like this, 4 zeros and another 4 zeros. A single byte with only zeros is false. Now why is that? Well the reason for that, the reason for using an entire byte instead of a single bit is that the smallest addressable part of the computer's RAM memory is a byte and variables can only represent and at least a single byte. Variables actually represent addresses in memory and the smallest addressable thing in memory is a byte. Hence, 
the smallest thing you can use is a byte. So a Boolean variable is actually an entire byte, even though it needs a single bit. And there are ways to, um, for example, have eight Boolean variables in a single byte, but that's done through some uh, hacks with uh, bitwise operations, which aren't really uh, the subject of this lesson, but we will see them in other places. So keep that in mind. Each Boolean isn't a single bit, it's a, it is a single byte. So if you have 10 Booleans, that's a, that's 80 bits, not 8. Uh, if you have 10 Booleans, that's uh, 100... Whoa. How does it look like? Yeah, 80 bits instead of 10 bits. So 10 booleans, it, they could be represented in 10 bits, but they aren't because computer memory doesn't work that way. Okay, so we have a task over here. We have special numbers, and a number is special when the sum of its digits is 5, 7, or 11. And now our task is what? Well, we need to iterate all the numbers from 1 to n and print whether a number is special or it isn't. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to separate a number into its digits and uh, calculate whether uh, that sum is either 5 or 7 or 11 and then uh, print that out for the number. And notice how we have true or, false, true or false printed over here. Now, how would we do that? Well, we do a for loop. So what is our input? Our input is to which number we need to go. So let's say we're reading a number n in n equals scanner dot give me the next integer and then we're starting for loop from 0 to that n and how do we find the sum of the numbers of uh, uh, the sum of the digits of this number well we've actually done that in a previous lesson we've separated the number into its digits how were we uh, how are we supposed to do that oh and by the way we're not starting from 0 we're starting from 1 uh, how are we, and we're going up to n inclusive, not to n exclusive. And how are we doing that? Well, we're just, we need to get the number, and the number is i. And actually, I'll rename this to number, because it will be easier to read that way. And I'll do what? Well, I'll start, start a while loop, and I'll say, okay, so while that number is larger than zero, I will say uh, int digit equals that number, give me the remainder of that number divided by 10, which gives me the last digit of the number, and then I'll say the number just becomes uh, the number becomes itself divided by 10. Number becomes itself divided by 10. And now in, in order for me not to play around with the control variable of this loop, because that would move around this index which I have, I would change it back to i, to this integer which I'm floating around, and I'll, then I'll just say int number is equal to i. So I'm creating a number that I initialize with the current number I'm looking at, and then I play around with this number to get each of its digits. Okay, and my task is to determine whether the sum of, it, of the digits of this number is uh, 5, 7, or 11. Okay, so these digits I'm getting here, I need to add into a sum. Okay, so this sum begins from zero, and each time I get a digit, I add that digit into the sum. So, for each number, I will run this for loop, and then I'll have the sum of its digits over here. And now what can I do? Well, I can detect whether this sum is, is uh, 5 or 7 or 11. How do I detect that? Well, I just say... Um, I can do, I can write if statements and then create boolean variables for them, but I can also create boolean variables directly. So is the vis, is uh, 5 will be equal to if the sum is equal to 5. And is 7 will be equal to is the sum equal to 7. And is 11 will be equal to is the sum equal to 11. So uh, this should be sum is 5 and sum is 7 and sum is 11 and what I print is if is 5 or it is 7 or it is 11 in each of these cases I do what? Well, I just say system.out.print true 
But if I'm going to be printing true or false, why not just use the value of this boolean, which I get over here, because this is a boolean value. This is uh, the boolean value, which says is special. Is it a special number? Well, it's a special number if its sum is either 5 or 7 or 11. This is what I'm saying over here. And then I can directly print it on the console. System.out.println is special. So that's how I use Boolean variables. I just uh, combine them with OR or AND expressions. And I can use them and I can initialize them by doing comparison operators, placing comparison operators between values uh, in my program. Okay, so that's one way to solve this task. And you can test around if this thing works correctly. We may have made a mistake, but I'll leave solving this task up to you. And here is a solution which solves our problem the way of uh, the way pretty much similar to what I showed you just now. Uh, if you need help, you can look at this solution, but test it around and play around with it uh, and see what see what you can get as a result. Now, the character data type is something that represents, as you might guess, characters in, uh, in computing. So, how does it do that? All of the data we've seen up until this point has been of integers. So we've seen integers, uh, uh, not exactly integers, but numbers. So we've seen numbers in, uh, in integer form, we've seen numbers in floating point form, we've seen um, We've seen calculations with them, we've seen comparisons with them, but we haven't really seen symbols on the console. So the character data type in Java and in other languages too uh, is declared by the char keyword or char keyword or however you would like to read that. Let's read that as char because it seems more intuitive. So this char keyword creates a character data type. This is the character data type. And that character data type is actually also a number. So the way uh, text works in computers, just like I told you earlier, um, when you have values in computers, there are always ones and zeros. There's no such thing as characters in computers, but there's also no such thing as integers or floating point numbers. So what actually happens is we treat the ones and zeros in a certain part of memory in a certain way. So the way we treat character data types is the following way. A character is just a numeric representation, which is then pulled from a table of character descriptions, so of character images. So whenever you render a character on the console, for example, you print someone's name, the characters in that name are actually just numbers which are drawn by using the images from some table which says at, for index, uh, for symbol 65, you should print the capital letter A in English. And for symbol um, 98, you should print the lowercase letter B in English. So characters are just numbers. Each character represents a, it, it represents a symbol through an integer code. So there's a table of symbols, and that table of symbols has symbols matched by integers uh, by integer codes and whenever you have a character that's actually that integer code and whenever you display that character it just renders as that integer code so the default value for a character is slash zero slash zero, zero you might notice that these are two symbols at least as a literal but actually this is one symbol because the slash is a special symbol that uh, encodes the next symbol after it will talk about this in a moment. Okay, and it also takes 16 bits of memory, meaning that it is equal to the short data type in size. And the values it represents are from this thing to this thing, which is just a special way of describing the Unicode code table. So the character data type represents Unicode characters, and these Unicode characters basically allow you to represent any alphabet from any nation around the world. So anything, any symbol you can think of can be represented through Unicode. Okay, so uh, what does this mean over here? Well, this is just a hexadecimal representation of the integer code 
of a Unicode symbol. So this is Unicode symbol zero, which equals this zero default value. And this is Unicode symbol 65,535, because that's the largest number you can fit into a 16-bit integer. Okay, so how do characters look on uh, in Java? Well, let's create some characters and see how they behave. So if I create a character data type, I can assign it, let's say this is the letter okay, variable, I can assign it with this special literal. The character literal is a single quoted, single symbol value. So I can write, for example, a symbol here like star, or I can uh, enter the capital letter A. And if I print this thing on the console, system built out, dot print line, if I print this letter on the console, the console will contain the letter A. Let's see that. Okay, so our console now contains the letter A. Okay, what can we do else with this uh, symbol? Well, I can force it into an integer. So instead of printing it as a letter, I can say, okay, I don't want this letter as a letter. I want this letter as an integer. You remember this, we, talk, we talked about this uh, a few minutes ago, and it's called typecasting. So we're typecasting this letter into an integer, meaning that this letter will now be treated as an integer number. If, and if I start this, you will see that the console will contain A on the first line and 65 on the second line. Why does it contain 65? Why is A represented as 65 and not as something else? Well, if you go Google the ASCII character table, or the Unicode character table for that matter, because ASCII is just a subset of the Unicode character table, you will see that symbol 65 is capital A, and symbol 66 is capital B, and so on. So characters are just integers which, when rendered actually shorts, but you get the idea, they're integer numbers, integer code points, which, when rendered on the console, are displayed with a special symbol, depending on what symbol represents them in the Unicode table. However, they, they act the same as any normal integer. What does that mean? Well, that means that if you want to print all the letters, all the capital English letters, guess what you can do? Well, since this is just a number, you can start a for loop starting not from, not from integer i equals zero, but from character i equals, and not zero, but the first letter in the English alphabet, capital A. And then continue on until the last uh, character in the English alphabet, capital Z, but we need to continue inclusively because A and Z are just numbers. We write them as symbols, but whenever I write A like this, the computer actually understands 65. And whenever I write Z like this, it understands 65 plus the difference between A and, A and Z, the number of English letters. Okay, so let's see what this does. System dot out dot print. Let's print them on the same line. Dot print i. Because i is a character now, it will be printed as a character. And now if I start this code, I will see the alphabet printed on my console. And here's the alphabet. That's because characters are just numbers, which are treated as characters when they're printed on the console, but are treated as numbers otherwise. Okay, what else can I do with characters? Well, there are special functions which I can call on characters, which uh, make them behave in different ways. For example, I can say character dot to lowercase and supply this character i over here. So this converts this character i into the lower class uh, lowercase i. So if I start this code like right now, what I'd see is the lowercase letters. Of course, I could have done that by just using A and Z lowercase letters over here, but I wanted to demonstrate the two lowercase function. Now, if you call two lowercase over something that isn't a character, for example, the symbol 5, nothing will happen. You just receive the same character. Okay, and there are other things you can do. For example, you can say uh, if I, if character dot is digit, i then do something this will check if this character is one of the digits either zero with the, like a character the character zero or if it's the character one or if it's the character two or the character three or the character four and so on and so forth okay so this is a way to check if a character and there's also is 
alphabetic, which checks if a character is uh, an alphabetic symbol, which checks for any alphabet, meaning that this will check for, for example, Cyrillic, uh, whether a character is uh, alphabetic. Okay, so this works for everything, and th th this is basically the character type. It's pretty. It's a pretty simple, simple numerical type, but that numerical type can be treated both as a character and as a number. You can do arithmet arithmetic on it, you can increase it, you can calculate sums for it, and so on. Okay, so let's um, solve a task. Now, there is a simple task over here where we have three lines of characters and we need to print them and reverse. This is a pretty simple task. We just need to read a separate line. Okay. Well, it's not completely simple. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. So, we need the character A and the character B and the character C, the three characters we're, we're, be going, we're going to be reading. Okay, and we need to print them in reverse order on the same line with the space between them. So, what I need to do is system.out.print and I need to print what? I need to print the first character, then the second character, then the third character. Okay, well, how do I do that? Well, one easy way to do it, I could use a formatted string, but one easier way to do it is just say print the character C and then print a space like this. And then print the character B and then print a space after that. And then print the character A and then print a space after that. That's the simplest way to do it. Now, I have compilation errors here. But I have them because I haven't initialized character A or character B or character C. Okay, so let's read character A from the scanner. What do I? What can I get here? I can do. I can't do next char, and I can do simply next, which would read a string, or I can do next line because they've told me that these are each on separate lines. Okay, so I do next line, but that returns a string, not a character. Well, as we'll see in a few moments, a string is just a sequence of characters, and I can tell a string, please give me the character at position 0, or at position 1, or at position 2. So, the character at position 0 is the first character in a string, so I read an entire line. That entire line is a string, which contains only one symbol, and I just say, give me the 0 position of that uh, string. String start at position 0. Okay, and I can do the same thing for character B and character C. I read a single line and then I take the first character from that line. And I can do the printing over here and if we start this code we will see that these um, characters are printed in reverse order. But that's not really that much of an interesting task. So let's do another task and that task will um, have applications in other places too. So, what is the other task I, I want us to solve? The task is the following. I have a character entered from the console as a single line. That character will either be uh, a letter or it won't be a letter. My task is to output uh, which letter in the alphabet that character is. It could be a lowercase or uppercase letter, I don't know which. It could be a lowercase or, or uppercase letter, or it could be something different than a letter. And if it's different than a letter, I just I should just print uh, not a letter. Okay, so let's handle that case. I read the character already, and let's check if it's a letter. How do I check that? Well, I use the character dot is alphabetic method, and then I supply that character to that uh, is alphabetic method. So. If that character is alphabetic, I'd be doing something. I'd be doing the calculation of which uh, symbol in the alphabet it is. Okay? Otherwise, I'd be doing what? Well, I'd be printing system.out.println not a letter. Okay, so I have part of the task solved already. That's great. But how do I get the number of this letter in the alphabet. Let's say that um, if I want the character, if they provide me with the character, let's name this letter, let's name this just uh, letter, oops, yeah, let's name this letter uh, and this rename the string, it sometimes renames the strings uh, when you have, uh, when you try to rename a letter, 
it depends on what you pick when it asks you whether you want to remain or replace only cult occurrences or not. Anyway, so we read or read a letter from the console and I'm asking is this alphabetic? And if it is alphabetic, I want to uh, print which uh, which is its number in the alphabet. And let's say that, um, for simplicity, the character A will be the value 0 and the character B will be the value of 1 and so on. Programmers count from 0. We will learn why when we get to the lesson about arrays. But let's say for now the programmer just counted 0 and that's why the, the letter A from the English alphabet we will treat as the 0 number letter. So the letter at position 0. Okay, so whether they uh, enter B capital or B lowercase or C capital or C lowercase or A capital or A lowercase, I would still want to find out which letter this is in the alphabet, starting from zero, where, where A is zero. How do I do that? Well, I already know that the letter is alphabetic. Okay, so how do I find which is its position in the alphabet according to these rules? Well. Since it could both be a capital case or a lower case, one thing I can do is just convert it into one of the cases. So I don't need to worry uh, for the two different situations. So I'd say uh, letter is now changed to character dot to lowercase, converted to a lowercase representation, this letter. If it already was lowercase, fine, nothing will happen. And if it wasn't lowercase, it will be changed to lowercase. So I'm only dealing with this case from here on out. Okay, so what do I do here? Well, what I know is that each character has a number, right? And if I check the character, the number for A, it will be 97. In the uh, Unicode uh, table, A is the symbol 97. And B is the symbol 98. And C is the symbol 99. You see a pattern here? So A is the symbol 97. And B is the symbol 19, so they're, they're sequential. And they're just numbers. Well, if I need to print 0 for A, then I just need to subtract A from A, because 97 minus 97 equals 0. And that gives me that 0 I need for A, because 97 is the code for A. And if I subtract 98 minus 97, that would give me 1. So if I subtract B, minus a, so if I, if I do b minus a, which is 98 min minus 97, that would give me 1. And 1 is the value for, uh, for b, like I want in this task. And same thing goes for c. If I subtract the code for c, if I subtract from it the code for a, I get 2, right? So that gives us the number 2 for position 2 in the alphabet. So that's all I need to do. I need to say uh, int position equals subtract from the current letter what? Well, the first letter in the alphabet. Uh, subtract, not assign. So the position is the, the letter's position currently minus the first letter in the alphabet. And I'm lo using lowercase a because I've converted this letter to lowercase. Okay, so let's print this out on the console now. System.out.println position. Let's print this position, position and see what we get. Let's see if my code is correct, if I correctly print um, positions in the alphabet. Okay, so printing for A. A is position 0. Great, that's what I wanted. Okay, let's do that for lowercase c. Lowercase c is second position in my alphabet. Is this what I wanted? Yes, that's exactly what I wanted. Okay, so this is a way of doing arithmetic with characters. Now, homework assignment. It's not really a homework assignment, but something I suggest you try to implement. Two characters will be entered on the console. Uh, these characters will be entered one after another, directly one after another. So you will get... You know what? It's, it's not... Um, two characters, you will get a number, you will get a number n, so you will get uh, an integer number uh, n, let's say 3, and then you will get three characters entered on the console, like, for example, like so. And your task is to calculate the sum of all the digits in those, in those letters. So this would be 8. 
How would we do that? Well, we'd read the number three, then we'd read a string with next line. So we do just next line. Then we'd start a for loop starting from i equals zero because the string started zero until i reaches less than three. And then we'll take charret i. And that's our letter. Okay, and now for the letter, what do you need to do? Well, you need to check uh, uh, for the symbol. It's actually better to call it a symbol. And then for the symbol, you check, is it a digit? And if it is a digit, you need to convert it into a number because the digit 3 isn't the number 3. It's uh, some value in the ASCII table. But you can convert it into a number the same way we converted the position in the alphabet to a number because the the digits in the ASCII code table are ordered in the same way. So you won't be subtracting A, you would be subtracting the code of 0. Okay? So you get the number, the numeric value of this digit by subtracting 0 from the character, and then you add it to the sum. That's basically that, uh, that task. Do that, implement that. It's good practice for um, for processing text and processing digits from text. Okay, so let's continue on. We solved this task and there's a solution we can check. Now another thing we need to uh, know about characters is that since there are special characters in code, we need to have ways of escaping them. For example, we can't create a letter directly in our code. We can't have a literal for the new line in our code. So we can't say letter equals uh, equals these apostrophes and between them we can't press enter like this. Because this is a new line but the code doesn't support that. It can be a space, that's fine, but it can support an, an actual new line. It also can support the tab symbol. It can only support uh, the space and normal symbols. Okay, so how do we create literals for, for example, new line? Or for stuff like, how do we create the letter, apostro uh, the symbol apostrophe? So let's call this a symbol. We can't just place three apostrophes here because apostrophe simply means uh, a character begins here. So how do you render an apostrophe inside uh, a character? How do you write the literal for an apostrophe. Well, for such, for such special cases, we have the so-called escaping of characters, or this is a way of saying that the following symbol will not be a part of the code, like char is a part of the code and symbol is a part of the code, and this apostrophe is a part of the code. Inside these apostrophes, slash followed by a symbol means render that symbol. So this is not a part of the code because if I just enter a single apostrophe, well, it treats it as a part of the code and it gets confused. Okay, as, as part of the Java code, I mean. And it gets confused because it doesn't know what I'm telling it. But now I'm telling it, okay, listen here, I want you to add this symbol as a symbol. I'm not typing in code over here, I'm typing in the actual symbol. And there are such escaping symbols for a lot of things. For example, new line is escaped like this. If you want to have a character that represents the new line symbol, you write backslash n. And if you have, if you want a character rep which represents the tab symbol, you write backslash t. That means the tab symbol. And if you want a character which is the default value of a character, which is the so-called no terminator, which is the, this thing is equal to just uh, the value of zero casted to a char. So this and this are completely equal. They're the, the, the same thing. So the character code zero and this way of representing the character code zero are the same. So there's escaping for this. And guess how you uh, add a backslash into a symbol? Because now you know that backslash means something special. Well, how do you escape a backslash? With a backslash. So double backslash means single backslash. If you're saving, it, if you're uh, writing a character literal in your code, this only uh, applies to your code. If you're reading from the console, characters are just characters. But since in code, 
apostrophes mean something and quotes mean something and uh, slashes mean something, there's escaping for them in your code, only in your code. So that's what escaping is. So if you want to uh, enter an apostrophe, you do it like this. If you want to enter a quote, if it's for a character, you can do it like this. But if it's for a string, you need to do it with a backslash. Or you can do it always with a backslash if you're if you're unsure. Backslash and quotes just means quotes. And quotes work inside uh, character quotes, inside apostrophes like this. But if you if you have a string, well, the the rules change and then since strings if you have a string uh, message which equals hello well a string is surrounded by quotes hence you can't add a quote over here because it confuses the code and it doesn't understand it thinks that the strings end here the string ends here and then you have some other code after that and, and in order for it not to treat this as the closing quote for a string you just write a backslash in front of it and that would print the text H E L and then quotes and then L O. Okay, so let's print this system.out.print print print line, print the message and print this symbol and let's make the symbol be a backslash. And to make it be a backslash we need to write double backslash and start this code. We will see what I uh, described earlier, we will see the HEL apostrophe L, um, HEL quote LO, and then the backslash. If you don't do the escaping, you get compile time error, compilation errors, because here it sees, okay, this is a closing quote, and it thinks that the message is hell, and after that there's some low variable which we've added. And for the symbol, it thinks that this apostrophe isn't the closing apostrophe. Why? Well, because uh, because it sees a backslash over here, and the backslash means the, sec the next symbol isn't a part of the code. Hence, it's missing something here. So, if we want just a backslash, we have to write two backslashes. Okay, and here, if we want a quote, we need to write a backslash quote. Same goes here for backslashes. If you want to render a backslash inside this hello string, you need a double backslash. So, launching this, we will see h backslash el quote lo. h backslash el quote lo. Now, if this is confusing where you need to add a backslash and where you don't, just play around with it. It, it takes some time getting used to, but it's not very complicated. And there's a list of other escaping uh, symbols. You can also do this backslash u, meaning Unicode, and then the hexadecimal representation, representation of uh, a Unicode code point. And that would allow you to render any character over there. Okay, so uh, the, here are some literals and what they look like when printed on the console. You can play around with these if you want. Uh, here are the tab symbols, here are some uh, traditional Chinese symbols, here are uh, a Unicode, uh, here's a Unicode letter which is just the letter O represented in Unicode and you can play around with these values a bit so you can get used to them. Okay, so the last part we need to talk about are strings. So strings are just sequences of characters. Just like we had this character data type, well, there's a string data type which represents a sequence of characters like this. So the string data type message over here, each of its symbols is actually a character, one character variable for each symbol. It, well, not the, depending on what language you're using, it might not be one character for each symbol, but it will mostly be one character for each symbol. So the string keyword is what it what it creates, and if you don't initialize it, it has a value of no, but this, again, this default value we will meet when we get to the lesson about arrays. So up until this point, you can ignore this no thing, which we've entered here. And you always write string literals in quotes. That's why you have to escape the quote character. We've seen those already, and one thing we can do with them, except represent uh, symbols and read from the console and parse them into numbers, is concatenate them using the plus operator. So you can do, if you have a message, if you have the message hello, 
and then you say uh, print on the console the message plus space plus world this will print on the console hello world because it will attach this space to the end of hello and then it will attach world to the end of this space and this will print hello world on the console okay so if we're uh, printing uh, a file name with a string we need to keep in mind that we need to add the double quote so if we're initializing it inside code so by the way here's the hello world if we're initializing a, a file path inside code like this then we need to escape this is called escaping whoops we got a double uh, we need to escape each slash for example in a windows file path with uh, another slash so, so if you see a backslash you add another backslash in it if, if you want a character literal di directly so if you're writing this inside your code you want to be doing escaping if you're reading it from the console you don't need to be doing anything you can read directly from the console because the console isn't java code whereas this is java code and to order that java code to render a backslash you just need to type two backslashes for it now we've already seen what else there is here for uh, using strings we've already seen the string.format function uh, if we want to in addition to concatenating strings we can use the string.format function to to get the string built from a few different pieces so instead of uh, concatenating these uh, with a space like I did previously like I did over here when I said message plus space plus uh, world instead of printing like that I can create a mess create a string which is string formatted which equals string dot format what do you what do you want me to format well I want you to format two strings one after another with a space between them okay so one string a second string a space between them and here I can supply my message and this world string I want printed. And now if I if I say print this formatted thing on the console, I will get hello and space and world printed out. We've seen this already. Oops, what did I get? I, I didn't get hello. I got the message from uh, this uh, escaped Windows path. But that's still a good example of what happens when you're escaping paths. Uh, these double slashes became single slashes because they're inside my Java code. Okay, so this is how you format these strings, how you can uh, build them as a single entity, or instead of using format, if it's something more simple, like it's in this case, it's just a space separated, uh, space separated strings, you can just add that space separation through concatenation. Okay. So that's one thing you can uh, do with strings. Uh, and here's an example of how you can print the first name and the last name of a person and that into a string. So this formats a string, generates the full name from the first name and the last name, and then prints that into another format in which the string is at the last place. This is just playing around with formatting strings. It's not something very advanced in comparison to what we've already done. And if you uh, want, you can also use the screen, string concatenation, not just on strings, you can use them on strings and numbers. So if I have, for example, uh, an int age, which is 42, and if I have a string name, which is um, the answer, because the answer to the universe and everything is 42, okay? So if I print now name plus space plus age, this will convert 42 into a string and will print it on the console. So strings are pretty <coughs> convenient to work, in, work with on, in Java. We don't need to do anything special. We just concatenate them with pluses and they just work. Okay, so we have a task in which we have two names entered on the console as single lines and we need to combine them with a the separator. Okay, we can do this in a few ways. Let's do that and do it in the easiest way, which would be string first name 
get that from the scanner next line, since we've been told that these are on separate lines. Get that from the next line from the scanner, and then get the last name from the next line of the scanner. And then what do we need to do? We need to get the separator. Well, string, actually they call it a delimiter here, not separator. Okay, so let's call it a delimiter. And get that from the console. Okay, and now how do we print these joint with that delimiter? Well, we just say system.out.print and we concatenate these three strings. So we concatenate first name with the delimiter followed by last name and that would print our string on the console. Let's see it, if it works. So this thing is waiting for me to enter uh, two names, so let's say I'm George Georgiev and it's waiting for the delimiter. Let's say that the delimiter is money because we all like money. Okay, so we got George Georgiev with the delimiter of three dollar signs. And that works because strings can be concatenated easily one after the other. Okay, and we can test around with the other delimiter, but we won't play around with that now. The point of this uh, uh, demonstration of strings was to show how strings uh, function in Java uh, and they're pretty easy to use. We can uh, concatenate them using plus. We can also concatenate them using uh, string dot concat which just accepts the parameter for the string to concatenate with. So this could have been first name dot concat with the limiter dot concat with last name and each of these operations produces a new string so string dot oops string dot uh, concat with this delimiter will produce a new string on which we call concat and add the next name and this we can replace the plus code with this concat code and it would do the same thing now another thing which uh, strings have in them which is useful uh, and which we haven't really covered in this lecture is if we say want to iterate each symbol of a string what we can do is start a for loop starting from zero and continuing onto let's create a string s over here which is hello we can start uh, we can create a for loop which starts from zero and continues up until s dot length gives us the length of this string and on each iteration of this for loop we can do system.out.println of s dot give me the character at that index. Now this accesses each of the characters of the string which is uh, a note back to that task I made up for you to do at home if you're uh, into it of filtering out which symbols in a string are digits and summing them up. Well you'd be doing that with something like this. You'd be iterating the string until you reach its length and reading each of its characters by doing as dot give me the character at that position. So this is a character. This is the current character. And printing that current character on the console in our case would just print H, E, L, L, O, each on a separate line. But if you want to do something more special, you could, for example, like the task I mentioned, do a check like if character dot is, uh, um, is digit, if the current character is digit, then, and guess what, you in that task which I uh, offered you a few moments ago, you would be checking if this is a digit, and then if it is a digit, you would be converting it into a number by uh, subtracting z the character code of zero from it and then adding it into a sum. Okay, so this is how you walk the characters of a string and this is how you can do some operations with that. Now, there's of course a lot more to uh, talk about uh, regarding strings. We will have a separate lecture uh, about uh, a separate lesson about text processing further on, so don't worry about that. This is just an overview of the data type of string and how you can use it. We will, we will see a lot of other ways to use it and uh, modify strings and so on. But for now, we finished up our current lesson. We talked about variables. We talked that they are a way 
to store information which can later be processed by the computer. We thought that there are different data types of variables and there are numeral types which represent integer floating point numbers and so on. Some of them uh, are very specific like the integers whereas floating point numbers aren't very accurate and calculations with them are fast but not uh, completely 100% on the mark. Uh, and if we want something to be 100% on the mark when calculating, we can use stuff like Big Decimal. Uh, we also talked about string and text types. We talked a lot about escaping and how you can convert symbols into, into numbers and back. And we played around with joining up and concatenating strings. And now we know that strings are just sequences of characters, which are Unicode characters, which represent pretty much any language you can think of. So we now know data types and we can uh, use these data types in our programs, understanding how they function. So I hope this was useful for you. And of course, if you have any questions, please ask them in the channels we have provided for you. And well, until next time, bye bye. In this lesson, your instructor George will explain and demonstrate how to work with arrays, reading arrays from the console, processing arrays using the for each loop, printing arrays and simple array algorithms. You will learn how to declare and allocate an array of certain length, two ways to read an array from the console, how to traverse and print array elements from our existing array, and how to access an element by index, and how to modify an element at certain index. Along with the live coding examples, the instructor George will give you some hands-on exercises to gain practical experience with arrays and other mentioned coding concepts. Let's start learning arrays. Hello everyone, this is George, I'm your technical trainer and today we're going to be talking about arrays in this lesson. And this lesson will actually complete our knowledge base for writing complete computer programs. I was going to say Turing complete, but we'll need to explain that in a bit. So. Up until this point, we were writing programs with one very important component missing. And today we will see how we can use that component to our advantage. And we will learn all the power that comes with using arrays. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, arrays is our main subject. We'll talk about what they are, how we can create them, how we can use them, how we can read them from the console and of course, write them to the console, meaning how we can do input and output of arrays from the console. Then we'll talk about stuff like uh, string.split, we'll talk about uh, using a for loop to read the arrays, we'll, we'll talk about printing them with loops, and we'll talk about printing them with uh, standard uh, functions like string.join, and we'll figure all that out. And then we'll talk about the for each loop, which we haven't yet encountered up, to, up until now. We'll see how that works, we'll see what we can do with it, and we'll have some fun with these new with this new concept which will complete our knowledge base for writing uh, fully featured programs now i'm repeating this uh, concept of writing fully featured programs and uh, accessing um, uh, accessing the full potential of programming but what do i what do i actually mean by that well up until this point we were creating programs which had branching so our programs had branching of logic, so we could split our code execution into two parts. And we also had uh, a random number of repetitions of some piece of our code. So we could branch our code and we could repeat our code a number of times that was determined, for example, from the input from the console. However, we're missing a, a pretty important part of all of this so we could in order to write complete computer programs now each computer program each each complete uh, set of instructions and computer uh, supports needs to have branching needs to have repetition of code a number of times which isn't determined compile time meaning that for example you read an, uh, an integer from the console and that determines how many times you repeat some piece of code or other conditions determine it so those are two important things, but there's a third thing. And the third thing is allocating memory. And more precisely, more precisely allocating memory dynamically. The, uh, our current access to memory is always, has always been through variables of primitive data types. And these primitive data types, although they do initialize memory, 
the amount of memory that the program needs is known compile time. We know what number of uh, what methods we have, and these uh, methods have variables in them, and these variables allocate memory. However, we have no option of allocating um, a random amount of memory uh, during our execution of the program. So during, while the program executes, we're basically working with what we've coded into it um, from the start as memory. So however many variables we have created, well, we have that many uh, bytes of memory depending on, of course, uh, the sizes of our variables. So uh, there's a strict correlation between them. But very often, uh, a program will need to increase the memory it uses based on user input or other conditions it encounters. So often you will have, um, you, you will have code that needs to allocate additional memory. And we're missing this part. We, we can't yet do this. So let's learn how to do it. And arrays will, will allow us to do exactly that. Now to illustrate the problem, let's uh, do a, a demo. So let's say we have a task in which we have to read integers from the console. Let's say we have numbers like so. So we have four, five, one, three, seven. And our task is to reverse these numbers and print them in reverse order. Or And even, let's not keep them on the same line. Let's have them on separate lines. We want these numbers on separate separate lines. We want them en entered and let's have an initial number which tells us how many of these numbers there are. So in this case we have five numbers so this will be the number five. And let's make this one 42 so it's uh, a bit easier to see where the numbers start and which is which part of the input is the number of numbers and which are the, the actual numbers. So let's change them to 42, 15, uh, 31 and 7 for example. So these are our numbers and we need to reverse them. So we have an initial count of these numbers and we have the numbers as a sequence and we need to reverse that sequence of numbers. Now how would we do that? Well let's say there are a fixed uh, amount of numbers so um, we have um, like in a previous lesson there was a task where there were three characters entered on the console each on separate lines and then we had to reverse these characters and that was pretty much easy because we already knew the amount of uh, characters on the consoles because we, we already knew there were al always going to be three so three lines of input in our case we don't know that we are told the number of inputs on the first line of the console so but but let's let's say we we want to solve the task for the uh, example of five elements how would we do that well um, if we don't know how to dynamically allocate memory, what we are forced to do is just create the variables which represent uh, the input which we got. So we have something like int number zero, because programmers count from zero, you will see why I uh, count them from zero. And then we'll have int number one, and then we'll have int number two, and then we'll have int number three, and then we'll have int number four. That's all of the numbers, right? Those are five numbers, just like in this case. Five numbers counting from zero, that gives us a minimum index, let's call that an index, of zero and a maximum index of four for five elements. Okay, so what do we do now? Well, we're going to need a scanner. So let's create a new scanner that reads from system.in and we'll initialize that and put it into a variable and that variable we will call scanner and how do we read from that scanner now well i just say number zero equals scanner dot next int and continue on reading like that until i reach the end of my variables and i'm limited by exactly that i'm limited by the amount of my variables now we could play along a bit here and uh, uh, write some conditional statements like uh, if uh, there are only two elements, we can only input these two. And then if there are three elements, we can input these three. And if there are four, four elements, we can input these four and so on. And that would be a, a pretty, that would be pretty ugly code, but it could work if we initialize all of these numbers. So let's, re so let's reverse them after we've read them from the console, let's reverse them. So how would we reverse them? Well, we'd say system.out dot print let's print them on the same line with spaces so system dot out dot print number zero with a space after it 
and then system dot out dot print number one with the space after it then system dot out dot print number two with the space after it and so on for number three and so on for number four okay and again we could do this with ifs so we could we actually need to read our size first in um, size let's let's just call it size the number of numbers or sequence size or something okay so this is scanner dot next int also because we need to read this size variable at the start and then read our numbers and then print them out now of course this code has a problem the problem being that uh, we can't actually work with this size we have we are still allocating all of the variables we need uh, for reversing the data so we have a problem we we, <clears throat> we we have a dynamic amount of memory we need to allocate because it is determined at runtime so it's not a compile time determination of memory which we uh, use during uh, which we determine during writing the code. It's a runtime determination of memory, which comes just like uh, any other uh, condition that can occur during our prog program. In this case, it comes uh, in the form of user input, user input from the console. So we can't know what input the user will uh, add here. So we can't know how many variables to initialize. Now. Uh, in most programming tasks, you would know what the maximum value is. And I guess you could do something like initialize all possible numbers. Let's say the, you know that the maximum value will be 100. What do you do? Well, you keep initializing numbers like this until you reach 100. So you'd have a lot of numbers and then number 100. And then you'd read, uh, you, you'd have an if before each next int reading and whether uh, and based on how many uh, numbers there were entered in the uh, initial input well then you would do uh, conditional checks which uh, you know compare exactly with that uh, amount of numbers so you would do okay so how many um, if, if your size is one you would be reading just this number if your size is two you would be reading this number and then you would be reading this number if your size is three you would be reading the first two and then be reading the third number but won't be reading the fourth number and so on so you you, you get the idea we would uh, have numbers read uh, one after the other and we'd have ifs before reading each number now obviously this is very non-optimal um, even if we could do it and we can't really do it because uh, we don't know how many numbers there are going to be uh, as a max value yeah I, I just said if the max value was 100 okay we could probably write them all but if there were 4 billion or even larger well we can't do that we, we can't do it at least uh, in a reasonable amount of time and coding would be a nightmare if you had to do it like that okay so what do we do in that case well uh, most programming languages give you one uh, one or another method of allocating dynamic memory. So allocating memory, which is not known compile time, but is known runtime. So what do I mean by that? Instead of uh, initializing a fixed number of variables, what we do is initialize an array. Arrays allow us to initialize dynamic amounts of memory. So instead of having number zero, number one, number two, number three, and so on, what we would have is after reading our size, after we know how many elements we need, we would create a so-called array. How are arrays created? Well, arrays contain elements, just like this sequence of variables contains elements. It contains the number zero and number one and number two and number three and so on. Okay, so it arrays contain elements and those elements have some type so uh, if we want if we want to read numbers well we want to uh, create an integer array and how do we create an integer array we begin with saying integer it's pretty much the same as creating any variable however because we don't want a single integer we want a certain amount of integers determined by the input we place brackets over here. So what this tells Java is this isn't a single variable, meaning that it, it's actually it's not a single piece of data, it's multiple pieces of data. So this int array 
can contain multiple pieces of data and we'll call it numbers. So up until this point, it's pretty much the same as initializing a variable, only you need to add these square brackets. Okay, so we have the numbers and then we say these numbers are equal to a new, just like we used new for initializing big decimal and uh, big integer or string and so on. The same way we use new to initialize an array. And now here we say new int because we're having an int array, an integer array. We say new int and what Java wants to know is how many ints. So it sees this is an array and it needs to know how many ints we want to initialize. Okay, so how, them, how many ints do we want to initialize? Well, we want to initialize a size number of ints. So whatever input, uh, whatever the input was stored in size, we need to initialize that number of integers. Okay, so this creates a so-called array and that array contains this amount of elements, meaning that this line of code initializes as many ints as there is size entered here. So if we got six for size, then this will create six integers in memory. If we got two in size, it will create two integers in memory and so on. Okay, and numbers points to that memory. So numbers is the variable which contains the array. So this is the array and we are saving it into this variable. Okay, so how do we use that numbers uh, array? Well, we could do the same like we did here, although it wouldn't be uh, initializing an int variable on each line. It would just be, let's remove these, it would just be numbers and then to access an element of numbers, we just open brackets and then write in the index we want to access. So just like we had number zero, number one, number two, number three, and so on, we can do number zero, number one, number two, number three, number four, and so on. So this accesses the element at that position. So for five elements, this would be the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and the last element. Okay, and if we want to print them, what we can do is, again, access them by their index. So we don't say number, uh, number zero, number one directly, we place these brackets around the index we want to access. So these brackets are your multi-tool for arrays. You, initialize, you, you declare arrays with them, you define their size with them, and you access their elements with these brackets. <clears throat> so this code up until this point is pretty much the equivalent of what we had for the variables. The only difference is that we're using a non-fixed number of elements for initialization. Okay, so now the next cool part is that we don't need to do it like this because this over here is just a variable, right? This, this is a value. This is the integer literal one. Uh, integer, integer literal zero and this is the integer literal one and this is two and this is three and this is four wherever we can place a literal we can place a what we can place a variable correct okay so how can we walk through all of these numbers over here and instead of uh, typing in manually based on the size uh, instead of typing in manually how can we do this automatically well, we're repeating the same piece of code, right? We're repeating the access to the uh, element, the reading from the console. So we're repeating code. This code executes and it should execute this amount of times, a size amount of times, correct? Okay. And the only thing that changes is the index over here. Well, guess what can start from an index and reach another index and repeat a piece of code by supplying it the, its index? Well, that's the for loop or one of the other loops. So what we do is just say, create a for loop starting from zero and continuing up to, now we could use size, but since we've initialized an array already and arrays in Java know their size, we can directly access the size of the array. So we can say numbers and um, from here on out to access something of an object like numbers, the same way we, to access next in from a scanner, we use a dot. Well, in the same way we use numbers dot to access its length because length and size are both members of, uh, in, the, in this case, scanner and in our case, the numbers array. Okay, so length is just the 
amount of items there are in this numbers array. So now we start a for loop and that for loop will start from zero and continue until there are numbers. Okay, until its index reaches the maximum index of numbers, which in this input example over here is four because there are five elements and counting from zero that gives us the maximum index of four. And now instead of writing each of these lines uh, on our own, we can just say numbers at position i assign that to the next integer from the console and this will execute these operations for us. So we will run a for loop and this will execute these assignment operations for us. Okay, so that works. Uh, we just assign uh, values to a numbers array and uh, we can now use the values from this numbers array. And guess what? We can also print the same way. So we read like this and to write, what do we need to do? Well, we need to start another for loop, but we instead of starting it from zero, because we want it to print in reverse, remember, we want them printed in reverse. Okay, so uh, starting instead of from zero, we want to print the items of the numbers array in reverse, meaning we need to start from the last item. Okay, so which is the last item? Well, we already said that for five items, the last item is at index four. So this would be index four, but how would we calculate index four in another way? So for five items, it's index four. So for length items, like we have here, for the number of items, we have length minus one because five minus one is four. So length minus one is the last index in an array. Okay, and uh, what is our check? Well, we need to start from the last number and continue up until the first number. So we're going to be going in reverse, meaning we're not going to be increasing i, we're going to be decreasing it, and we're not going to uh, be checking whether it's smaller than something, we're going to be checking whether it's greater than or equal to something, and that something, that last item we're visiting, is zero, correct? The index zero is the first index in an array, okay? Just like index zero is the first index in a string, by the way, that's why when you say char at zero, it returns the first character in a string, so that's where that, that's where that comes from. Okay, so we got that, uh, and now what, what do we need to do? Well, here's what we were doing previously, and now it's the same code, only that we don't print the element at index 0, we print the element at index i, whatever i is. Okay, so what did we get just now? We're, we have a very small co program in comparison, which can work with any size we enter, regardless of what that size is, as long as we have enough RAM uh, memory to uh, store uh, an array that big. Okay, we have that, and then we just have four, two for loops, which iterate based on the length of that array. So, not only did we solve our problem, we also are able to use the variables, uh, the, the variable size of that dynamic memory, and start for loops based on it. We don't need to repeat code, uh, for each index, we just submit that into a for loop and only change the index we're accessing. So in addition to allowing us dynamic memory allocation, arrays allow us uh, dynamic access to elements. So in this way, we don't have a fixed number of variables we can access. We have a dynamic number of variables determined by the input. Okay, so we have this. Let's see if it works. So... Um, we're printing the numbers. Okay, let's get this input. How can we get it? I'll hold down Alt and I'll mark vertically like this. Okay, copying this and starting the program. Let's see what we what we got here. Okay, so the program is now running. Let's add our input to it. So five items, 42, 15, 1, 31, 7, and we expect them ordered in reverse. And that's what we got. 7, 31, 1, 15, 42, the five items. We don't have a new line at the end, but that's not a big deal. We can always add it over here. We can always add it at this part uh, of the code. Okay, so this thing worked. Great. Let's uh, let's see from what we can do with arrays from here on out. So this is what an array is. An array is just a normal variable which stores multiple data points, multiple parts of information. You can think of it like storing multiple variables inside a single variable and having the option to access them programmatically, meaning that you don't need to 
know their names. Their names are just form formed by the name of the array plus the index at which the, that element is located. And other than that, the, X, the reading and writing of these elements is the same as using any normal variables. Uh, if the variable was called numbers i or numbers 1 or whatever, it would be accessed and uh, write, written to the console, read from the console in the same way that uh, any other variable can be. So each of the variables here, here inside the numbers array are just normal variables which you can work with like any other variable. Okay, so these variables here are called elements. So an array contains elements and these elements have indices. An index is just the position of that element in the array in relation to the other elements. So you have the element at position 0, you have the element at position 1, you have the element at position 2 and so on. Arrays are continuous pieces of memory, meaning that you have your RAM memory over here and you have an array, in our case our array numbers, and that simply points to a place in memory where the array starts. And you have the item, uh, the element 0 over here, and then you have the element 1 over here, and then you have the element 2 over here, and then you have the element 3 over here, and the element 4 over here. For a 5 item array of numbers, that's what you have in memory. So each of, this, each of these, since numbers was an integer array, each of these is 4 bytes. So this is 4 bytes, this is 4 bytes, this is 4 bytes, this is 4 bytes, and this is 4 bytes. So for a 5 item array, th this is a sequence of 5 times um, 4 consecutive bytes in memory, meaning 20 bytes in memory for this whole entire array. And these bytes are consecutive. That's very important for arrays. That's why arrays can work the way they do by accessing elements because they know that their items are always sequential. That's, by the way, the reason they start from zero, because numbers points to the first position, and to get to, the, to, to, get to any position, you need to offset from where numbers point. And how much do you offset? Well, if you want to offset to the first position, you need to move four bytes to the right. And if you want to go to the zero position, well, you move no bytes to the right, because numbers point to the first position. Okay, so that's what an array is. An array is just a sequence of integers in memory which we access programmatically using an index. Okay, and let's go back to the lecture and start uh, examining them in more formal details. So an array is a sequence of elements. It typically looks, it, it is typically illustrated like uh, somewhat of uh, a sequence of uh, squares which are numbered uh, with indices from 0 to the length of the array to the number of elements minus 1. Okay, so this is an array of 5 elements and arrays have a fixed size. You can't change the size of an array. Once an array is created, it will always be that size. You can change the what the variable points to because the variable is just a container for the array, meaning that this is the array and this is a variable that happens to point to this array at this point in time. Later on we can just say that numbers is something different. So we can say numbers is now a new integer array uh, of three elements. And this would forget the old elements. So numbers will start pointing to a new, new array. The old array will uh, be detached from this numbers variable and it will uh, drift along and be removed from memory at some point when the Java runtime decides that we're not using it anymore. And numbers will be pointing to a new array. So we're not here we're not resizing the original array, we're just forgetting about it and using another one. We're making numbers point to a new array. Okay, uh, elements in an array are always of the same type. For example, you can have a, an array of strings, an array of characters. A string, by the way, is an array of characters. Uh, you can have an array of doubles, you can have an array of integers, but they all need to be of the same type. This thing over here is what you call the element index, and the indexes start from 0 and end at length minus 1, length of the array minus 1. Okay, so how do you create an array? We already saw some parts of this, but let's uh, play around with uh, arrays a little bit more. Uh, on the more formal side. So how do you create an array? You name the data type of the array, the, the data type of the elements which will be contained in this array, and then let's say that data type is integer, and then you write 
brackets, a closed pair of brackets, square brackets, and then you type in the name of the variable in which you want to store the array. So let's call this again numbers. Okay, and then you need to initialize it, you need to create an array, you need to dynamically allocate memory for an array. So you say new integer, and then you say how large this array needs to be. So there are a few ways you can do this. First off, you can just say create me uh, an array of three elements. Okay, so now you have an array of three elements and you can start accessing the elements by just mentioning their index. So saying numbers, then opening these brackets, which I said are your multi-tool. Any operation you're doing on an array is probably going to involve them. Okay, so numbers and accessing the element at index zero is done like so. You open the square brackets, you mention the index you want, in this case zero, and then you can assign a value to this. So you can say numbers at position zero equals 42 and numbers at position 1 equals 13 and numbers at position 2 equals 255. Now the same way you assign them, the same way you print them. So the same way you get access to an element for assignment, you use the absolute same syntax to get access to an element for printing. So what, what I do here, I'd say system.out.println and I'd access numbers at position zero. So this would print the first element. And if I start this piece of code, numbers will get initialized with 42, 13, and 55 as its three elements, and then we'll print 42 on the console. Okay, now what else can I do? Well, what happens if I don't initialize number zero? So I created an array, it has three elements, I initialize numbers one and numbers two, but numbers zero has never been initialized. What would happen, what would uh, come out on the console for things that I haven't initialized? Well, the answer for integer is zero. Why did I get zero? Maybe because the index is zero? Well, no, it's not that. Let's uh, misinitializing another number, so let's say that number zero is after all 42, and let's skip numbers one, and let's print that one out and see what uh, gets printed on the console. Well, again, we will have zero printed on the console. Okay, so it's not the index. How, do, how does Java decide that this should be zero? Well, if you remember the lesson about data types, you will recall that there we had a thing called a default value for data types. So for integer, that default value was zero. And for floating point numbers, that default value was 0, 0.0. And for characters, that was um, the zero character, slash zero, otherwise uh, named slash zero or the no terminator. Uh, and if you remember strings, the value for string was what? The value for strings, the default value for a string was no, meaning that you, if you have an array, the, value, the values of the strings in that array um, will be no's until you initialize them. That's the no value. No just means a lack of value. Okay, we'll get to that in a bit, but this is how you can initialize values in an array. So let's get back to initializing all of our items and see how we can uh, use a shorthand for that. So <clears throat> we're saying numbers one is now initialized by um, the value 13, like it was before. And instead of writing this uh, down, when you know what your elements will be, like in this case, in this case, we know what our elements will be, compile time or, or runtime. We know it compile time because we have initialized them specifically with the literal tree, the literal we know compile time. I'm writing it right now. And the values, I also know compile time in this case. So when you know your values compile time, you can just do like so. You remove this size over here and then you place the items inside these curly brackets after the square brackets of the integer array. So you place 42, 13, 255 and you can press Control alt l to format the code so that uh, the spacing is uh, more uh, pleasant for the eye. And now we have the equivalent of initializing the numbers array like so. And if I print the first item, the item at index zero, I would get, uh, at index one, I would get 13 printed on the console. And here we go, we have 13 printed on the console. 
Okay, and again, I can iterate this array with a simple for loop. I can say for index starting from zero, continuing until we reach numbers dot length, and that would give us at each iteration we'd have each index in the numbers array. Not that i is specifically tied to the numbers array, but since it's increasing from zero up until numbers dot length, at the first iteration i will be zero, that the second iteration i will be one, and at the third iteration i will be two, meaning that we would access each of these elements, zero, one, and two, and we can do whatever we wish with them. Let's say we can print them on the console. <coughs> System.out.print and let's print that number at that position. And, if, and we can add a space after it. And we can even add, after that printing, we can even add system.out.print line, print an empty line so that the array uh, is represented on a single line on the console instead of uh, having something else after it. Okay, so starting this, we're going to see 42, 13, and 255 printed on the console with spaces. Okay, so that's one thing we can do with, uh, with the arrays. What else can we do? Well, let's get back to the lecture. So this is a way of initializing a numbers array. And as I said, all elements in that array are going to be with, uh, going to contain the value zero initially, uh, if, that's an, if that's an array of integers. Now we can also initialize them by using these curly brackets as I demonstrated, and we can assign values through a for loop. Now, I already showed how we can assign values through reading from the console. This example here just assigns each index, uh, each position to uh, the value one. So all of the elements in this numbers array are going to be the, the number one. So there are going to be 10 ones in our array of numbers. Okay, so length holds how many elements you've got in this array and this brackets operator accesses the element at that position. <clears throat> you can play around with the elements any way you want. You just need to mention the name of that element and the name of the element is just the combination of the name of the array and the index of the element placed in square brackets. Again, we did this a few times already, so I hope you already got the drift of what we're doing. Just It's just 10 integers, 10 integer variables, and the name of each variable is determined then by the numbers array and uh, an index, a number, which determines its place in that numbers array. Okay, now what happens if we access an element outside the numbers array? Meaning, what happens if we access index 10? Well, what's the maximum index for an array of 10 elements? It's 9, right? 10, 10 minus 1. The maximum index is always max index, is always length minus 1. Okay, so what happens if we access position the position at length so what what happens if we say give me index length give me the element at index length well what happens is a so-called array index out of bounds exception meaning your program crashes with an error message containing this inside it we will explain exceptions in another lesson but for now all you need to know is that the program will crash so you cannot access elements outside of your array same thing would happen if uh, you have a negative index if you try to access index minus one. Okay, so that's an array and that's how you access its elements. Now let's uh, have an example of what we can do with the string uh, array. We can initialize a string array and place, for example, the days of the week there. And then we can have some code which uh, enters a day of the week and we print the name of that day of the week. So let's do that. Let's have uh, an array of strings, a string array, days, or even day names, and we'll initialize that with a new new string array, which contains the elements Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I won't be typing in all of them because it will take more time than it's necessary. Uh, these can be on a single line, they can be on multiple lines, they can have empty lines in between them, although I wouldn't suggest that. Uh, you can do any configuration of initializing them like this. The only thing you keep in mind is that when you're specifying the values at initialization like so, like literals, you have to omit the size of the array. Why? Well, because the size of the array is determined by how many items you add in. <clears throat> okay, so what do we do from here on out? Well we can 
let's say we have a task in which we need to read a number from the console. That number will be a number between 1 and 7. That's important, between 1 and 7. Okay, let's add all of the days so, so we can uh, implement the task fully. So Thursday and, and Friday, Friday. I won't be singing because you will not want to watch anymore. Okay, so Saturday, there was a song about Saturday too. And Sunday, there are a lot of songs about Sunday and on Sunday. Okay, anyway, so uh, we have our weekdays and we're going to have an input between one and seven and we need to print the name of that day. So one will be Monday, two will be Tuesday and so on. So let's read that. Let's call the scanner and ask it for, an, for the next integer and say that this is the day number but not the day index because I'm saying the day number will be between 1 and 7 not between 0 and 6 right so what do I need to print now I need to say system.out.println and what would I be printing I'd be printing day names and I'd access day number well yeah but someone if someone inputs 1 I'd get Tuesday because this is index 0 and this is index 1 and this is index 2 and this is index 3 and so on and the last index is index what? index 6 okay so if uh, we're going to get input which is in normal human numbering starting from 1 we need to access the element 1 less than that so if they enter day 1 we need to access day names 0 so starting this code this would give us um, an this would give us the name of that day which we've inputted. So if I input 4 I should get Thursday because Thursday is the fourth day of the week. So enter and I got Thursday on the output exactly as I expected. Okay so this is one way you can use an array to uh, index values, index some names and access them through a number. Okay so we just uh, handled that and uh, here we have a problem which is exactly that, uh, that concept. One thing in addition, we have to print invalid day if we don't get a number between 1 and 7. So that would be just uh, an if condition that prints something else if the index is different than the range 1 through 7. Okay, so here's a solution which does that and again I suggest you uh, write that code yourself. Okay. So let's do a reading of an array and then we'll do a break. A simple reading of an array. Now we already saw how we can read an array by knowing its length as input from the console because that's the first thing we did. The first thing we did was enter a number from the console and then initialize an array with that size. So how does that happen? Well, you read the number of items you're going to need. Then you initialize an array with that number of items. And then you start a for loop starting from zero and continuing to that number of items. Although here I prefer r dot length because I already know that this array is at most this number of elements and I don't need the n anymore. That way I'm reducing the uh, span of n because I'm not using it uh, as... Well, I'm reducing the usages of n and I'm using only the array and its own sizes to determine the loop. But n is fine too. Okay, and then I just start an iteration which start, starts in at index 0 it accesses element 0 and it reads it from the console and then at index 1 it accesses element 1 and reads that from the console and then at index 2 it accesses element 2 and reads that from the console and so on and so forth okay so that's how you read an array from the console if you know the size if the size has been entered on the console but if you don't know the size, there are other ways to read an array from the console. So one of these ways is by reading an array from a single line on the console. And this is actually a pretty common uh, case when reading input from the console. Now, how do we know when to stop? Well, if we have a fixed size, we execute our loop that number of times. But if we don't have a fixed size, we need to have something else which indicates when we should stop. In this case, because this is a single line on the console, we know that that single line will end in the new line character. And do we have a function that reads uh, until it reaches the new line character? Well, yes, we do. And that function is called scanner.nextLine. So what we do now is we'd say scanner.nextLine. That will read us these symbols. So this 
will get us a string containing these symbols, only the symbols. Those symbols are not yet numbers. We don't have an array yet. We, have an, we actually have an array of characters because a string is just an array of characters. So this string line is just an array of characters, but they're still characters. They're not numbers separated into multi-character sequences which represent uh, integer values. Okay, so how do we get them uh, as such numbers? Well, lucky us, the uh, string object, our line here, has a split function. What does the split function do? Well, you supply a separator by which you want to split. Actually, you supply a regular expression, which we will talk about in a further lesson, uh, by which you want to, to separate uh, your values. Now, if, we, if you just want to split by spaces or any other character, you just type in this character over here. Uh, and after you split on this character, split, well, guess what it returns? It doesn't know how many elements it's going to get, so it needs to count the elements, allocate a dynamic amount of memory, and place that, uh, those elements in that dynamic memory. Well, guess what it allocates? It allocates an array. So here are our elements. Okay, so what, how did we get them? We got them as strings. Why didn't it return it as numbers? Well, because it doesn't know if those are numbers. I could have entered something like hello world and read that from a single line of the console and that would actually be an array of strings. So uh, splitting a string just gives us the elements of strings and from there on out we have to decide what to do with these elements as strings. Okay, so in our case we have a string array of elements and we want to have an integer array of elements. Okay, so let's create an integer array of, let's call them numbers. How lo large is, going, is this array going to be? Well, it's going to be as large as elements. So I'd initialize it as a new integer array, which is as big as elements.length. Okay, and from here on out, we just need to copy the values from the indexes at elements into the indexes at numbers. So we have for example, if we entered 12, 42, 13, after splitting this single string into multiple strings, what we'd get is 12 as a string, then 42 as a string, and then 13 as a string, okay? So this is an array of strings. This is the first string, this is the second string, this is the third string. So this is the string at index zero, this is the string at index one, and this is the string at index two. And now we want to have an array with one, two, three elements, which also have index zero, index one, and index two. And what do we need to do? Well, we just need to get the string from index zero of the strings, and then convert it into an integer. How do we convert it into an integer? We use the integer dot parse int method, right? So we do that for index zero. So what would we say? Our, um, our numbers array at position zero will become assigned to the value of our, of our elements array. I just deleted uh, our beautiful artwork doesn't matter. So for if, if we ju were just doing it for the, in, uh, for the first element, we'd be doing numbers at position zero, assign that with elements at position zero, but we can't assign it directly. What did we need to do to convert the string into an integer? We need to integer dot parse int it into an integer. So this is a string and we're getting an integer from that through integer dot, dot parse int. Okay, and that gives us the numbers uh, array element at position zero. But we don't need to do that just for element zero, we need to do it for element one, two, and for element two, and for element three, and so on. So how do we do that? Well, we run a for loop. So we say, start a for loop from zero, continuing up until, now both elements and numbers are the same size, but since I'm writing into numbers, I prefer to use their size. So numbers dot length. Okay, and now we just say for a single index it was numbers at position 0 equals element at position uh, 0 and that parsed to an integer. In this case, since i will always uh, be the next index in the array, we just do numbers at position i, assign that with integer dot parse dot parse int of elements at position i. And that's it. We already, ha we now have our numbers entered over here. 
and we can do whatever we wish with them. Just so you see that uh, the input, uh, the reading is correct, let's start um, uh, the code and see in the debugger how the numbers array looks like. And now we will combine uh, reading an array from a single line on the console with uh, viewing an array in the debugger. Okay, so let's input 13, 42, 255, minus 1, 5. Okay, and press enter. Let's see, it seems that our code reached this part. And now let's see if our array looks correct. So here's our array. We can expand it over here and see its elements. So, oh, I actually expanded the elements array, but that's fine too. Let's see them both. So the elements array are the strings 1, 3, one, three 4, 2, 2, 5, 5, minus 1, or dash 1, and 5. Those are the strings. What did we get in the numbers array? We got the numbers 13, 42, 255, minus 1, and 5. Okay, so we read them correctly. And if we want, we can print them on the console or calculate the sum for them or whatever we want to do. But this is how you read a line of integers from the console. This, these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 lines do that. Pretty neat, huh? It's a pretty short program for reading something which we haven't yet uh, gotten any practice with. So here is some code which does the same uh, thing. And you can uh, do it with functional programming too. There is the stream API in Java, which allows you to uh, do such sequence operations uh, one after another over an array. So how can you do that with a single line of code? Well, you tell uh, Java to convert your items into a stream. Streams are things which can be managed by doing cooperation on each of their items. And then you say for each of the items where item is this, where I'll use this as the name of the item, parse that item into an integer and use this result and convert that to array. Now, if this seems a bit like dark magic to you currently, it's because it is. So it, it's actually not that complicated, but it's too soon for us to explain fully what this does. However, since you're probably going to see this functionality somewhere on the web and wonder why haven't we shown this to you, well, that's why we're showing this to you. And if someone is interested, he, uh, they can uh, study this even further on. But for now, it's completely okay to read with uh, for loops. Actually, I prefer reading with for loops, even though I can use this and I understand how it works. I mostly prefer to read with for loops because it's a bit more explicit on the operations you're doing. You can do it even shorter. You can say create a stream out of the splitting instead of creating a separate variable which you create a stream from. You can say arrays dot create a stream from that split which I just got and map each element to an integer. How do you map it to an integer? By doing to each element an integer dot parse int and convert that back into an array. Again, if that's a bit too weird for you currently, don't worry. That's normal because we haven't studied uh, the concepts of uh, objects and we haven't even studied methods yet so it's normal for you uh, for you for this to seem weird to you we it, it will get clearer as we go along and you're not obliged to do it but if you're interested see and work out how this works study it online okay let's continue on with the next part of the lecture which will concern ourselves with uh, printing arrays and the different ways we can do that on the console and we'll also solve a few programming problems related to arrays okay so how do we print an array on the console well we already saw some of that uh, let's say we have an array initialized with uh, a few strings let's say and we want to print its items well how do we do that and let's print not just the items, but let's also print the indices of these items. So let's say array and that index is equal to that value. How do we do that? Let's write some code over here. So um, we could use our array, which we just read from the console, but let's not overdo it. So let's just initialize a string array and work on that. So we have a string array and that string array will have items. Let's call them words. And these words are initialized through a string initialization here and we'll place the words hello and then we'll pr place the word world in the array okay so we want to print these words on the console and we have several options to do that first off we can do the for loop like we did for 
the normal integer array, it would be the same, the exact same for the string array of words. Okay, so we start from index zero, we continue until index matches words dot length minus one. That's the last position we want to. Um, we continue until we reach words dot length minus one, meaning that the index should be less than words dot length. So the last position we want to match is words dot length minus one at the point where we have an i which is equal to words dot length. We need to stop the loop. Okay, so now what would what do we do? Well, we just print out the word at that index. And I also said let's print out the index along with it. So let's print a formatted string system dot out dot print f print a formatted string. And in that formatted string, I want to say that words at position something at position digits. So actually, let's let's write it simply and then we'll replace whatever we want. So words at position i, we want to say that that is equal to um, to word to yeah. So we want to say words at position some position over here is equal to the value at this position. So we want to say that words at position, for example, words of zero equals, let's say, hello. That's what we want to print. So let's say that we want to have words zero equals hello. That's what we want printed for the first element. Okay, so let's generalize this for all elements. So this would print words zero equals hello for all iterations of the loop, but that's not what we want. We want to do this concept, but we want to do it with the specific values of the element at index zero and element at index one and element at index two and so on. Okay, so this won't be words zero, but it will be words the uh, the digits of an integer number. What is that integer number going to be? Well, it's going to be the index in that words array. And now we need to just print the word at that position. And since it's a word, it's going to be a string. And that string we print with percent %s. And to place that into the format, we need to access words at that index. So starting this code, oh, and we might want to have a new line at the end. And starting that code, we'll see hello and world on two separate lines. Here we go. Words at position zero is hello. Words at position one is world. Okay. So we just printed out an array of strings on the console. We also saw we can print it out just the words themselves. We can separate them with spaces. Now let's do something, something more interesting. I want us to print, I want us to print each word and I want the words to be separated by spaces, but I don't want the la actually, okay, let's do it like this. I want the words separated by commas. So I have a word and I have a comma and then I have another word and I have another comma and so on. Okay, so how would I do that? Pl printing the words is simple. Let's just print them like this. So starting it like this, we'll just print the words with no separators between them. So I will have hello world attached, concatenated on the output. Okay, so how do we add a comma, you say? Well, one way is to just attach the comma to the printing operation. But this we will not exactly work, right? Because it will print commas between our words, but it will also print a comma at the end. And we don't want that comma at the end. We, we want the end to finish without a comma. We only want commas in between our strings. And by the way, we need a new line at the end so that we can separate our output from the debugger messages like this one. Okay, so we're printing a line to separate ourselves from this debugger message, but we still have the problem of the comma after the last element. So again, this is somewhat of a debugging challenge. How do we cause our code to only print separators until it reaches the last element? We don't want a comma after the last element. Well, obviously we won't be printing it each time. So we will be printing it under some condition. Under what condition do we print uh, the comma? Well, we want to print only when we are not at the last word. How do we check whether we are at the last word? Well, we say if the index equals words dot length minus one, then we are at the last index, right? So this here is the last index. 
because words.length minus one, the, the last index of an array is always the length of the array minus one. So in this case, we have item zero and item one, element zero and element one, and the total size of these elements is two. So minus one would give us exactly uh, the last index. Okay? And in this case, I would only need to print words at this position. Otherwise, I would print words followed by a comma. And this should work. If I start this code, I will see hello and world separated by a single comma and with no comma after world. So that's fine. But I want to uh, make this code uh, look a bit better. So now I have a lot of repetition. In both cases, I'm printing words at pos position I. So in both cases, I'm doing this. The only difference is that when I isn't length minus one, I print a comma. So I should kind of reverse this, right? If I'm doing something in both conditional statements, if I'm doing the same thing in both conditional statements, well, that means I'm doing something wrong. That if, if in both in the if and the else I'm doing the same thing, then I probably need to be doing that thing outside of them because whether it's true or not, the, the statement I got into the if, in both cases I'm printing. So let's take this out of the, the condition and what would remain is I'd switch these around. So I'd say if I is less than words.length minus one, meaning that if I'm at any other position, any position other than the last position, I want to print a comma. In all other cases, uh, if I get to the last position, I won't print a comma because if I becomes uh, one, which is the last position here, what will happen? Well, is one less than words.length minus one, words.length minus one, words.length is two, minus one equals one. Is one less than one? Well, no, it isn't. And since it isn't, this comma will not be printed. Okay, so starting the code like this, we will get the same result, but the code looks a bit more understandable. Okay, so that's what our code should do. That's how we print an array of items, separating them with a separator and ensuring that the separator doesn't get to the end uh, of our array. It, it is only between the elements and not after the last element. Okay, so we did that. Uh, and that's one of the ways we, in which we can print an, uh, an, a list of integers on the console. Now, here's a task we already solved. We have an array, which is defined on the console as a single integer fo followed by that number of elements, and we need to print them in reverse. We already did that at the start of this lecture, so we won't repeat this uh, task. The solution which uh, we have over here is pretty much the same one we implemented ourselves. Okay, however, uh, let's see something else. In addition to printing ourselves, if you have a string array, and this only works for string arrays, not for other array types, if you have a string array, instead of coding this all by your own, this uh, printing with separators, you can simply use the string, the built-in string functionality. You can use string.join. Now string.join accept, accepts uh, one parameter, which is a delimiter, in this case a comma, in our case where we wanted to separate them with commas. Uh, a delimiter which is a comma and the the array of things you, which it needs to join in this case our words so string dot join getting this delimiter and these words will generate a new string which we will call comma separated words so this variable will now contain a string a, a sequence of symbols which are separated which are our words into converted into symbols and separated by commas. And now we can simply print these comma separated words and see what happens on the console. We will see hello comma world printed on the console just like we did previously. So instead of writing that yourself, if you have an array of strings, well, you can use string.join. Now, if you don't have an array of strings, you can use the code which we implement, implemented a few moments back. Or another option would be, well, what happens if you have a list of, no, a, a string of, no, um, an array of numbers? Well, 
you convert it into an array of strings. How do we do that? Let's convert an array of numbers into an array of strings. So let's say we have an int array which is numbers and we want to place that into this words array. Okay, so let's say that numbers for simplicity we won't be reading it from the console. We'll just initialize it with a new integer array and we'll place one, two and three over here. Okay, and now we want to convert this integer uh, array into a string array. And how would we do that? Well, the way we do that is uh, go through all of the items in the numbers array and place them in the matching positions in the strings array. So first we need to initialize the strings array uh, with that appropriate amount of elements. So we'd say numbers.length, initialize the string array with numbers.length. And from here, we just need to loop through the words array. So I'd say start from index zero, continue until you reach words.length. And at each position in words, place the number from numbers. Okay, so we can't do this directly because numbers is an integer array and words is a string array. So we're trying to, write, to uh, put an integer in the place of a string. But that's uh, something which, for which we have an easy conversion. Just like we have integer.parsint, which converts an integer into a, a string into an integer. Well, the same way we have string.valueof, and we supply it with an integer number or something else, and that converts it into a string and saves it into words. So now let's print these numbers on the console separated by a comma using this functionality. And we got one, two, and three printed on the console with commas. Great. So we have that implemented now, and we can we have another way of printing to the console. Just convert your numbers um, uh, array into a strings array by copying the items using string dot value of, and then just use string dot join to join them. Now there are advantages and disadvantages to this approach. Of course, to do all of this, we need to have an entire string array which we need to print. Whereas if we just iterate the numbers and use the code we wrote a few moments ago, which manually separates them by a delimiter, well, in that case, we wouldn't need to allocate a new string uh, array, and that would use up a bit less memory. But if you're not uh, concerned about memory in the program you're writing, this is a completely fine solution. Okay, so uh, I just showed you string.join. By the way, you can also join by nothing. If you leave this as an empty string, well, that would just concatenate these strings which you uh, entered. So instead of one, two, three with commas, you would just receive one, two, three as a sequence of characters. Okay, so that's another way in which you can print arrays to the console. Now, we have another uh, interesting uh, task over here. We need to reverse an array of elements. But instead of just printing them reversed, now up to this point we were printing reversed when we were reversing. In this situation, we want to reverse the array itself. So we need to exchange the items inside the array, like so, like it's demonstrated over here. We need to exchange the last item with the first item, the second item with the second last item, and so on. Okay, how do we do that? Well, there are a few ways we can achieve that. Well, the easier way is to just create another array and start from the last index of the first array and copy into the first index of the second array. And so you're copying in reverse. That's one way of doing it, but let's not cop out like that and actually swap the items in place. This is called an in-place algorithm. What does in-place mean? It means that it works in the place it has begun, meaning that starting it on an array of strings will reverse that array, not create a new array, meaning it won't uh, need more memory than is needed for the input. Okay, so let's say we have these words again. Uh, it doesn't really matter how we get them. Let's say we get them from these num. Okay, let, let's actually initialize these words as uh, input from the console, since it's good to practice our reading of arrays. So let's say we have a list of strings from the console on a single line and we need to read them into an 
array of strings. How did we do that? Well, we used scanner.nextLine to get the entire line of strings, and then we split that by spaces, because that's our separator here, spaces. Split that by spaces and receive our array of strings. So this is a string array, and let's call it, we can call it strings, it's not necessarily words, it could be symbols. So we have our strings array over here. And now all we need to do is walk that strings array and swap out indexes. Okay, so let's leave the printing logic over here. So we're printing strings, comma separated words isn't really accurate anymore. So let's just inline that variable, meaning let's remove the variable and just place the expression we just used wherever we need the printing to happen and we need to print them with a space. Okay, now, now the current code will just read strings from, um, from a line on the console, split them into spaces, and then print them joined by spaces again. We need to swap around these items in such a way that the last items be become the first items. Okay, so how would we do that? Obviously, we need a for loop. So we need to be accessing elements inside the array, and each of these elements we need to do something with. What are we going to do with each of these elements? And for how many elements are we going to do it? Let's uh, take a look at the slides again. So what do we need to do? We need to exchange the first item with the last item and then the second item with the second last item. And how many times do we need to exchange? Well, since each time we're touching two elements, that means that we only need to do as many operations as there are elements divided by two, since each time we're uh, playing with two elements. So. If we have five elements, one, two, three, four, and five, how do we exchange these? Well, we exchange one and five, and then we exchange two and four, and that's it. We don't need to exchange anymore, because if we continue exchanging, we reverse it again. So we only need to continue until we reach index, uh, the index that is the number of elements divided by two. So if we have four items, how does that look like? One, two, three, and four. Well, it's again, we exchange two and three, and we exchange one and four. If we have four items, one, two, three, four, five, uh, we, if we have five items, I meant, we exchange one with five, two with four, and that's it. So in both cases, we reach index two, meaning actually we reach index one, because index two is the index we shouldn't be reaching. This is index two here, this is index two here. So in both cases, our loop runs from zero up until it reaches the index before index two. So zero, one, and we stop at two. And zero, one here, and we stop at two again. Okay, so whether it's an even number of uh, items or an uneven number, an odd number of items, we, in both cases, uh, go until we reach the dot length divided by two and we need to reach before this, so less than this. Okay, so we need a for loop that goes from zero to strings dot length divided by two. And now we just do what? We need to exchange two indices. Which are these indices? Okay, so the first index we need to exchange is just index i, whatever index we're at currently. So index zero, index one, index two, index three, index four. So i becomes index zero, and this is the first index we need to exchange. And we, to, we need to exchange it with which index? Well, index zero, we need to exchange with index four. What is index four expressed through the variables we have? Well, index four is strings dot length minus one, right? That's index four in our case. Okay, what happens when i becomes one? So i becomes one, pointing at the character b. Which index do we need to exchange that with? Well, we need to exchange it with index 3. What is index 3 display, uh, uh, described as uh, variables which we have? Well, strings.length minus 1 and then minus 1 again, right? So string.length minus 1 is the last item and strings.length minus 1 and again minus 1 is the next element, but what is 1? Well, 1 is i, right? So i is index 1, and this is what we're using over here. And if you think about the first index, well, here we also have minus i, but it's minus 0 because i is 0 the first time around. So what's the formula for the opposite index on the other side of the array? It's just 
int um, let's just say that this is the left index and this is the right index so the right index is what it's strings dot length minus one that gives us the last element and then we need to offset it as much as i is offset from the start so if i is offset from the start by zero we will offset it by zero and then if it's offset from the start by one we will offset it by one run this formula around in your head do a few calculations with it and you'll see what happens you'll see that this provides the exact indexes we need okay so we have the left index and we have the right index and we need to swap them around how do we swap around two variables well you probably know by now that to swap around two variables, you need a third variable in which to so store one of the two because you would be overwriting one of those two and you would need to um, use the swapping variable to overwrite that one to the other value. So simply said, if you have a bottle, I know that's a weird bottle, bear with me. So let's say you have a bottle of water and you have a bottle of tea. Let's even give it a bit of color. Now I know this doesn't look like tea, but bear with me, please. Okay, so you have a bottle of water and you have a bottle of tea. Let's say that, let's indicate that this is water. Okay, so a bottle of water and a bottle of tea. In order to exchange them, well, you can't just pour the water into the tea or vice versa because you'd mix them. Okay, what you need to do is grab another bottle. So grab, let's say, this bottle over here, which is empty, it doesn't contain anything, and move the contents of the water bottle into the green bottle, then move the blue bottle's contents into the red bottle. So the, the previous water bottle's contents are now filled with the yellow of the tea. And now this green bottle, which got the red bottle's water, needs to be moved inside the blue bottle. So you need a third variable. How do we do that? Well, let's create a third variable string. And let's say this is old left, the previous value of left and we'll assign that to strings from the position we'll assign that to the string at position left index in the strings array okay so old left is strings give me the position at left index okay so that's old left and now what do we do with the left index well we just say strings at the left index should be assigned with the value of strings with at the right index so right index of strings Okay, and now we just need to, we now have whatever was at the right index, we have it at the left index, and now we just need to set the right index to contain what was previously at the left index. So strings right index, assign that with the value, with the old value of the left index. And that's it, we've just swapped around our lists. Let's see what uh, we're, we're going to get if, we're, uh, if we have any errors here. Okay, so we're running this. And let's say we want to input, um, let's input a, let's input the input we had in the presentation, A, B, C, D, E, and let's see if it switches them around. Yes, it does. And now we should try out with um, an even number of values because that's where we could have a mistake. Okay, let's go with one, two, three, four, and see, okay, that, uh, converted it into 4321. Okay, so we solved that issue. And the code over here is pretty much the uh, value, with, uh, the code which we had in our case. And you can check it and try to implement it yourselves. Okay, let's continue with the last part of the lecture in which we will see another for loop. Now, we already talked about loops in a previous lesson. However, this is a new type of loop which is strictly related to arrays or other types of sequences of elements and we will study about other types of sequences further on so this loop is the so-called for each loop the for each loop or sometimes called the range based for loop uh, or the for in loop is a loop which is specifically created to iterate through collections what does that mean that means that instead of writing uh, loops which traverse an array by indexes uh, what you can do is create a for each loop which goes through all of the elements inside that array without needing to reference the index it only references the item itself so how does that work well it works by providing you an element at each iteration but not providing you an index so you only have access to the element itself but not the current index 
okay? It's a read-only loop, meaning that you can't actually edit the items inside the array. We'll show that in a bit. And it looks like this. You type in for, just like you would for a normal for loop. But after that, you specify the collection you want to iterate, like, for example, an array. You prefix that with a column, and you say that you want to iterate each item inside that collection and you can use var instead of writing the type name of uh, whatever you have in the collection or you can just write if you have a collection of integers you just write int item so this says at each iteration you will be supplied with an item variable which will be the next item in that array or collection so let's do that in our code so here we had a printing of strings on the console with a space actually let's get rid of that one and let's just initialize a normal array of strings and test on with that. So here's our array of strings. We'll initialize it with a new string array containing the, wor the words hello and arrays because we're talking about arrays today. Okay, so we have our strings array. Now, normally we do a for loop starting from index zero, reaching up to strings.length and actually not reaching that index, not executing for that index, so i being less than, less than strings.length. And then what do we do? Well, we start printing, for example, our strings. Let's say we do system.out.println, the string at that position, so strings at position i. And just so we make this a bit more clearer, strings at position i we can assign to a variable which we can call item. So we get the current item from strings by accessing that index in strings, and then we print that item. The exact same result we will get if we do a for each loop. How do we do a for each loop? We type in for, we open the brackets, and we say what type of data do we have in our strings array? We, well, we have strings. So we, can, we have the string item inside our strings array, and for this item, we can do system.out.println item. That's it. That's the range based for loop. That's the for each loop. The for each loop is just a shorthand for an iteration of items inside a collection, whether it be a, a list of strings collection or an array of strings collection or a linked list or a, a lot of other collections we will be studying can be iterated through this for each loop. Okay, so what effectively happens? Well, effectively, this loop just goes through the indexes in this array when it's executed for an array, and it gives, our, gives us an item variable which we can access to print it. We can name it however we want. We can name it S if we want to, but I named it item, so I match this string item variable over here. So this loop and this loop are pretty much equivalent currently. Let's get back to the item name. This for each loop and this for loop are pretty much equivalent. They, they have the same effect as in sequence of handling of elements and they have the same result printed out to the console. So both of these will print hello and arrays on the console. Let's see them in action. We'll wait a bit. And here we go. We have hello and we have arrays on the next line. And then we have hello again, and we have erase again on the next line. Okay, so that's what the range-based for loop looks like. Now, what you don't have access to here, as you notice, is the index. We can't access uh, which index we are located at currently. So you don't know whether item is the first item or the second item or the third item or whatever. So you only use this range-based for loop if you just want to go through all of the elements in a sequence and, and do that. If you want to do something specific like swapping around elements or assigning new values to elements and so on, that's something you need to uh, have a normal for loop to do. Okay, so saying that, can we actually use the index even though we, we don't have access to the index? Let, let's try to use the index regardless. So how can we print at which index we're located current. I want to print the following thing. I want to print 0.hello and 1.arrays formatted like this. This is what I want output on the console. 
So how would I do that with a range based for loop with the, for each loop? Well, let's remove the old for loop. Well, I might not have the index directly, but what's to stop me from creating an integer variable, calling it index, starting it from zero and incrementing it where? Where does the for loop increment its index? At the end of the body, correct? So let's do the same. Let's increment the index at the end of the body. And now all we need to do is just go over here and print the index, then followed by a dot and followed by the item. Now, if I start this code, I will get zero dot hello and one dot arrays. Here we go. So I can still use an index, but I need to code that index myself. Okay, so let's add a space here so we see what uh, let's see the formatting a bit better uh, rendered. Yeah, we this is what we wanted initially when we said we want uh, to have a prefix of the index. So yeah, zero dot uh, space and the item. That's what we printed. That how did we do it? We just used an index variable which was external to our for loop. And yeah, this index variable is visible outside of the for loop and can be used outside of the for loop, but we don't really uh, care about uh, this in our current program. Uh, what we care about is the fact that we managed to get the index of the current element. Now, not all collections will have such a thing as an index, but you can still count up to which item you've reached. You can count how many items you have in your uh, array of strings, for example. Okay, so that's one thing you can do with, with uh, for each loop. Now, what you can't do with the for each loop is say item, assign that to, for example, uh, a sequence of dots. So doing this, yeah, the code will compile, it will run, let's see what happens. So I'm assigning the item to a sequence of dots. And on the output, yeah, I, I actually do see that I'm outputting sequences of dots. Uh, does that mean that I just lied to you and that I can actually change the item? Well, not exactly. Meaning, if I now iterate these strings again, so I'll add the same for each loop, but I won't be changing anything. I'll just say strings, so I don't need to write the for each loop. I will just uh, ask IntelliJ to do it for me. So I write strings, I press Alt and Enter, and I say iterate, and it generates the for each loop for me. So for each item in strings, print that item. I won't need the index, let's ignore the index. And actually, let's ignore that index from the previous code as well. So it, so it doesn't uh, mess with our thinking about what's happening. Okay, so we just were just printing the items. But in the first loop, we're assigning values to these items. Whereas on the second loop, we're just printing them. So what would we expect to see? Well, if this actually changes the items in the strings array, then the second printing should still print the dots, right? Not the words. Let's see what happens, however. What you're going to see is that the items remain what they were. So we're not actually changing them. All we're changing is the current, let's say, copy of the item. So each time you uh, create a for each loop like this, you're actually receiving uh, another name for the item. You're receiving another variable which indicates the the same item and strings. But if you change the entire var variable, you're not changing the string itself in the strings, you're changing the new variable. So you get a new variable that points to this string the first time. And if you tell that variable to point to something else because assignment of strings and of other objects doesn't um, doesn't override the existing object, it just overrides the variable which points to it. And that variable now stops pointing to hello and starts pointing to this string, to the string dots. And if we iterate it again and not mess with the variable, it will still point to whatever it was supposed to point. So here we're not changing the item itself, we're just changing, uh, imagine in this for each loop, on each iteration, we just receive um, let's say that this is a um, this is a apartment and we're walking through apartments and we're visiting the first apartment and then we're visiting the second apartment and so on. So to in order to visit the apartment, we need to know the address of the apartment. So by doing a for each loop like this, what we're actually doing is receiving an address, you know, like uh, 
uh, first Broadway Street or something. So we're receiving first Broadway Street and we're visiting that first Broadway Street. And this first Broadway Street, we're receiving it written on a piece of paper. So this is our piece of paper. It's not the apartment itself. It's just a piece of paper which has information about where that apartment is located. So this variable is just something that contains information by which Java finds where the actual object is located in memory. And if we take that uh, sheet of paper and just scribble something on it, we won't change the apartment itself. We won't change the apartment. We're just changing the sheet of paper's address and it will point to something else. And if we try to visit that something else, well, we will see something else. But we didn't actually move the apartment. We just received a copy of the address, like we received um, we received a card, a business card, which indicates the address. If we scribble something on that card, that's our problem. The, the person which gave us the business card still has another business card and still has their address. So we didn't change the address itself, we just changed what was written on the business card. So by changing the business card and printing it, yeah, we we printed something else because we scribbled on the business card, but the original business's uh, owner still has their apartment and still has other business cards which, which they can hand out. And if someone else visits the actual business card uh, addresses, they will see the actual apartments. Whereas I am seeing something different than the actual apartments. I'm seeing whatever I scribbled on the business cards. So. Editing the item inside the for each loop doesn't actually edit the item inside the array. Here you're just receiving, you can think of it like receiving a copy of the item. So the for each loop receives copy of the items. A copy isn't exactly the correct description uh, in the long term, but for now it's a good way of understanding it. Imagine that you're receiving a copy of the string. Okay, and, and iterating it like this will just print that copy of the string. Okay, in reality, it's, it's a variable which points to the same string, but you're not changing the same string with by assigning a variable because assigning a variable just changes to what the variable points. So instead of that variable pointing to hello, it will begin to point to this new string object I just created. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much all you need to know about this for each loop. You can't edit items inside it. You just forget about doing that. Okay. And we now have um, an example of printing the a list of numbers with the for each loop. I showed you how to uh, do printing strings, so it's pretty much the same thing. It doesn't matter if it's strings or numbers or floats or doubles or booleans or whatever. Okay, so we have a task over here. We have a problem which we need to solve. We have an array of integers which is going to be entered on a single line on the console. And we need to sum all even on and all odd numbers, so we need to we're only caring about the elements right now, right? We don't care about the indices of those elements. We only care what type of element we have, whether we have an odd number or an even number, okay? And then we need to find the difference between the even sum and the odd sum. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we have an input of a line of numbers. Let's read that input of a line of numbers. So we can directly use our strings array, but instead of uh, initializing it ourselves, we will read it from the scanner through the next line method and, and we will split it by spaces. Okay, so now we will get the numbers, but represented as strings in an array of strings. And now we need to convert that, that array of strings into an array of integers. So here are our numbers, and we will initialize these numbers with a new int initialized by the strings.length. Okay, and now what do we do? Well, we need to copy these strings from here into our numbers. So we need to start a for loop from index 0 to index numbers.length minus 1 effectively. And we need to set the numbers arrays position i to the value of strings at position i, but we need to parse it into an integer. Integer.parseInt of that strings at i element. Okay, so we, this is how we get the element. And now what do we do? Well, we have the numbers and we have to calculate the sum of the even numbers and the sum of the odd numbers. Well, since we're calculating both of these values, we need an integer even sum, which starts from zero, and we need an integer odd sum, which starts from zero. Okay, and now what do we need? We need to iterate each item in this array 
check if that item is even or odd and add it into the appropriate sum. So how do we do that? Well, we just start a for each loop since we don't care about the index and every time we don't care about the index we don't really want a, a normal for loop. It's easy to make a mistake with the indexes in the for loop but it's not easy to make a mistake with the for each loop because there's not much you can make a mistake with. So let's do a for each loop. So numbers, I mentioned, I, I type in the name of the collection I want to iterate and then I press Alt and Enter and then I pick Iterate and it generates a for each loop which walks through each number in the numbers and what I need to do is if that number is divisible by 2 with a remainder of 0 so I have no remainder when dividing this number by 2 then I need to add it where? into the even sum I need to add that number into the even sum otherwise there are no other cases except that remainder being 1 so if the remainder is 1 I'd add it to the odd sum Okay, and I just now need to print the difference between these. Okay, so for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I should get the result 3. Why do I get the result 3? Well, because I have um, the number 1 is odd, 3 is odd, 5 is odd, so I get 8 from that. And I have the even numbers are 2, 4, and 6, and I get 2 and 4, 6, and 6 is 12. And I subtract, ah, okay, I'm not, uh, my calculations are wrong, this isn't 8, 3 and 5 is 8, so 3 and 5 equals 8, and 1 more equals 9, so this is 9, and the sum of the even numbers is 12, and the difference is between even and odd, so I need to subtract odd from even, and I'd get 3. Okay, let's see if that works. Uh, I need to print on the console system.out.println even minus odd okay and now start this and I'll see what happens I will copy the input from these examples and test it out in this um, in the console so for this input we receive 3 that seems correct okay uh, we should receive minus 35 for this let's check with a negative value so with a negative result pasting this minus 35 okay so now I should test around with the other inputs uh, so so that I can be sure that my program is working correctly but I will not I will not be playing around with that currently I will just continue on with the lecture my advice is again solve this task by yourself and try to um, try to test with different inputs and see how you can implement it in another way maybe implement this task with a normal for loop see how that changes things and so on Okay, so here in the solution which we're provided, we have reading of the input through a stream. You can play around with this one too, uh, instead of using my uh, approach of reading from the console, uh, reading from the console with the for loop. Or you can continue with using, uh, or you, you could do this approach, you could do my approach of just uh, parsing items one by one. Both of the approaches will be uh, fine enough at this point of the course. And from here on out, it's pretty much whatever we uh, wrote a few moments ago. Okay, so before we reach the summary, let's do one more thing. So let before we reach the end of this lecture, let's do uh, some nested iteration of our numbers. So let's uh, solve the following task. Uh, we need to find the, the smallest difference possible between two numbers in the array. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, for our array of 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11, the smallest difference, and that's kind of a boring uh, example because all of the differences are 2. Between 3 and 5, it's 2. Between 5 and 7, it's 2. And 7 and 9 is 2. And 9 and 11 is 2. Uh, and all other differences are... Uh, you know are, are larger we need to find the smallest difference okay let's pick some of this data eh, all of this data is kind of boring okay let's figure out our own data so let's use this as an example we have the array which contains the items 7 1 13 5 um, 2 uh, 33 
So we need to find the smallest difference between two numbers in this array, but not consecutive numbers, any two numbers in this array. So any two numbers which aren't the same number. So we check, we need to check, how, how do we check this? We, well, we obviously need to check every number with every other number. So what we do is check this number with this number, and then we check again this number with the number 13, and then check this number with the number two, and then check this number with the number 33, and so on. And then we do the same for the uh, for number one, then we do the same for number 13, the same for number two, and then no need to do it for number 33 since it doesn't have another number with it. So actually, how do we do it? We do the checks with seven and one, then we do the check of seven and 13, then we do the check of seven and two, then we do the check of seven and 33. Okay, and for the number one, do we need to check back as one and seven? Well, no, we're looking for the smallest absolute difference. So we're not, we don't need to recombine them the other way around. So instead of checking one with seven, we'll just check one with 13 directly. So one with 13, then one with two, then one with 33, and that's it. And then for 13, we'll check 13 with two and 13 with 33. And then for two, we'll check just two and 33. So these are the checks we need to do. So for each number in this array, we're comparing it with each number after it. And we're looking for the minimum difference. Okay, since we're looking for a minimum difference, uh, what do we need to what do we need to create? Now, first off, this is a standard, part of this is a standard uh, task in programming, find the minimum. So we're searching for the minimum, but it's not the minimum element, it's the minimum difference. So since we're searching for a minimum, let's create that minimum. So we're searching for a minimum. We'll call it min diff, min difference. How will we initialize that min difference? Well, I do the following. I'd assume that the difference between the first and the second element is the minimum difference. If it isn't, I'll prove that by iterating the elements. So I'll replace that. But initially, I'll start with the difference between the first two elements. And I'll have a requirement that my array of strings has at least two elements. Otherwise, it's not really, uh, it, there's nothing to search a minimum difference for. If, if we have an array of just one element or zero elements, that's also possible, by the way. If we search for uh, the minimum difference in an array of one element, well, we can't make a pair of elements for for which we need to find the difference. So yeah, that doesn't work. Okay, so the minimum difference is mat.absoluteValue and mat.absoluteValue of the difference between numbers at position one and numbers at position zero. I can swap them around if uh, it would be easier to read. So number zero minus numbers one, it doesn't really matter since we're calculating the absolute value. Okay, and I need to print this. And you're saying, okay, but you haven't calculated everything. Yeah, I haven't, but I like to frame my program program like this. I need to, uh, I, I like to initialize whatever I'm going to be calculating and then print it. And then somewhere in between, I need to implement my code, which does the work. Okay, so how do I do this work? Well, I need to start for each element in this, uh, for, for each element, in this array, except the last element. So I need to do it for the first element, the second element, the third element and the fourth element, but not for the fifth element. So for each element, except the last, for each element, except the last index, which means that could I use a for each loop? The for each loop always iterates all elements, but I don't want the last element. So I'll be using a normal for loop. Okay, so for each element in these elements, I need to check it with all of the other elements in the list. So let's do the first part for each element. What I'm going to be doing for each element, I'll figure out afterwards. Okay, so, so I'll start a new for loop starting from zero and continuing until numbers dot length minus one, right? We don't want the last index. That's why we'll do it. we're doing a minus one over here. So we don't reach this index, which is minus one. Okay, so uh, for each element, I need to look at all the other elements. So in order for me to check all the other elements 
uh, with 7, well, I need to write another for loop because this is exactly what I did when I was writing this out. So I picked 7 and I started 7 with 1 and then 7 with 13 and then 7 with 2 and then 7 with 33. So each element after our current elements index I need to visit. Okay, so what I need to do is start another for loop and now I can't really use for i because i is already used for the first loop so i call this index now intellij suggests j because that's just the next word the next letter i'd avoid using i and j in nested loops why well because they look too much alike and it's easy to confuse them with one another so i'll instead call this the compare index because that's what i'm doing i will be comparing with that element so the compare index continues up until where it continues up until numbers dot length, not dot length minus one, because I want to compare seven with 33. I just don't want to compare 33 by itself with anything. Okay. And what do I check now? Well, I'll check the difference between my current number and this index. So I'd say that the current difference is equal to math dot apps calculate the absolute value of the difference between numbers my index on which I have started, meaning that first time that's going to be seven, the index from which I've started and numbers, the index with which I'm comparing. So this is my current difference. Okay, so now I have, uh, I've walked these, uh, this array, I've walked each of its elements and for each of its elements, I've walked all of the other elements. And actually, have I walked all of the other elements? From which index do I need to start? Well, I need to start from the index after my index, after my current index. Look, I'm comparing 7 with 1, not with itself, not with index 0. And then I'm comparing 7 with 13. And further on, I'm comparing, um, uh, yeah, I'm comparing 2 with 33. And only with that, I'm not comparing any of the previous indexes. Okay, so... This is correct over here. I should start not from zero, but from what is my current, what is my base element which, with which I'm comparing it's at index i. So I need to start from index i plus one. Okay, so this is my current difference. And from here on out, it's just searching for a minimum element. So this is the current element and this is the minimum, the current minimum. So when do I need to change the current minimum? Well, if the current difference is less than the current minimum, then the current minimum will become the current difference. And that's it. And I print the current difference here. Let's check if this works. So for these, the, the minimum difference seems to be between one and two, and that should be one. Let's see if that's true. We paste that code and we get one. Again, we should test around uh, this code with other values, other uh, orderings of these values, maybe with an array of only two elements, with an array of a lot of elements, with an array of elements which are all of equal value and so on. So we can test whether it really works, but I'll leave that to you and I'll leave debugging any issues uh, that remain from here up to you. Again, this is bonus homework if you want to really ramp up your programming skills. A lot of the work done on arrays is actually of this type. You're not only iterating them, you're iterating each, for each element, you're iterating the array again, or another array again. Okay, so what did we learn today? We learned that arrays hold sequences of elements, and they allow us to allocate uh, programmable amounts of memory, meaning we can say how much memory we, will, we want to allocate it. Uh, it. They allow us to programmatically access elements of that array, meaning we can use a for loop or another method of computing an index and then accessing the element at that index, which is an extremely powerful tool because we don't need to know the names of the uh, indexes. We, need ju we just need to be able to calculate those indexes, what they are. Okay, we saw how we can allocate an array and we saw how we can access elements of that array and we saw we how we can read elements from the console uh, for an array and how we can print elements on the console through the string.join method if they're strings or through a for loop which just prints the elements. And we also saw the for each loop and we solved a lot of programming puzzles uh, and the last one of which was a pure bonus which we have weren't, uh, um, weren't considering initially for this lesson but uh, bonus knowledge is always bonus knowledge so I hope 
uh, you found this useful. Again, if you have any questions, please ask them in all the channels we've provided for asking questions. And I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Today, together with my colleagues, George Gurgiev, we continue teaching this free Java Foundations course and the basic concepts from Java programming, such as arrays, lists, methods, strings, classes, objects, and exceptions, to prepare you for the Java Foundations official exam from Oracle. In this lesson, your instructor, George, will explain and demonstrate how to use methods in Java. Methods allow developers to declare subprograms in their classes and in their programs. Declaring a method means to give a name for a certain block of commands and involve these commands later by their name. Methods can accept parameters, input data, and return a result, output data. This is the reason why they are sometimes called functions, like in math. Your instructor, George, will explain how methods work through live coding examples and will give you some hands-on exercises to gain practical experience. Are you ready? Let's start worrying. Hello everyone, this is George and today we'll, we will be talking about methods, meaning that we will find a few ways in which we can make our code more organized and a few ways in which we can uh, extend its functionality. But keep in mind that everything we uh, learn from here on out after we know how to uh, create loops, branching of our code, and allocating dynamic memory, everything else we do is just uh, a tool which helps us write more efficient code or a tool which helps us uh, write shorter code or m better formatted code and so on. Because everything up to this point has covered all of the main functionality a program needs so, it could, so you can write any type of software with it. Now, that doesn't mean that it's practical to write software with only the knowledge of arrays, uh, for loops and ifs and conditional statements, but uh, it is possible to write any program with that knowledge up to now. So learning about methods now, this is just something which allows us to build upon the knowledge we already have and gives us a lot of powerful tools to organize our code and to reuse it and so on, but it's not uh, essential in creating any other program. So anything you can do with a method, you can do without a method. But it really helps and no one really writes uh, business level software without implementing methods and a whole lot of other stuff we're going to uh, continue learning in the following lessons. So to the topic at hand, methods. What are they? Why are they used? So what are we going to cover today? We'll cover what a method is and why we need to use them, how we can name them and how, what are the best practices in naming them. And we will cover this last in the lecture, even though it's uh, uh, further ahead, uh, even though it's uh, soon in the slides and it's in the first slides. It's in the first slides because when you're uh, reviewing your le lecture later on, you will need to uh, pay more attention to this uh, topic than the other topics we have covered during uh, the lesson. So. Uh, we'll talk about how we can uh, declare and invoke methods, meaning that we how we can create named pieces of code, which can be later reused from other pieces of code, how we can return values from those, how we can pass in parameters to them. We'll talk about uh, a concept of the concept of values and value and reference types and we'll just dive into a bit of that and how it uh, functions in programming and how we can uh, handle it and what we should uh, uh, be watchful for when working with this type, uh, the, this difference in um, data types. And then we'll talk about how we can overload methods, meaning have the same method which accepts different, different parameters. And then we'll talk about how a program is structured in, uh, in Java and how execution happens and what is the so-called program stack and why the debugger has uh, a frames window which shows that program stack, how it's useful, uh, how it affects our execution, the execution of our program, and so on. So before we talk about what methods are, let's see a piece of code and think about how we can uh, optimize it. So first, let's write a very simple program. Our program will just print some stuff on the console, but it will print it in sort of a prettified way. So what I'll do is I'll do a system.out.println and I'll print a bunch of symbols. Let, which, which symbol do you want? Well, let's say we'll use dashes. 
Okay, so we're printing. Okay, let's not. Let's pick something different than dashes. Dashes are too standard. Let's use, use, use. What should we use? Okay, let's use dollars because everyone loves those. Well, maybe not everyone, but a lot of people do. So, printing dollars. So, we'll print dollars, and then between those dollars, we'll print out a line that says hello, or uh, this is your receipt, or um, welcome to methods. Okay, so if I start this program, what is, uh, what's going to occur is that I'll get three lines outputted on the console and they will contain the dollars I printed out as well as my message and the dollars to finish that up. Okay, so what can we do? What don't we like about this code? Well, we obviously like the dollar part, but we don't exactly like it 100% uh, from a programmer point of view. Well, w what what's not uh, what's not okay in this code? Well, a few things. First off, what happens if uh, my requirements change and uh, it turns out that I shouldn't be printing dollars, but I should be printing stars? Well, I need to replace the stars over here. And then the dollars over here I need to replace with stars. And then I need to go and replace the dollars at the other place with stars again. So I need to replace at two spots. So I have some piece of code and then I need to replace that piece of code at two places. And both of those could, could uh, cause an error because if I miss replacing something correctly, or if I do replace it, but I miss one of uh, the stars I need to add, well, that will generate an error. Now, you already know how you handle stuff like that. If a value repeats itself, you should probably extract a variable for it. So you should uh, extract a variable called, let's say, um, header or symbols or whatever, and initialize that to this uh, sequence of symbols. And in that case, you'd only need to replace in one position. So you'd only need to replace uh, the value which gets assigned to header and after doing that, that will be printed equally in, in both places. But still, we're, we're still, we still have, still have an issue here. What the issue is, is that we're repeating code. What do I mean by repeating code? Well, we're repeating the fact that we're printing on the console and we're printing a certain value on the console. Again, this is a really simplified example. So it's not a big, it's not really a big repetition of code, but the point still stands. We're repeating uh, execution which could be generalized and another thing about repeating execution it's not just about the fact that there's repeated code but that once you have repeated execution of something that means that there's a business concept or just a, a concept in your program of that thing being executed so this is this is a named thing this is a header being printed this is a line of symbols being printed if you're repeating something that's that thing probably needs a name that thing is uh, some type of cornerstone into your code which you need to uh, consider as a first class citizen of your code like variables have names and they're first class citizens of your code so here you have pieces of code which repeat themselves so you probably have some underlying concept in your program which needs to um, be generalized and, and have a name w by which you refer to it instead of writing that piece of code everywhere. So what we can use in programming uh, to replace repetitive code. So if we're repeating a value, we use a variable to, re to repeat that value and to store it into a single variable and from there on out, we repeat the variable. Now, if we see that we're repeating code, especially if it's more code than just two lines like here, so if it's more code, if it's a sequence of uh, operations, for example, um, in the lesson for arrays, we had to read uh, an array of numbers from a line on the console. Well, that's a very good example of a piece of code which you'll probably need to repeat a lot of times. So we'll, we'll uh, need to refactor that in some way we need to edit that code in some way so it can represent the concept in our program which it deserves to represent so how do we do that well we use methods what are methods methods are just named pieces of code that's it nothing more complicated than that like the way your code stands in a main body so this is 
the main method, this is a method, main is a method in Java, and it is the entry point of your program, and your program just contains a bunch of code. And that bunch of code is located inside this main identifier. So methods are just named pieces of code. That's it. Though they're nothing uh, fantastic or special or uh, nothing hard to understand. They're just ways for you to get a few lines of code, give them a name and be able to invoke those lines of code with that name instead of uh, having to use, uh, having to copy that code over and over again. So let's make a method and let's call it with an appropriate name for what it's going to be doing. Now, what are we doing over here? Well, we're pretty much printing a sequence of characters. We're printing a line of characters. We have a line of some type of character and that we're printing that on the console. Okay, so instead of writing this out every time, let's just say we, that we have a method which does that. Now, methods you can declare this in the same place where the main method is declared. So the main method is declared over here inside the class main, inside these two, these, this opening and this closing bracket. And you can declare, de define a method anywhere you wish within this uh, range. So anywhere between these lines, you can create a method. It doesn't matter whether it's before main or after main, Java doesn't care about that. Mm. Okay, so. How do we do that? Well, let's uh, be copycats and do what main does. Well, it, it's a method, so why not copy that? Let's see what we can do. Okay, so let's copy everything. And we can't name it main because it's another piece of code. It's a piece of code which is going to print a line of symbols. So let's call it that. Print line of symbols. Okay, what is this line we're pr printing? Well, this is the code we want to execute. We want to execute this print line operation in this print line of symbols method. Now, what we have here are the so-called uh, method arguments or method parameters, and we don't really care about those. We don't want to supply parameters at this point. We'll see how we can do that further on. So let's remove those. So what we're left with is a public keyword, which by the way, we can do without. It's not necessary while we're doing single file Java um, applications, we won't, be need, we, we won't need to care about what public, private and protected mean. We will see them, we will see those things in other lessons further on. So what we will need to leave in is this static and this void. Now, what do they mean? Well, we'll figure that out in some time, but uh, short info about the static part, well, uh, static methods can only call other static methods of the same class. Now we're in, inside the same main class, meaning that the main static method can only call other static methods. If our method isn't marked static, main will not be able to call it if it's in the same class, like it is in our case. So how do we deal with that? Uh, we just place that static keyword. Now void means that our method will not produce a result. It can have side effects like printing on the console, but it will not produce a result. Okay, so that's it. Now, instead of writing this piece of code down, instead of writing system.out.println and supplying the symbols which need to be printed, I just say print line of symbols, and that's it. And then I say the same over here at the bottom line, the bottom result. Okay, so this is a method. A method is a named piece of code. You can have as many lines of code as you want over here, and main will uh, still be able to call this method print line of symbols and printing this line of symbols will still yield the same result on the console which is uh, outputting a line of dollars with a certain length okay so how do we make this more interesting well we do have a print line of symbols but that's not really an ideal method for us so we can only use it in only one single exact way. And that one single exact way we can use this print line of symbols method is by printing these dollar signs. Okay, so let's start modifying this. Let's say that it's possible that my conditions, that my requirements for the project I'm implementing change. 
a lot of stuff can change, but something that seems very likely to change is the length of these symbols. So I'm saying print a line of symbols, but how long is that line of symbols? Well, nobody knows. So the, it, there, there could be three symbols or 10 symbols or 100 symbols. And that seems something seems like something that hasn't been well defined in the specifications of my project since it's just printing a line of symbols. And it could change. And since it could change, let's... Uh, Let's implement this print line of symbols method in such a way that I'm not in danger of having to rewrite it again once uh, some specification changes. So, uh, what do I have in mind? Well, instead of printing a fixed string of symbols, let's just print symbol by symbol a fixed number of times. So we'll still keep it fixed. We'll st still keep it uh, printing a fixed number of items, but at least we'll have it as a variable. So if someone changes my specification and says, I don't want, um, how many symbols do we have? 19 symbols in this uh, line of symbols. I want 10. I want it to be easy for us to, to print that. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, we obviously need a for loop, which starts from i equals zero and continues until we reach 19. Okay, and on each execution, it just prints on the console this dollar sign that we want printed. Now, how did I figure out that these are 19 symbols? Well, I marked them and here down at uh, the status bar of, um, of IntelliJ, we can see the number of symbols which we have selected. For example, now I have two characters selected. Okay, so I have this implemented and now I don't need the print line over here anymore. But I do need, actually I do need the print line, but I don't need to print the symbols inside it. So I need a new line to be printed. Why? Well, because I called my method a print line of symbols method. So it should print a line. So it should finish its output by printing a line. And what else can I fix? Well, I don't really like having a value directly here in code. At least not, I don't like having that value as a magic value. Let's just name that value something. So I press Control Alt and V after marking this value and I'd say this is the length, length of the symbols I'm, symbols I'm printing. Now it's not this, a super descriptive name, but considering that it's contained inside the print line of symbols method, it's uh, pretty reasonable for me to assume that length means the length of the symbols I'm printing a line of. So names of variables and of methods in that uh, relation should be uh, sh should be appropriate for the context in which they exist. So length in a method of print line of symbol in a method named print line of symbols is kind of obvious uh, to the reader that it should probably mean that this is the length of that line of symbols. Whereas length in main doesn't really tell you length of what. Okay, but if you have a named block of code which uh, by, uh, uh, which you uh, reference with this uh, variable, then it, it is easier to understand. Okay, so we have our length, we have our length of 19 symbols, and we're running a for loop which prints those 19 symbols. Now, if I start this code, it will do the exact same thing again. So I haven't really changed anything, I've just reworked the way I do it. Now, how can I improve this even further? Well, this print line of symbols, I didn't really change that much from from the perspective of the, the the developer. Yeah, that print line of symbols method changed in such a way that it can now print multiple uh, symbols and it can be easily changed. This method can be easily changed to print as many symbols as we want. We wouldn't have to, you know, type in just different numbers of symbols and count them by hand. We can just give a numerical value of how many symbols we want printed. Okay, so that's good, but from the point of view of the user of this method, which in this case is the main method, this is still a method that can be only used in one way. It can only print a fixed line of sim a fixed length of line of symbols, and we can't really tell it what that length needs to be. Okay, so let's make this thing into a parameter which allows our method to be called to execute for a different num different lengths of lines of symbols. So this is currently just a variable 
inside our print line of symbols method. It lives inside the print line of symbols method the same way that if we had a variable inside main, it would live inside its lifetime would match the 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 code block of main. So here, print line of symbols is variables like this one live during the the lifetime of that method. Okay, and this int i variable, on the other hand, lives within this for loops lifetime. So during the whole execution of the for loop. So this is just a normal variable. Now let's change this variable so that external users of the print line of symbols method can change the length of the printed symbol line. How do we do that? Well, we take this length variable and we move it up here. Now this initializes it in exactly the same way. It will still live inside this uh, body of the print line of symbols method the same way it lived there when it was just a normal variable inside the print line of symbols method. So whether you declare it over here or you declare it over here doesn't change its lifetime inside the print line of methods method, uh, print line of symbols method. Okay, now we have this set to 19 but we can't anymore set it to 19 because this is now a parameter. This is something that gets supplied from the outside. And, after, and if we scroll downwards and reach the print line of symbols call, we will notice that here we have compilation errors now. What do these compilation errors say? Well, you can't call print that line of symbols because it requires a single parameter of type integer and you're trying to call it without any parameters. So here we're saying call print line of symbols, execute it, these brackets mean execute it, but we don't supply any parameters to this print line of methods method, uh, print line of symbols method. Okay, so if we want 19 symbols to be printed now, instead of initializing length over here, which would mean that print line of symbols would always execute the same way, Instead of doing that, we supply a parameter and that parameter we provide from the caller, from the call site. This is a call site of the print line of symbols method. So main calls print line of symbols and this is the site where it is being called, it, where it is being executed. And we're going to call it and tell it, well, when we're calling it, we're going to tell it print 19 symbols. And then we'll do the same down here for this print line of symbols. And of course, this could be extracted into a variable and we could call this variable length or uh, re replace it. And now I'd name it header length because length in main isn't that obvious as it is in print line of symbols. So header length now in main makes more sense because this is what we're printing. We're pr printing a header. We're actually printing also a footer if we consider this to, have, to be a footer, but uh, you, you get the idea. It, it's good to have more meaningful names than just length or height or whatever, if, if it's not obvious what they mean. Okay, so print line of symbols now can be parameterized. So I can call print line of symbols from any uh, place in my code, from anywhere, from main, it, I can even call it from itself, but I won't do that now. Uh, I can print, I can call print line of symbols from anywhere in my code and I can parameterize it so I can print any number of symbols I want. Okay, so, uh, and again, this is just a copy of the value I submitted. So this is just a variable which is, gets initialized as if I've, if it's, as if I just said that this for loop was over here replacing this method and as if I had a variable int length equal to header the header length. So this is the exact equivalent of what's happening when I write instead of this for loop, instead of this body of the method, uh, if I write just the call to the method. So if I say print line of symbols of header length, this is exactly equal to this code. Exactly one to one correspondence in from the point of view of the exec uh, from the point of view of the results of the program the execution is a bit different and we'll talk about that at the end of the lecture okay but effectively what you'd see is the same uh, the same process the same output okay so now we've replaced a bunch of lines of code with a single line of code which does their job we're, we haven't exactly replaced them, we've written them somewhere else and we can call them again and again and, and now we're saving from repeating this code. So I'm, I'm using one line of code to execute 
four lines of code or even more if this method was longer. Okay, so that's one parameterization. What else can we parameterize on print line of symbols? It's still printing a line of symbols with a length which we specify as a parameter. Okay, what else can we uh, parameterize here? Well, obviously we can parameterize what the symbols are because we're currently only printing dollars. Uh, imagine that we need to print uh, whatever we're, whatever our program does. Imagine that that program, uh, w let, let's say it, it, ex it we need to sell this program in a country which doesn't really like dollars. It has its own currency or, or symbols. So let's say that we want to print stars now. Uh, for people that don't like do dollars, maybe they'll like stars. So how do we do that? Well, currently, the only way to do that is to change the print line of symbols functioning and change this to a star. And that's all fine and good, but we'd have to be ch changing or writing a new method for each print, uh, for, for each type of printing we want, for each sequence of symbols, uh, for each type of symbol we want printed. So that's not exactly ideal. What can we do? Well, we can supply another parameter. We already supplied the length parameter, and what I'd say is I'd add a new first parameter, which is the symbol I want to be printed. Now, each parameter inside the parameters list of this method needs to have a data type and a name associated with it, and parameters are separated with commas. So I'll, uh, I'll supply a first parameter over here, and I'll call it char symbol the character which I need printed on the console this amount of time. So how will I call this print line of symbols? Now well, I'll say print line of symbols with this print this symbol this many times, this amount of times. Okay, so now I'm not printing dollar, I'm printing symbol. Okay, so now print line of symbols makes a lot more sense in the name department because why? Well, because it prints a line of symbols and the symbol it prints is specified as a parameter. It's not a part of the name. So it prints a line of this thing with this length. Okay, so now if I want this code to continue to print dollars, I just need to supply the first parameter as a dollar. And I need to supply it again over here. And again, I'm just parameterizing my method and allowing it to be called in different ways in different places. Now, if I decide that my header will be dollars, whereas my footer will be stars, I can easily do that now. Now, I executed the code with, do with the dollar parameters and that's all fine and good. But if I want this method to function differently in different call sites, now I can do that. So now I can say, okay, so the top line, I want it to be stars and the bottom line, I want it to be dollars. Okay, so we're changing from stars to dollars. Starting this, let's see what happens. Well, I have a line of stars at the top, then welcome to methods, and welcoming us to methods, we get the dollars. Well, that seems great. That's what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a method which is customizable, which can do different things based on different parameters we supply to it. Well, this is what a method is. This Again, this is a very basic exa example of a method, but it's a good example nonetheless because it allows you to write code which can execute with different parameters and do different things based on these different parameters. Now, we don't really have branching over here in this method, but we could. We could have conditional statements. We could have more loops. We could have other method calls even. We could have initializations of arrays. Anything we can do in main, we can do over here in print line of symbols as, uh, as a code concept. Now, what we need to do, of course, is different depending on the different situation, but we have no limitations in other methods. So basically, whether the method is called main or something else, it can do anything we have uh, learned up to this point. Okay, so this is what a method is. So now let's see more formally what uh, we need to know about methods. So a method is just a named block of code, a piece of code that has a name and can be called from other places. So you define it somewhere in the main class of the Java program. You can define it in other places too, but for now we're, that's where we're going to define our methods. You can define it before or after the main method. The main method doesn't really care where its print line of symbols is located as long as it's somewhere inside the main class and it's static. Okay. And here's a, another sample of a method. 
here we have a static void print hello. Again, this public is not really necessary at this point. So my suggestion is avoid it since it's not necessary. It doesn't really help you uh, in the future if you're writing public everywhere. So just avoid that public call. And we have this method which is called print hello and that prints on the console some information. Okay, now the method bodies which we're going to be writing will always need to be surrounded by these curly brackets. Unlike the if statements and the loops, the, these brackets are always absolutely obligatory. Your code will not compile if you don't have these brackets. Okay, so how do you call it? Well, you just enter the name of the method and then you follow that up by brackets. And if that method accepts parameters, well, you supply the parameters in those brackets. Now, why would we use methods? Well, we already sort of illustrated that uh, briefly and we will keep seeing it into while uh, viewing this lesson. But simply put, you can split problems into smaller pieces. You've already seen how, what my approach to solving problems is. I like to break them up into parts and solve parts by parts by parts. Well, a method is a great way to separate out a part of your code. And it also allows easier testing of your code. Not only can you organize it better and can you read it better, meaning that look at this code now, it says, okay, so I'll print a line of symbols. So that that's much more clearer than just system.out.print. It, it signals the intention of your code. You want to print a line of symbols. What symbols? Well, this, these symbols with this length. Then you're printing a message and then you're printing another line of symbols. This makes code much easier to read because you describe your intentions instead of just invoking built-in functionality. Okay, so you have the, the bonus of better organization and readability because you know what they do. And it allows you to avoid repeating code because like we have here, we just recall this method and the code gets executed automatically without us having to copy paste it everywhere where the method is. And that allows very, um, of course, it allows uh, very much easier writing of code because you, if you have to change something, you just change it in one single place, not in seven. And another thing they really improve is testing because once you have your program broken down into manageable pieces, each of these pieces can be tested independently of the others. Whereas if you have a single huge main method, well, that can't easily be tested. Whereas if you se separate it into smaller methods, you can test each part of your program by testing the appropriate method. Okay, so what we saw now was the void method. A void method simply executes some code between brackets. So it's really just a named piece of code and it can accept parameters, but it doesn't create a result. Now you might say, well, sure it does. Sure it creates a result. I just saw the result printed on the console. Yes, but that's not the result. That, that's not the result of the execution of the method, meaning that I can't take this method and assign it to a variable. I can't say x equals print line of symbols. I can't do that. I can't create a local variable of some type. There's no variable type void. Void just means no data. So there's no variable type void, there's no data type void. So I can't create a variable which gets the value of uh, this operation. Whereas if you compare that to math.apps uh, of minus five, I can assign this to a variable. I can say x equals apps from the value minus five and I can get an integer from that or I can get a double from that and so on. So calculating an absolute value returns a result. So when we're saying that void methods do not have a result, this is what we mean. We mean that their execution, the, the result of their execution cannot be assigned to a variable. That's what uh, having a return value means. Apps has a return value. In this case, it's an integer. And that value can be assigned to a variable. Okay, so void methods don't return anything. They just do something. Typically, they print something on the console or sometimes they modify parameters which are passed into them. And we will talk about that when we get to, um, when we get to value, value and reference types, how that happens. Okay, so this prints hello on the console and calling uh, and doing this, whether we do this in main or we do this in a print hello method, both are methods. So anything you can do in main, you can do in a print hello method or whatever you decide to name it. Now, 
We have a part here about naming and best practices, but I'm going to skip over that in favor of seeing through all of the concepts of methods and creating methods and uh, supplying parameters and returning values and uh, how these parameters are, are affected by the difference in value and reference types. And once we know everything about methods, then we'll come back to how we should be naming them and how we should be organizing code inside them. However, when you review your lecture at home, and this is why these slides are in this position, when you review your lecture back home, you should go through this naming and best practices section because you already know what, uh, how methods are created and how they are declared and how they are described, what parameters they take and how they return values. And then this will make a lot more sense while you're progressing through the lecture so you know why we've chosen the namings we've chosen. Okay, so I'm going to skip over this part and I'm going to jump right into the declaring and invoking methods parts. Now, we already saw that as an example in my code before we started the actual lesson. Now, let's see it a bit more formally. So what you write when you uh, create a method, first off, you start by public and static for now. This is not really syntax that's um, always obligatory when you're writing methods. It's uh, an artifact of how we're writing our programs currently. Hence, we're going to have to write it initially and then we'll start uh, getting rid of it. Okay, so public static for now, you need it. Later on, we'll find ways where we will not be needing this. Okay, and then the significant part comes from here on out. First thing you type in is the return type of the method. Now for void methods, this is going to be void, meaning they don't return a result. They don't have a result that is assignable to a variable. Then you have the method name. The method name is simply the identifier which you use to invoke the method later on. For example, if you're in the main, uh, in the main method, and you want to call this print text method, you would say print text, referencing it by its name, the same way you would reference a variable by its name. Okay, and here we have the parameters. Here we have the parameters which you supply to print text when calling them. In this case, in order to call the method print text, you have to supply some text which needs to be printed. For example, this is the text, um, hello. Okay, so this is the param these are the parameters and there can be more, many of them. They get separated by commas, I already told you that. And each of these parameters has to have a data type, a data type and a name. So data type, name, comma, next parameter, data type, name, comma, next parameter, and so on until you fill in all the parameters you need. And this over here is the method body. Just like for loops have a body and just like conditional statements have a body, methods also have a body which should always be surrounded by brackets. Now, all methods are declared inside classes. Actually, in programming, what uh, this would typically be called is a subroutine or a function. A function is just what you see over here, a code which has a name. And if a function is located inside a class, like it's obligatory to do in Java, it's called a method. That's why in Java you're going to see them called methods, whereas in JavaScript or C++, you're usually going to see them called functions unless they're parts of classes. But in Java, they always need to be inside classes and that's why they're called methods. I'm telling you this not because terminology is that important, but because it is important when you're searching for stuff in Google. So you don't get confused why there's uh, in one language they're called one way, in another they're, they're called another way. Okay, so main is also a method because it is a function located inside the main class. Okay, and variables inside the method are local variables. They're called local because they're only visible for that method. The same way that variables inside main are only visible inside main. So anything inside some kind of brackets is visible inside those brackets except when we get to classes and objects where it's, it's pretty much the same, uh, but there are a few, the semantics are a bit different there. So while, while we're talking about methods or code blocks in general, anything declared inside a code block is only visible inside that code block. Okay, so continuing, continuing on from here, how do we call a method? Well, we just uh, implement that method and then after we have that method implemented, we invoke it by using the, its method name followed by these curved brackets. So in main, to call print header, we just say print header and follow that up with the brackets. Now these are uh, obligatory. You can't just say print header and not supply these. 
if you just say print header and don't supply these, you're just referencing the code of the method. You're not executing it. So in order to execute something, you need to place these brackets, even if they're empty, even if you don't supply anything to them, just like system system dot dot out dot print line you can call this without supplying any parameters inside it but if you don't if you omit these brackets the code will not compile so you need the brackets okay so this is a method invocation it executes the code in, call in, uh, the code inside the method what actually happens is java sees okay i need to go into this method and it goes visits this method executes this line of code and then returns after the end of that method and continues the execution of the code which we had in main. Okay, so you can invoke methods from main, of course, because main is just a method. You can invoke methods from themselves, which is called recursion, and, and this isn't really something you want to do like this. There are, uh, there are applications of the concept of recursion, but we won't be covering them in this uh, lesson because it's going to uh, become too wide of a lesson and you're going to lose your focus. We are going to discuss them further on, however, and it's a very important concept in programming. But for now, we won't be calling methods from their own bodies. And there are other ways to call methods, and namely that is calling them from other methods. So, for example, if you're printing a header, you may have a method which is print header top and print header bottom. Like, for example, if you consider this uh, thing which we're printing here, the entire thing a header, well, this might be considered the header top, and this might be considered the header bottom, and this might be considered the header message. So, let's say that we can make this into a method, and we can say that this is actually a parameter to this method, which is um, header, header title. So, this is the title we're printing, and now, we have a header title and a header length and uh, okay let's put this header length back inside this part of the code so what am i doing now i'm taking out the header title and i'm grouping this code together guess what i'm going to do from this point on i'm going to make this into a method so i can print different headers with different messages with different titles uh, multiple times without having to write the code again so i can now mark this code press Alt and R, or just pick the refactor menu from up here, and then go to Extract, or just press X, and then go to Method, or just press M. And when I do that, Java, or IntelliJ more specifically, will uh, offer to create a method for me, instead of me having to write the method myself. It will create it as a void method. It will accept a string parameter named header title, this header title over here, which I created, and the method will look something like this. Again, this, ignore this private or public or whatever part. This will be what the method looks like. And I need to name it somehow. So let's say this is print header. Okay, and now I have print header which, which accepts a header title. And by the way, since the method is called print header, you don't need to call this a header title because it's if you just call it title, it's obvious that it's the header's title, not something else's title. So now we just have a single call in main, and now we can inline even this variable, and I can say just print header, and that calls the method print header, which prints a line of symbols, and then prints a message, the title, and then prints another line of symbols. And how does it do that? Well, it by calling other methods. So methods can call other methods, it's completely fine. Just how main can call the print header method? Well, the same way the print header method can call the print line of symbols method. And now look how neat and tight our main method looks like. And now we can have some other logic here which doesn't concern itself with how headers are printed. There's someone else that is responsible for printing headers. Okay, so this is these are the ways of invoking methods. Now, we already saw how we can supply parameters to those methods, but again, let's see it more formally, how it looks like. So, what uh, can method parameters be? You can supply any type of parameters to a method. For example, here's a method which accepts two parameters, a start and an end, and it prints the numbers from that start number to that end number. So, two integer parameters. How would we call it if we want to call this method to print the numbers from 13 to 42, how would we call it from main? Well, we type in print numbers and then 
if we want to start from 13, we type in 13 as the first parameter and 42 as the second parameter. Of course, we can have uh, this in, saved into variables or read from the console or whatever, anything works, any way of supplying a value over here would work. Okay, so print numbers is called like this from main or if we want to read this from the console, we can simply say scanner.nextint if we have a scanner and that would read the first number and then scanner.nextint for reading the second number over here. Okay, so when you're invoking a method, you're supplying the parameters. Now, you can have zero parameters on a method like we have. Actually, we don't have such an example in our methods. Um, but if we create a method which, which is called print default title uh, default header now we have a method which accepts no parameters and that method calls the print header method with the parameter welcome to methods and that one calls print line of symbols with two parameters so you can have any number of uh, delegations of responsibility here so we now have a method that prints the default header whatever that header uh, seems to be and the print default header method knows what a default header means and it passes it on to the print header method which doesn't need doesn't know what a, a default header mean, means but it knows what a header means as long as it's provided a title and from there on out the print line of symbols method doesn't even know what a header is but it can print a line of symbols as long as you provide it with the symbols and the length and so on so each parameter inside the method has a name and it has and a data type so always you name the data type and then you name the name of the parameter the identifier of the, of the parameter then you place a comma and then you supply the next parameter and so on okay so we have a problem here of uh, how do we print the sign of an integer number uh, we have to create a method which when it sees two prints number two is positive when it sees minus five prints number minus five is negative and otherwise, if we have the number zero, it prints the, num the number is zero. Okay, let's do that quickly. So we'll come over here and we'll create a method, a public static. Actually, we can avoid the public part. We can create a method named, um, which is a static void method. And we'll name it uh, print number sign, because that's what we're doing. We're printing the sign of a number or we're printing number sign info maybe because we're not just printing the sign we're also say, saying a bunch of other stuff so let's say this is our number which we're getting as a parameter and what are we going to do well if that number is larger than zero then we will be printing system dot out dot print line the number percent s uh, percent d is and percent s is some something so the number number is positive okay so uh, we don't want a print line actually we want a printf and let's add a new line symbol at the end now I'd be doing the same for uh, th the same call the same formatting call but with different parameters right for uh, negative so uh, else if the number is less than zero then I need to print this thing again but with the value of negative and I th think about how I can extract this so I don't repeat code but this is something I'm going to leave to you and in the final else if it's not larger than zero and if it's not less than zero then it's probably zero and then I'll say the number is percent D over here and just print out the number or I can just say the number is zero that would also be valid oh no it's actually the number zero is zero that's what I need to print okay so you, do you notice a pattern here everything is the same except this string at the end so what am I going to do well instead of printing each time I will just have a single print and I'll say string the uh, sign info is a string which gets initialized in this case to sign info to positive and in the other case it gets initialized sign info gets initialized to negative and in this case sign info gets initialized to zero and now I have only a single print statement which prints not positive but prints what prints sign info okay so what did I do well I 
remove the repeating code, which I execute in all of the branching scenarios. I moved it out of the branching and the thing I put into the branching was the determination of the info I print at the end. So if I start this program, nothing special will happen because I'm not calling this method, right? And you can notice that by the fact that it's grayed out. IntelliJ detects that I'm not calling this at all. Okay, so let's call that method. Let's leave our header alone and let's create a new scanner. Tell it to read from system.in. Add a save that into a scanner variable. That this scanner object, I save it into this scanner variable, and now I will say uh, print number sign info from scanner dot give me the next integer. And if I start this thing, it will accept, expect me to enter an integer number and for that integer number, it will print this sign information, which I described over above in the print sign info method. So if I write minus, minus five, I get the number minus five is negative. And I can test around with the other values if it works correctly. We're not going to do that now because we're in a lecture and this is something you should try at home with uh, by writing this code by yourself. Okay, so here is also a way of implementing this. Now here we have the repetition of this code. Now this is also a valid solution. However, I don't like it that much due to the repetition of this uh, same operation multiple times. By the way, you could also extract a method for this. Think about how you can do that. Instead of extracting a variable, think about how you can extract a method. Okay, there's another problem over here. We have um, we need to implement a method that receives a grade between 2.0 and 6.0 and prints the corresponding grade in words. So if we get between 2 and 2.99 inclusively, so if we get something between if grade is um, larger than or equal to 2.0 and, and this grade is less than 3, then we need to print fail. And otherwise, if not that, we need to print if in, in, in the other case in which the grade is uh, larger than um, larger than or equal to 3, but less than uh, 3.5, 3.5, we need to uh, print poor. And in the other case, we need to print if it's larger than if it's larger than or equal to 3.5 and less than um, 4.49, meaning less than 4.5, we need to print good and so on. So this is just a bunch of if statements. How would our method look like? Well, I'm, our method would look like, um, what does it do? First off, it's a void method. It's a static void method. What does our method do? Well, it simply prints information about the sign, so uh, about the grade. So print grade name maybe, or print grade description. And what is it going to get as a parameter? Well, it's going to get a grade. What's, what's the grade in this case? A double, a double grade. And then it will just open the brackets and do the if statements. And in each if statement, print the necessary thing. That's our method. And then we just need to call it from the main and see what it prints. That's this solution. We won't be coding it now. We'll leave it for, as something for you to try out at home. It shouldn't be very much complicated than what we did uh, previously. So here's an example of how you can do it. But my suggestion is try to solve this problem by yourselves and try to solve all of the problems which we see here, even if I've solved them for you, for yourself, because that is how you um, build experience with coding. Now, uh, another problem over here we will solve. With the problem is we need to print a triangle. Now, how do we print this triangle? Well, notice that there is a pattern here. So if we say that this triangle is of three elements, we should print a line of a single element, then of two elements, then of three elements, and then reduce to two elements and reduce to one element. Now, we could do that in a single method. We can implement a method that is just named print triangle, but there's a pretty obvious subtask to this print triangle task. What is that subtask? Well, that subtask is printing a single line of numbers. 
right? You print the line of numbers starting from one number and starting from one always actually and ending in a number you supply as a what? It changes, right? So in one case it's one number, then it's two numbers, then it's three numbers. Well, you, supp you supply the end number. You, the start number is always one, but the end number you supply it additionally. So let's implement that. So what I'll implement is I'll first implement a print line method and then I'll implement the print triangle method using the print line method. So um, I write that this method, I type in that this method is a void method since it's going to be printing and I'd call it print and what is this exactly? It's an increasing sequence, right? It starts from one and it increases to two and then it increases to three. So print increasing sequence. And I'd supply the end number, the last number, and the last number that needs to be printed. Okay? And what will I do in this printing of an increasing sequence? Well, I'd start a for loop from zero, from actually, from what? From one, right? Because I'm starting from the value of one always. So I'll start more a loop from the value of one. And I'll continue to last, but I will continue inclusively because I want to say print increasing sequence of three. And if I do that, I want this printed on the console. Okay, so now what do we need to do? We just need to print out to the console this number with the space after it. So now I have this number followed by a space and that is my description of the print increasing sequence method. And now I can print the line after that, system.out.println, so that I can finish this print increasing sequence with the new line. So that when I print the next increasing sequence, it starts on the new line. Okay, so here I have a single part of the solution, the part which prints one single line. Okay, what is the bigger part of the solution? Well, I need to go here and print a line that reaches one, then I need to go here and print a line that reaches two, then go here and print a line that reaches three, and then start reducing. Print a line that reaches two and print a line that reaches one. So up to this part, I'm running a for loop that increases from one to three, and then I'm running another for loop which decreases from three minus one to one. Okay, so that seems pretty simple. Let's now implement our static void print triangle method, triangle, and I supply the parameter which describes the triangles, what is this? It's a width, right? So if I, it's not the height, it's the width. It's not exactly a, a great name for a parameter, but it's better than, uh, it, it's descriptive enough if you know the context of the task. So print triangle with this width. And how will I be printing this triangle? Well, I'll start a for loop starting from i equals one, because that's where this is starting, a single, uh, a single item in a line, okay? And I'll continue until I get to the width, inclusively to the width, okay? And for each iteration of the loop, what will I be doing? Well, I'll be printing an increasing sequence. So I'd say print increasing sequence. And how long is that sequence going to be? Well, it's going to match the number in the, con the control variable of the loop, i. Okay? So I'll print that increasing sequence. And then I'll start from width minus one because for here I start I'm starting from two so I have a width of three this is three and then I after I print this part which I'm doing over here then I need to print the next part which just begins from the length over here minus one the width actually minus one so starting from width minus one continuing until I reach width one I'm printing again an increasing sequence. And now I just need to read the number from the console, which is the triangle width. And I'll create a new scanner for that. Tell that scanner to read from system.in and read the next integer from there. And now I'll just say, okay, so I have the width now and print a triangle with that width. Pretty simple, huh? looks, uh, it, it, I, actually, I know it wasn't simple while I was writing it and I was doing it sort of quickly because I want to uh, let you go into a break so you can refer, refresh your minds. But uh, even if it seemed complicated while I was writing it, if you study it 
item by item, it really isn't. That's the power of methods. It breaks up your code into parts and it's, if you're finding it hard to understand this uh, solution, well, just understand this part first, see how that works. Then understand this part, see how that works. And then understand, well, this part is pretty simple, but understand that and see how that works. So you can understand, you, once you understand how one part works, you can treat it as a black box and just imagine that it works that way and not care about its co the code itself because you're not seeing it all the time. Okay, let's en enter three. Whoa, we messed up something. <laughs> okay, let's see what we messed up. We're going to stop this code and we're going to... Um, I already see what I messed up. Do you see what I messed up? It's kind of boring when you always when you see your problem qu quickly, but since this is this seems like an infinite loop, right? So there's a problem with the loop continuation. Is this an infinite loop? Well, doesn't seem like it would be. It starts from one and continues until it's less than last and it increases all the time and nothing else touches i. Okay, so it's probably not this. Is this one an increasing loop? It starts from one and continues up to width and increases i. Doesn't seem like it's going to be an infinite loop. However, look at this part. I'm starting from width equals uh, from i equals width minus one and continuing until I reach one inclusively. But I'm not reducing; I'm increasing. So I'll never reach one. Well, not never. I'll reach it after integer overflows and. Uh, travels all through the negative values of integer and then reaches one and then it will stop which is really isn't really isn't ideal so what I need here is minus minus not plus plus because I'm going down on the values okay so three and we have our triangle one two three okay so I'll leave you with this for a few minutes to uh, get the rest for your head and of course, there's another solution over here which you can check out. It's sort of uh, similar to what I uh, implemented. And if you have questions again about this, you can ask in the channels um, of our, which we have provided for you to ask questions in and you will uh, receive some answers. And ask your colleagues too and communicate with them and play around with them. What have we seen up to this point? Well, we seem how to create a method, a void method, and how to pass parameters to that method. What we haven't seen yet is the return keyword. The return keyword just ends the execution of any method immediately. It doesn't matter whether it's in a loop, in, an, in a conditional statement, and whatever. The moment you meet a return statement, the method ends its execution. That's it. No more execution for that method until it's called the next time. Okay, so let's actually see that quickly. Let's create a method which prints an array of integers until it reaches a negative value. So it prints all the values of an array of integers unless it reaches a negative value, in which case it immediately stops. So let's ignore this uh, triangle and scanner part. Let's create an array of integers, let's call it numbers. And let's initialize that with a new integer array containing the numbers one, two, uh, minus, let's, okay, let's one, add more, one more number. 3, minus 1, 5, 6. So let's have this array of numbers. Okay, and I'll create a method which is called print numbers until print numbers stop on negative. So it, it's a sort of a weird method name, but it's not a method that you would typically be writing. It's just an illustrative method on what return uh, does. So now I'll supply this numbers parameter. Now you say, wait, we haven't created such a method. Well, we'll well, we will tell IntelliJ to create it. So I press Alt and Enter and I select create a method. It creates this method for me. It creates its parameter, which is the integer array of numbers, which I need added into it. And now, how do I print an array of numbers? Well, I just run a for loop and I actually can do a for each loop, right? So I can iterate these numbers with the for each loop and say, if number less than zero, then return. This is the new keyword we're, we're uh, encountering. Otherwise, just system.out.print this number with a space after it. Okay, so what will this do? Well. Starting the program, we will say that only 1, 2, and 3 are printed, and nothing after that is printed. So only 1, 2, and 3. Why? Well, because 
the code encountered a number which is less than zero, meaning that it entered into this conditional statement and accessed the return keyword, which immediately ended the execution of this method. Doesn't matter that it's in a conditional statement, which is inside the loop, it immediately breaks out of the method. It's, it's sort of like the break statement inside loops, but in this case, it's a full breaking of the entire method, not just of the loop. So it directly exits the loop. So this is what re the return keyword can do for void methods. Void methods don't need a return keyword, but if you add it somewhere, it will immediately stop the execution of the method. Okay, so if you're using it for a non-void method, the concept of the return keyword is to, for that to be used to return an actual value. So you have a method and that, uh, that method returns a value which you can assign to some variable. Okay, so let's do that. Let's implement a method which what can our method do we already have an array of integers let's do some let's do something with that array of integers for example let's uh, implement a method that counts the number of positive numbers inside an array of integers should be kind of simple so let's say count positive in numbers that's what I'll call my method. I'll say alt and enter create this method. Okay, so I'll leave it void for now and then we'll figure out how to make it a non-void method. So this is our array of numbers. Let's iterate that array of numbers. And what do we need to do? We need to count the positive numbers in that array. So in order to count positive numbers, I need to have a counter. So int num positive. This is my counter. What should it start from? Well, it should start from zero. And if I encounter a number for which it is true that the number is larger than zero, then num positive will be increased by one. I will bump it up by one. Okay, so num positive is now increased by one whenever it encounters a number in numbers which is positive. Okay, and now after this method has ended, after all of the numbers have been iterated, I can do return this num positive value. Now, I'm getting a compilation error here. Why? Well, because my method is void and I'm trying to return a value from it. The thing which you write after the return statement is the value which this method should return. And in, in, or, in order for the method to be able to return such a value, it has to have a return type that matches the value that you're returning. So the return value has to match the return type. In this case, it doesn't. It is an integer, whereas the return type of my method is void, meaning it has no return. So in order for this method to be able to return a value, I need to change this void type into an int type. And now this code will compile. And now if I print this on the console, I actually now if I just count the positive numbers, nothing will happen, right? Actually, it will happen, but I won't see any result because I'm not printing the result on the console. Now, this method actually has a result which is assignable to a variable, meaning that I can say x equals count positive and create a variable x, which I assign with that value of the number of positive numbers in this array. So now I can system.out.print a line with that x number and I will see the output which is contained in that x variable which contains the number of positive numbers in that list of numbers which is in this case 5. So 3 over here and 2 over here, 5 numbers. My program is correct. So this is what uh, a returning method does. It calculates some value and it returns that value to the caller of the method. So the caller of the method can use that value as, for example, a, a variable which can be saved or the caller of the method can place that result of the method inside the print line statement so they can directly print the result of that operation or do something else with it or supply it to another method or uh, use it in an expression and so on. So any method that returns a value can be assigned to a variable. It's uh, the, the result of its execution can be assigned to a variable. Okay, so here we have another example, a read full name method which returns a string. It accepts a scanner parameter, the scanner used to read from the console, and it uses it to read two names from the console and concatenate them into a single string. Okay, so uh, 
Anything, any method that returns a value can be assigned to variables, can be assigned to expressions, can be passed to other methods. Like when we do uh, scanner dot next line, we pass that into, uh, pass the return value of this as a parameter to the parsint method. The parsint method is just a method, just like the next line method is just a method. Also, we'll see how to write methods like the next line method further on. But this is a method, it returns the value, and that value is then passed on as a parameter to the parsing method in the integer class. Okay, so here's an example problem. Now, instead of solving this problem, which is pretty simple, we just need to uh, code a method which calculates, uh, which multiplies a width by a height and gives us the result. Instead of implementing this method, let's implement something which will be useful further on. So. In previous lessons, we learned how to read an array of integers from the console. So let's let's remember how we were supposed to do that. So we have an array of integers on the console as a single line. So how do we read that from the console? Well, we don't know how many there are, but what we can do is create a scanner, tell it to read from system.in, name it scanner, create a variable for it, and then Tell it to read an entire line from the console. Now up to this point, we're just reading a line from the console. From here on out, we need to parse this line into an actual array of numbers. So this is our line, our line on the console. And from here on out, after we've done the reading part of the line, we need to convert this line, this string, into a, lot of, into a sequence of numbers. So what do I need to do? Well, we've already done this. We tell the line to get split by spaces. So split it into a, an array of strings, an array of strings, which is the, let's call it um, items. So we're getting the items by splitting the line by spaces. So each of these items will be a number, but a number represented as a string. And now these numbers I need to initialize with the same length that the items have. So initialize them, initialize them by items.length and then run a for loop starting from zero and continuing up until we reach numbers.length. And what will we do with that? Well, we'll set the numbers at position i to the value of items at position i, but we will convert that into an integer through integer.parsent. We've done this in previous lessons already, so I won't, uh, um, uh, I won't give it more time for explanations. You can uh, rewatch the previous lessons if you're still having trouble with this one, but it shouldn't be too hard at this point any longer. So after we've created this array of numbers, we have the numbers and we can use them. For example, we can pass them to count positive, pass them to the count positive functions as a numbers array and print that on the console system dot out dot print line print the line of the number of positive numbers in the numbers array okay but instead of writing this code over and over again these uh, five lines or whatever they are instead of writing these lines over and over again can't i make a method which returns this array of numbers and the answer is yes i can let's copy this code and let's create a method. How would I call this method? Well, since converting a single integer is from a string is called parse integer, converting multiple integers from uh, a string would be called parse integer array, for example. So I'd create a static method, which maybe will be void, but it actually won't be void, but let's call it a void method for now, and then we'll figure out what we need to return from it. So creating a void method, call it parse integers or parse integers array. Okay, what will I get as a parameter? I'll figure it out afterwards. So I'll copy the code that I'm going to be using to do the parsing and I'll see what's missing. Okay, well, IntelliJ automatically told me what's missing. So I copied the code and what am I missing? Well, I'm missing the line. So I'm missing the string input. So the string, even the string s, so because this might not be a line, someone might be calling parse integers on something they know contains integers, but it's not a line of strings. It may be a, a part of a line of strings. Okay, so parse integers. And now, instead of uh, this being a void method, 
What does it need to return? What's the result of this method? Well, what I'm creating is the numbers array. So what I need to return is the numbers array. Now, if I don't know how to change this void return type into a numbers array type, I can just go over here, press Alt and Enter and select the suggested fix, which is make the parse integers method return an integer array. Okay, so I got that. And now I can just call this method and say numbers, the numbers array, instead of parsing it manually, I can just call the parse integers method and supply this line string. And now I have my numbers generated from that line. So now I have a method which I can reuse in other code as well, which just reads a line of numbers. And this is very useful for exams because if you have such a method, well, you don't need to code it again. You can just copy paste it into your solution and call it from wherever you need it. Okay, so now we can parse a line of numbers and we can even shorten this code even long even more. We can just say parse integers of the next line of the console. It became a lot uh, more uh, neat than it was before, right? Instead of having a huge for loop here, which I need to read to understand what it does, now I just see that, okay, I'm parsing an integers array from a string from the console. Instead of having to read through the code and understand what each part of that code does, I'm just following the names of the methods. Okay, so this code is going to work. Let's just test it uh, just in case I've made some mistake while coding it. So let's say the line of numbers is 3 minus 4, 42, 0, 71. So the number of positive numbers is 3, 42, and 71. 0 isn't a positive number, it's just a non-negative number. Okay, so pressing enter here, exactly three positive numbers. That's what I expected uh, as an output. Okay, so it seems that this works. Now I tested a lot more before starting to use it again in every program I, uh, I implement, but this is the gist of what you need for reading lines of integers. Okay, so instead of solving this problem, we solved another problem and we actually helped ourselves write code further on. And you can study how this problem problem was solved in, uh, in this solution. It's, pr it's a pretty simple method. It's just uh, a method that returns a multiplication of two values. Okay, another method, this one I'll leave to you again, a method which gets a string and repeats it as many times as necessary. Now, one advice when you if you're uh, using this solution, don't use a string over here, use a string builder, we will be talking about text processing and why uh, it is not good to append multiple times into a string, even though this solution will work. Uh, but until we get to that point, use a string builder over here, and that will optimize the functionality of this repeat string method. Okay, so this method otherwise accepts a few parameters and just does an operation a few times. How does it repeat the string? Well, it just appends over and over again into the same string. It's a pretty simple uh, method to implement. And again, my suggestion is use a string builder and Google how you should be using that string builder to append into a string and to get the string result at the end. Okay, so another method. We have a method that should calculate and return the value of a number raised to a given power. So we, can, we would get 2 and then 8 as values and we need to raise 2 to the 8th power. How would we do that? Well, let's implement that power function. So I'd called, what does this function do? It calculates a power. It's a static function. It returns a what? Well, here the numbers are double, so we will return a double number. Since we're raising a double number to a power, that result is going to be a double number. So, uh, Let's call this method power because it raises a number to a power. And the number we're, we're raising, it's actually not an integer, it's a double number we're raising to a power and the integer power to which we're raising it. Because in this uh, task, we're expecting integer powers because non-integer powers are too complicated to implement uh, with the knowledge we have at this point. Okay, so what does this power method do? Well it's going to multiply the number by itself a power number of times, meaning that we need to run a for loop again, starting from zero until we reach power and multiply number into itself that many times. 
and then return this number. Now, there is something I'm missing over here. What if the power is zero? If the power is zero, I should return one, right? Any number to the zeroth power is simply zero. And actually, if the power is one, I shouldn't be multiplying the number by itself at all, right? So I should be multiplying the number, not power number of times, but power minus one number of times, because if I get one, I shouldn't be multiplying the number by itself at all. So instead of doing that, I could do the following int uh, raised to power equals one, because a number always, a, a, a power number always starts from one, and then I'd multiply, multiply raised to power by number. In this case, if power is zero, this check will immediately fail. So I, which is zero, less than zero will return false. So I will not go into this for loop. So I will return raised to power, raised to power, which is the value one. If I get one, I will multiply raised to power with number exactly once and so on. Okay, so this is the power method. I won't be testing it uh, because that would uh, waste some of our time and we need to discuss some more important concepts, but you can test this method out. How would you call it? You'd just say, go over here and say system.out.println. Print line what? Well, print line the power of scanner dot read the next integers, uh, read the next double and scanner dot read the next integer. So we're reading the double number which, we're, which we will be raising. So we're reading this and then we're reading the integer for the power and we're passing these on to the number and power parameters in the power method. And that calculates the power, returns the double result and that double result we print on the console. I, I sort of uh, pushed it uh, tighter than it needs to be, but I think you can understand what the sequence of operations does. And it's also good for you to learn to read such uh, tightly packed operations and uh, learn to examine them piece by piece. So you start from the innermost operations and then you continue on to the outer ones and then to the final outer one. So test this program at home, try uh, implementing your own solution try implementing a solution with two returns. So another way to solve this problem of uh, raised to power being one is by what? Returning one if the power is zero. So if you see that power is zero on the first line, you can do if power equals zero, then return one. Otherwise start multiplying number by itself until you reach power minus one number of uh, multiplications. That, that's what my initial idea was. And then I decided to go back to have another variable and multiply in that. So play around with that solution. It will be useful for you to uh, see how two returns inside a single method cooperate. Okay, now that we've talked about return types, we need to talk about a bit about value and reference types. And that's actually got to do more with um, parameters of methods than it has to do with, um, with the return values, but it's important either way. So uh, what do I mean by value and reference types? Now, there's an example here, but in order for you to understand that, I need to show you something. Okay, so ignore the code which we've been writing up until now. And let's say we have a simple method which, re which doesn't return anything and we'll call it increment. It will just increase a value and we'll pass in the value x. And this value x we will increment by one. This simply increases the value of x by one. Okay, now let's ignore the scanner and actually we'll not ignore the pr printing but we'll print something else. We'll create a value variable a. We'll assign it the value five, or let's assign it the va value of 42 because 42 is the typical example value in programming. Okay, so what do we do from here on out? Well, let's say increment, uh, by the way, this needs to be a static method, increment a, and then let's print a on the console system dot out dot print line a okay what will happen over here what what's going what's the result going to be well think about it you can even gamble on it if you want uh, 
think about it and what's the result going to be? Well, it's going to be 42, even though in this method we're increasing x by 1. Now, why does that happen? Well, let's imagine this, this wasn't a method. Let's imagine that we get this code over here and insert it in this place. So what will this code look like if I insert it in this place? Well, it would look like int x equals a and then x plus plus. Now, at this point, you shouldn't be surprised why a doesn't change, why a doesn't get incremented. It doesn't get incremented because what well, we're not incrementing a, we're incrementing another variable and that variable's value changes. And first off, it gets assigned by a and if we place a breakpoint over here and start the program, we will see that the breakpoint stops the program over here. And we will see that x is indeed 43 because it took the value of a and then it increased it by 1. Okay, so that's valid and a stays 42. Okay, so what happens when you supply an integer parameter to a method? Well, the method receives a copy of that integer parameter. Kind of like what the for each loop does when you're iterating an array. If you change an element of, if you try to change the element which you're using for iteration, it's not actually changing the array, it's changing just the element which you are using, your local copy of that element. Okay, well, all fine and good then. Then in that case, what is going to happen if we have an int array x over here and we change its first element by increasing it by one? And let's say that we don't have the int variable here, we have an int array arr and this array is initialized by an integer array, array with a single item. Let's say the single item is again 42. Okay, and now we are going to print the single item in that array. Okay, so what will happen now? We're receiving an array. Uh, of course, we need to call the increment method to see if anything happens at all. We're initializing an array. We're passing it into the increment method and increasing the first uh, first element inside that array. What's the output? 42 or 43? Well, if you follow the integer logic, it would have been 42. However, for an array, it isn't. It's 43. Okay, what happens here? Well, arrays and other objects, like for example the scanner, are so-called reference types. Now, there are many ways to understand this, but one way to deal with the concept is that reference types, when passed into a method, are passed by reference, meaning that when you access the type, you're accessing the underlying object. So this ARR object over here, it's actually, that's actually the, the variable name. The object itself is this thing, the initialization of an array with a value of 42. So this is the object. This is just a variable that points to that object so we can access it, access it. But this one over here, this thing is the object. Okay, so this is the object. When we're passing ARR here, what the method receives is just another pointer to that object. It still points to the same object. It's not a copy of the value like it was for the integer. For the integer number, there's no object. There's just an integer, it's just a number. And that number gets copied around. Whereas here, you don't get the number copied around, you only get the reference to that object copied around. So both ARR and X over here point to the same object. They refer to the same object. That's why they're reference types. They refer to objects, they're not the objects themselves. So ARR over here isn't an object, the way integer is a number. If you have an integer X, that, int that integer, this variable x, is the number itself. Whereas if you have an array, this thing isn't the array. This is just a name for this, this array which you initialize. The array is the thing you initialize with the keyword new. That's the object. This is the actual object. And when we assign it to a variable, that variable isn't the array, the object exactly. It just points to that object. So this variable arr points to this object initialized here in this code. So when you pass that ARR around, when you pass that into the increment method, it receives another thing, another copy, which points to this same array. And since it points to the same array, editing that object will edit that array. So editing an element of that object will edit that array. And that's the difference between value types and reference types. 
And here's an example over here. If the cup is an integer, uh, actually this is the case for cup being an integer, if cup was an integer, so if cup was int, simply int, then when we're passing it around, we're actually passing in a copy of that integer. And whatever the fill cup method does, it does to the copy of the integer. But when we're passing by reference, if cup was an integer array, if this was an integer array over here, when you pass it around, you don't really pass around the cup, you pass the location of the cup. And whoever does filling the cup, whoever uh, executes the fill cup operation, will go to the actual cup and fill that. It won't fill a copy, it will fill the actual cup because you're not passing around the actual cup over here, you're passing around the address of that cup, where that cup is located in memory. And that's why this fill cup method actually fills the original cup. So if you want to understand it simply, fill uh, value types, primitive data types, double, int, uh, short, byte, char, uh, boolean, all of them get copied by, by a value, meaning that if you supply them to a method as a parameter, that method receives a copy. Whereas arrays are not copied. Imagine how long it would take if each um, time you sent a method inside, uh, uh, if each time you sent an array inside a method, all of its elements were copied every single time. That would take a lot of time. That's why these sort of objects arrays and actually strings also and string builders and scanners and a lot of other stif stuff we're going to be seeing more and more from here on out from in future lessons. All of that stuff, it doesn't get copied entirely. O the only thing that gets copied is its address. So someone else gets the business card of that object and can visit it by looking at what the business card says. So when they visit the business card, they're visiting the actual object. So what you're passing around when you're passing in arrays or other objects of that type, you're passing in a business card that has the address of the array. And when you go to that business card's address, well, you see that array. So that's the big difference between passing by value and passing by reference. Value types are located actually on the so-called program stack, whereas reference types are located on the so-called dynamic memory heap and those uh, objects on the dynamic memory heap are pointed to by objects from the stack of values of value types. So when you have an object, let's say this is an int array, int array, that's actually just a stack variable which points to the actual object in memory. That's why I said that this this array isn't the actual object. It's an address of that actual object. The actual object is over here, this new int thing which we've initialized. So you have as many objects as you've seen the keyword new. If, you have, if you've seen the keyword new once, like here, and you have one array and then another array in a the method, then probably both of these arrays are actually not copies of the array, not probably, but exactly. These Arrays are not copies of the array, but they both point to the same array. They are just addresses of that array. Okay, so so if it, if that seems a bit cryptic for you, don't worry. All you need to understand is that primitive types, for now though, you know, when we're talking more and more about objects, you need to uh, get used to this concept of reference and value types and how they are stored in memory. But for now, it's enough for you to uh, imagine that integer types, integers, chars, booleans, floats, doubles, and so on, are just copied. You just get a copy in the method. Whereas uh, arrays or strings or scanners or whatever are passed by reference, meaning that whatever this method does, it does to the original object. So accessing elements of the object modifies the object itself. So that's what a reference and a value type are. And we have these examples which I just showed you, what happens when you pass in an uh, integer number to a function and what happens when you pass in, well, well in this situation what's going to happen, we have a number 5 and we try to increment it with 15 and what's, what happens is that this number over here is just a copy of this number 5 over here and you modify the copy, whereas if you get an array and pass that array in, what happens is that you're modifying the array itself, which is this array. Well, 
here's the array, this is the object itself. Here's one way of accessing that array, but here's another way of accessing that same array because why is it the same array? Well, because it's been passed in as a parameter and this parameter arrives by a reference. So this value type is addressed by the numbers reference. And since only one object exists, both of these point to that same object because no other objects have been created. The only thing that has been created is a new pointer to that object, a new reference to that object. So editing items inside that object will change the original object. Okay, so that's all you need to remember. Value types get copied uh, and reference type, value type objects get copied Reference type objects get only their business cards copied and whoever accesses whatever's on the business card accesses the original object itself. Okay, so let's continue on to the last parts of our lecture for today, our lesson for today, which is going to be how we can overload methods. Now what is overloading and what uh, is a method signature is something we'll explain now and then we'll continue on with examples. So. A method signature is the part of the method which can be uh, w which is obvious from where you call the method. So when I go to the code which I had over here, which is uh, which increments a number, or okay, let's go back to the power. That's a bit more interesting. So if I have a method power, and if I call that method power with the number three point five and the power, let's say. 3, so this would raise the number 3.5 to the third power, and I assign it a value, and x equals that value. Oops, it's actually not an integer, it's double. Never mind, so when I'm calling this method, and actually if I ignore the setter, uh, the, the, the getting of the value and setting it to a variable, when I'm, when I'm calling this method, what happens is the uh, Java compiler looks at what parameters I'm supplying to this method and decides based on the parameters I'm supplying which version of this method should be called. Now, what do you mean by version of a method? Well, we'll see it in a bit. So, when you say uh, raise this number to the third power, what Java actually sees is the power method has been called and it's been called with a double parameter and an integer parameter. That's all Java sees. It doesn't really care about the values you're supplying it. At least that's what the Java compiler cares about. During execution, of course, the runtime cares about the actual values. But during compilation, what the compiler sees is just the name of the method and the parameter types of the method and the number of these parameters. Now, this thing over here, what you're seeing here, is called a method signature. The method signature is the combination of the method name and its parameter types, not its parameter names, but its parameter types and the number of those parameters. So if there are uh, three parameters, well, it's going to be a method with three parameters, meaning three data types for these parameters. So this is the method signature. And here, the method signature for print looks like so. Print accepting a string. Again, the compiler doesn't really care about your name the name of your variable. It only cares about the name of the method and the data types of the parameters. So, so that's a signature. Now, how does that matter to the concept of overloading methods and what, uh, what is that concept at all? Well, the signature is what differentiates between two methods with the same names. So actually, the signature is what differentiates between methods at all because it includes the method name as well. So the signature is actually the thing that distinguishes methods. So a method isn't simply its name, it's its name combined with its parameters. So two methods with the same name but different parameters are different methods from the point of view of the compiler. The compiler doesn't really think of the method print which accepts a string the same way as it thinks about the method print which accepts an integer. So it, for the compiler these are just two different methods. Now, if you have two methods with the same name and the same, the same data types for parameters, then you'd get a compilation error. The compiler will not allow you to have two different methods with the same signature because the signature needs to be unique. So when you have the same name for a method, but the signature is different, meaning that the data types are different, what you're 
what you get is the so-called overloading. This is a term in programming, which simply means that you have different versions of a method which accept different parameters. And if you go over here and check out the system.out.print method, you'd actually notice that it's not one print method. It's a lot of print methods, one of them accepting an integer, another accepting a boolean, another accepting a character, another accepting a long, another accepting a float. You get my point. They're, they are the same method name, but they have different parameters and they behave differently based on their parameters. So you can have the same method name with different parameters and that's what we call overloading. Okay, so the example, the, the, the common example is exactly with the print function. If you receive an integer number, you call one print function. If you receive a double number, you call another print function. I will give you another example of overloading. Let's impl implement a get max function. What will that get max function do? Well, let's say it returns an integer number. Uh, it's a static method. It returns an integer number and it returns the maximum of two values, the value A and the value B. Okay, so the signature of this method is what? Well, the signature of this method is get max int comma int. So get max, which return which, which accepts two integer values. Okay, and what would uh, get max do? Well, if a is larger than b, it would return a. Otherwise, it would return b. By the way, do we need the else here? We don't. Why don't we need the else here? Because we can't reach this return value, the, this, this return statement. We can't even reach this return statement if this was true. So if we get a true over here, we get into this condition and then immediately break the method, leave the method and never reach this return b. So when you have multiple returns inside the method, you can skip on, uh, you can cut corners by not doing else's like this. Uh, this else here is redundant because there is no way we can get to this code without, if, if this code has executed. And that's the whole point of the else. The else ensures that you don't get into the uh, code block if the condition was true. But if the condition was true, there is no way we can reach this code block anyway because we're returning over here. So this is a get max method. It returns the maximum of two values. So if I say max equals get max from 4 and 70 and 82, the result will be 82. Max will receive the, va receive the value of 82. Okay, so this is what get max does. Now, if I want to implement a get max, which takes three elements, so I want to be able to calculate the maximum of three elements, not just two elements. Well, I need another function, static int get max again, because it's doing the same thing. So if a function, if a method should do the same thing, why not use the same name, even though it accepts different parameters? So let's say this is a, b, and c. And immediately, what is the signature? What does the signature look like to the compiler? Well, it looks like get max integer, integer, and yet another integer. So three integers, which is different than the signature of the get max with two integer parameters. Okay, so how would we implement this get max method? Well, I'd say int a b max equals get max of a and b, and whatever the maximum of, of a and b is, let's compare that with another get max with C. So the maximum of the first two compared with C should give us the maximum of all of them, right? So either A is larger than B or B is larger than A. The only one we need to compare with C is the larger one. So we get the larger one of these two and then we say again get max of the A, B max and C. So what I'm doing here is actually I'm, get, I'm having one method which is an overload of another method, but I'm delegating back to the simpler version of the, of the method, which accepts two parameters. So that's a sort of a hack you can do with overloading methods. You can have the same method, which delegates to, it's, it's not really itself. This is a different method. Don't be confused by the fact that they have the same name. The compiler doesn't see them as, as being the same method. Only we humans see them as being the same method, but these are actually completely different methods because they have completely different signatures. The same way humans have last names, right? So even though you have the same first name as someone, it doesn't mean you're the same person because you have a different last name. And here it's the same thing. Well, sure, they have a 
the, the same first name, the method name, but they have a different last name, the method signature. Uh, the, actually, the method parameter types, the signature is the whole thing. The signature is the full name. Okay, so this is one uh, utility of overloading. You uh, implement different behavior, the get max of three values is very different behavior than the get max of two values, but it essentially does the same job. So uh, overloading is, is a concept used so that essentially the same operations, the same, the same effect on the output of your program is achieved with methods of the same name but which accept different parameters and may use those parameters in different ways. Okay, so that's typically what overloading is. It's just the option to have the same name of a method which accepts different parameters due to the fact that the different parameters actually supply you with a different signature which the compiler sees as an entirely different method. Okay, and here's another example of this print method, one version which accepts, accepts an integer, another which accepts a string, and another which accepts a, a string and an integer and does something completely different with them. So this is again a completely valid overload of a method. Okay, so the method's return type, something you need to keep in mind, is not part of the signature. Why isn't it a part of the signature? Because there's no way that I can write uh, I can write get max just like this operation. Now, you might say, well, fine, can't the compiler see what I'm assigning it to? Well, not if I'm not assigning it. There are situations where I'm not going to be assigning it or I'm going to be assigning it to something which can be different values. So the return type is not a part of the signature. If you have a void print method and a string print method, those two, and in, if they have the same uh, parameter types, those two are not different methods from the point of view of the compiler and this code will not compile. So the return type does not affect the signature of a method. Keep that in mind. Okay, so I already implemented the get max uh, method for you, so we'll skip over this uh, function. The only thing you need to do is implemented for different data types, implemented for a character, implemented for a string, implemented for an integer, and so on. You can compare strings and integers, the, uh, strings the same way you compare integers, so the code is going to be basically the same, but you're going to allow that method to be called with different value types, thanks to overloading it with different parameter types. Okay, and now once we've talked about what overloading is, and once we've seen a few examples, let's talk about how programs get executed. Okay, so I kind of showed that to you in one of the first lessons where we were talking about the debugger. Let's look at one of the things we were doing here, and I'll delete everything else because we don't... Actually, I won't delete anything. Why, why should we delete anything? It might be useful when we get to the point of naming methods because we have to go back to that to uh, cover again why we name certain methods in certain ways. Okay, so let's get back to this uh, print increasing sequence method and the print triangle method. So let's go into the main method and um, do the scanner initialization, then do the scanner input, so read the next integer from the scanner. We're solving again the task with the triangles. So let's read the next integer from the scanner and say this is the width of the triangle and now let's call the print triangle method with the width over here and now let's start the debugger and see what happens with our program now the way computers organize code that's executing the way um, java code is structured into the executable memory of a computer and how other languages are uh, structured into that memory too is the following. Each time you go into a method, that method gets pushed into the current program stack. These frames over here in the debugger in IntelliJ are the so-called program stack. What's a stack? Well, you've probably washed dishes in some part of your life before. So dishes ordered on top of each other are a stack. The only way you can safely take uh, one of the plates from here is by taking the top plate. You can't take the pot bottom plate because everything else will fall apart. So you push onto the top of this stack. So you go home, you decide you want to eat. You eat 
uh, one plate of something, then you eat another plate of something, and then you eat another plate of something, and then you eat another plate of something, and let's say at some point you reach to eating the dessert. And when you go to wash the dishes, you first have to wash the plate with the dessert. This is the dessert plate. Dessert plate. You first need to wash the dessert plate. Why? Because that's the last plate you pushed onto that stack of plates. And once you've washed the dessert plate, then you can wash the main course plate, for example, and so on. So uh, that's, of course, assuming that you eat dessert after everything else, but you get the gist of what I'm saying. So the last thing you put into a stack is the first thing you can pop out of that stack. And that's actually the terminology. It's pushing into a stack and popping out of a stack. So this, this adds items, whereas this removes items. Popping items removes those items from the top of the stack. Now, why is the stack important? Because notice what's going to happen here. So we're going into the main method. So what happens in the so-called program stack in uh, computer science is that the main method comes over here and becomes the first item in the program stack and it stays there along with all it, all of its variables for example this arcs vari variable and the scanner variable and this width variable and so on so main is the first thing on the stack then it calls scanner.nextInt and scanner.nextInt gets placed on the stack so next int gets placed on the stack Next int execute executes executes and at some point it returns a value. It returns that value to main and when it returns that value and assigns that value to in this case the width variable, this thing gets popped out of the stack meaning this thing gets removed from the stack and width now has a value for example 5. Okay and now when I say print triangle, print triangle arrives on this stack on top of this stack. Okay, so print triangle gets executed and it accepts that width parameter. And print triangle on its uh, hand, on its turn, starts executing for loops which call what? They call the print increasing sequence, uh, sequence, print increasing sequence method. And that executes once and then it gets removed from the stack and then it gets added again and then it gets removed because it's in a for loop and then it gets added again and then removed and added again and removed and added again and removed and so on and so forth until the print triangle method stops calling the um, print increasing sequence method and when the print triangle method finishes its execution it gets popped out of the stack and we arrive over here at the end of the print triangle call so when this in invocation ends all of the stack information for this print triangle gets popped out of the stack and when that ends since we're re reaching the end of the main program as well when we get to that point, the main program will get popped out of the stack and removed. And when that main method gets popped out of the stack, the program ends its ex execution. This is how code gets ordered when you're calling methods. They, you get methods on top of methods on top of methods on top of methods. And only the topmost method gets executed. And when that one gets executed, the next one below it continues its execution. So that's the program stack and we can now see how that happens. So currently we're in the main method and you can see that on the stack. Okay, so now if we navigate into this next int method and place a breakpoint, place a breakpoint over here and press F9, notice how now in the program stack in the frames we have main and on top of it we have next int, which means that next int needs to finish its execution before main can continue for from wherever it was uh, it left its uh, control to next int. So here, main leaves the control to next int. It, it delegates the control of the program to next int. And until next int gets executed, main will not continue. It will stay at this part of the code until next int completes its functioning. Now, when it does, this next int method will get popped out of the stack and only main will remain. So pressing F9 again. Uh, of course, nothing is happening currently because we're waiting from the, for the input for next int. So let's enter, for example, 4. And now, if we go back to the debugger, 
we can see that only main remains because scanner.nextint completed its execution. Okay, and now we have print triangle and if we put a breakpoint over here and press F9, we'll notice that print triangle appears on top of main and this means that print triangle needs to execute fully before we can return to main. Okay, so now going into this for loop, we're still on the print triangle method, but the moment we call the print increasing sequence method and get into that one, we're going to get that one added on top of the stack. So notice that how we're over here and on top of the stack we have the print increasing sequence method which is now finishing up because I placed the breakpoint at the end of that method. And if I want to see where and at which part of the code I got to navigate into the print increasing sequence, well I can click on this stack trace over here. This is called a stack trace. Well, it's actually called a stack. It's called a stack trace if you see an error which describes uh, line by line in which method what thing failed. Okay, so print increasing sequence in it were here, but that was called from over here. Okay, so if I press F9 again, since I'm in print increasing sequence, that will leave the print increasing sequence method and return to this to the next call of print increasing sequence. So this will get popped out of the stack we will get back to print triangle being on top of the stack, it will execute the next iteration in the for loop and then it will pop up the, uh, it will push in the print increasing sequence on, on the stack again. So we're seeing that in action now, I just left the print increasing sequence method and now I'm on the next iteration of the loop, notice that i is now 2, okay? And now I'm going to push this print increasing sequence method back onto the stack. So pressing F9 now, we're back inside the print increasing sequence method and now we can notice that the print increasing sequence is back on the stack. And now we can let this continue on uh, until it completes and wherever this method completes its execution, meaning that when we get to this point at the end of the method's uh, body, print increasing sequence will, let's remove this breakpoint, print increasing sequence will no longer get added on top of the stack because we just asked IntelliJ to navigate to the next breakpoint which is outside of which is at the end of this method meaning that all of the calls to print increasing sequence have been already done now print increasing sequence won't be added anymore and even print triangle will be leaving the stack because we're reaching the end of its body and when we reach the end of its body we will pop that out of the stack and reach the end of the body of the main uh, main method. So here we are at the end of the body of the main method and notice how the main method is the last thing on the stack and after this uh, breakpoint continues forward, after we continue forward from this breakpoint, the next step will be for the main uh, method to be popped out of the stack and for the program to finish its execution. So that's how the program stack works and that's how you can navigate with the debugger through that program stack to check the values of variables at each of those states. Each of the times I paused somewhere in the program stack and navigated up and down on that program stack, I could have examined the variables on that program stack. I even showed you, for example, the i variable and its change in value. So that's how the pro that's how programs encoding execute and we have more examples over here and let's see an, an, an animation of how that programming stack works so if you have main and that calls method a and that calls method b then main will go onto the stack and then method a will cover main over the stack and then that will call method b and that will put method B on the stack and when method B completes its execution it will be removed from the stack and then when method A completes its execution it will be removed from the stack and then only main will remain. Let's see that. So we start by pushing, putting main onto the call stack then main, if main calls method A, method A gets pushed into the call stack and then if that one calls method B that one gets pushed onto the call stack. Now when method B returns, it gets removed from the call stack and control is returned to method A, meaning that program execution continues from where method A left off. And then when method A completes, program execution continues from where, where the main method left off, uh, where it called method A. And when 
it completes its execution, it gets removed from the stack and the program finishes its execution. So that's what the call stack is and it's important for you to have an, a visual idea of how it looks like because it really helps with debugging and figuring out which part of your code executed after what. Okay, so we have another task over here and since it's really similar to what we've already uh, already solved in previous lessons, we have a number and we should split that number into evens and odds. So we should start dividing that number and getting the last digit of that number. And if the digit is positive, we need to add it into um, a positive uh, uh, into an so if the digit is even or non -e or, or even or odd, we need to uh, multiply in the appropriate multiplication uh, in the appropriate product. So we'll have a product for all the even numbers and a product for all the um, odd numbers inside this value of one, two, three, four, five. And what do we need to do? Well, we just need to pop out the last element from here, check, it's, uh, check whether it's even or odd, and then multiply it into the appropriate product. So since we've already done separating values, uh, separating a number into its component values, and since we've already done something similar with calculating the even sum of an array, this is pretty much the same as doing an even sum of an array, even and odd sums of an array. But instead of iterating through an array, we're doing it over the digits of a number, which we've already done. And instead of doing sum, we're doing a multiplication. And that's all which we need to be doing over here. So you can try solving this problem by yourself by using the uh, things we saw in previous examples. And before we go on to the, to the summary of this lesson, let's go back to the naming conventions which we should be following. So what I mentioned earlier was that I was going to go back to the naming conventions and best practices for when we're writing methods after we know what methods are and how they are organized and how their program stack works. So here are your guidelines for how you should be writing your methods once you know, once you now know what they are. So the most important thing you're going to be doing is giving meaningful names. Now notice how I have been naming my methods. Print triangle. Now this might not be obvious if you don't know the task it's solving, but within the context of the task, print triangle is a clear enough name which describes what this method will be doing. Inside it, we have a more generic method which is print increasing sequence. Now, the moment you see the print increasing sequence, you will probably notice that this is a method I can be using in a lot of other places in addition to using it inside the print triangle method. So that's why I'm naming it so generally. Print increasing sequence is something I can call from pretty much anywhere where I need to have an increasing sequence of numbers. Whereas the triangle is very specific for the task at hand. So since it's very specific, I'm giving it a very specific name, which is not very useful outside of the context of the task. But print increasing sequence is valid in any case. It doesn't matter what program you're writing, print increasing sequence is pr pretty clear on what it actually does. So try for names like this uh, uh, more, more often than names like print triangle. But if you have uh, a context specific uh, method, that's also okay. So this is okay, but this print increasing sequence name is better for more general reuse. For non-general reuse, for single use purposes inside a single program with a specific aim, it's okay to have a more non-general name. Okay, uh, what else do you need to know about method naming? So meaningful names and your name should ask, answer the question, what does this method do? It should contain some sort of verb, some sort of action being executed. So whenever I read a method, I should know that this does this operation. For example, system.out.println, print line, tells me that there's going to be printing involved. So I know this method is printing. Um, now, you could use non-verbal, uh, non-verb non method names. For example, the math libraries have a lot of those, like cosine, uh, absolute, max, and so on. But that pretty much only applies for mathematical functions or something very 
domain specific, something very specific for the task you're solving. So try to use uh, verbs in the names of your methods. Now, if you can't find a good name for a method, that probably means that your method isn't supposed to be a single method. If it's doing five things at once and you can't name it uh, in, with a pretty short name, well, it, it probably means that you need several methods to do those five things, se several separate methods. So a method should do one thing. It shouldn't do several different things. And the reason for, for that, you're, you're probably thinking, okay, isn't it better if a method dis does a lot of things? Well, it's only better for the situation you're using it in currently. So for the exact specific place you're calling it. Yeah, it's better because it shortens your code, but it's actually not better because you can't reuse it. If it does a lot of things and you need uh, to reuse some of those things somewhere else, well, you can't do that if it's a single method. Whereas if there are, for example, if your method does five things, if there are methods for each of those five things, then you can recombine the uses of these five things in any way you wish. You can use, for example, the first two things or the first and the last or the, the middle three or whatever combination you actually need to uh, do to execute your code. Like it's a bit like our print triangle method. So print triangle actually does a few things, but it's also subdivided into smaller methods, print increasing sequence, uh, which can be reused anywhere. So even if I don't reuse print triangle, I can always reuse print increasing sequence, which is the more generic method. So the more generic you make a method, the easier it will be to reuse. Now, that's not always the aim, but it's more often than not the aim. Okay, so parameters should, first of all, complement the method name. So you don't need to, um, for example, this parameter last is clear enough in the print increasing sequence contest context. You don't need to name it last number in increasing sequence because the method al already says that. And just saying last, well, obviously it's going to be the last number in the increasing sequence. What else is going to is it going to be the last of? So don't overdo it with naming the parameters. Name the parameters in such a way that they are clear uh, when you after you read the method name and then you read the parameter you understand what that parameter will mean for that method now you should use camel case just like you're using for variable names that's pretty standard so it's not really weird P basically parameter names should follow the same rules as variable names but in addition to that you should think about the method name and you should avoid repeating words from the method name unless you unless it really is necessary and again they should be meaningful uh, another good thing to keep in mind about parameters is that if you're using non-standard unit systems or if you have a project in which it's not clear what unit systems you're using, you should probably supply the unit names for that parameter. So if you're supplying speed in kilometers per hour instead of meters per second, for example, which is the uh, interna international physical standard for measuring speed, uh, if you're measuring speed in kilometers per hour, you should probably mention that in your variable name uh, at the end to just indicate in what unit you're expecting the values to be. And font size in pixels is also a good name because it indicates that, you're that you want to measure the font size in pixels, not, for example, in percentages or in M's or in, um, or, or in some other weird unit. Okay, so your names should be meaningful and they should sometimes uh, mention the units which they are using if they are using some type of unit. Okay, uh, what else? Avoid stuff like uh, underscores and capital letters on the first uh, word of the variable just like you would do, just like you would do for variables. So, so these rules are pretty much the same. Now, as I said, methods should do one thing. They shouldn't do three things at once, especially they shouldn't do three different things. My getMax method gets the maximum value of two values. It doesn't also print that on the console. There are other methods which print. So I have a single getMax method and then I can decide what I can do with that getMax method. Whereas if my getMax method instead printed the value on the console, I wouldn't be able to use that value for calculations. I would only be able to print it on the console. So methods should try to do one thing. 
If they can, they should try to do one thing and there should be another method which uses their return value as a parameter and for example prints that to the console. So uh, another thing you should avoid is very long methods. Now what does method longer than a long screen, longer than one screen mean? Screens are different these days. Um, it, it's not back to the old days where all screens were the same. Uh, every screen is different and special these days. Well, what does one screen mean? It depends on the team you're working with. Most of the time when you're coding, you're, you will be working with a team and you will probably have a standard definition of what's the acceptable length of a method. It's typically 40, 50 lines of code, but it really depends on the team. It really depends on your screen. It really depends um, on you personally. So the point is follow some sort of convention. While you're a student and you're still studying, well, get your uh, screen size and kind of try to have your method shorter, th shorter than your screen size so that one method doesn't fill up your entire screen. And if it starts filling it up, well, extract more methods from it. If you have that much code inside a method, think about can't I get this piece of code and move it into another method which I can just call from my method. The same way you extract code from main into methods, you can extract code from other methods into other methods. You don't need to only extract code from main. Okay, so this print receipt method in this case can have a print header, print body and print footer methods which it calls. And this is also self-documenting because once you see the print receipt method, you don't need to wonder how it works. You just need to know, okay, so semantically this thing prints a header, then prints a body, then prints a footer. If I care about what these consist of, I'll go navigate to the method definition and see that. By the way, if you, nav if you go to, I've told you this before, but let's repeat. If you put your cursor on a, on a method and you press control B, that will navigate you to the method definition. So, or you can right click and press go to definition. Okay, how do you format code? Well, the same way, how do you format method code? The same way that main is formatted. So you, for, you follow the code standards of main. It's pretty similar to what you would do for for loops and while loops and, and so on, with the difference that instead of a for loop, you have the static, the void and the method name or the static and the method return type followed by the method name and then the parameters. Now, in Java, it's standard for the method name to be uh, glued together to the brackets and the arguments to also be glued together to the brackets. But again, check out how the, how the uh, main method is structured and structure your, your code like that. Now, very important, use correct indentation. I'll, and if you don't know what the correct indentation is, input your method and then use Control-Alt-L to reformat your code with IntelliJ so that your code gets formatted with proper indentation. Indentation is actually pretty important because humans are visual creatures and it's much easier for us to detect what, uh, what parts of a code do what when we have inden indented, when we have these parts of code indented in a way that uh, makes them stand out as part of that code block. So indentation is pretty important. Use Control-Alt-L to format your code. Now, if you're, you're writing multiple methods, try to leave blank lines between them. Not just pr try, just do, the, do it. Leave blank lines between methods. Okay, and same goes for loops and if statements. And sometimes you would like blank lines for, from different pieces of code where you indicate that this is a part of code which does something, then there's another part of code which does something else and so on. Okay, so... Another thing you should try to do is avoid long lines and complex expressions. What do we mean by that? Well, if you have a, ver if you have a very long line in a method, shouldn't that be a variable or maybe another method call? Think about that. Don't, don't have very long lines that are as wide as your screen or even up to 70% of your screen gets like too much. Okay, so that's some advice for code structure and formatting. Now I know that all of these things will take time for you to... Uh, create into habits, but that's why we're telling you these things early on. You won't uh, hit everything spot on the first time you're trying to write code, but every time you write some methods, go over these namings and best practices. That's why they're so uh, 
so much in the start of the lecture. That's why we've placed these slides over here, even though semantically we should be talking about them at the end of the lecture, like I'm doing now. So when you've written some part of some piece of code and you're happy with it and it works, go over these uh, conventions and see if you're meeting them correctly. And if you're not, think about how you can restructure your code so you can follow these conventions better and these best practices. Okay, so what did we talk about today? We talked about how we can split large programs into small, easily testable, easily understandable pieces of code called methods. And we said that these methods contain contains declarations, signatures, and bodies, and we call them using their name and their parameters. If they have parameters, if no, if they don't have parameters, we just leave the brackets empty. We also uh, said that these methods can return values, and if they don't return values, we mark them as void. And we also said that when a method returns a value, it immediately breaks its execution, meaning it stops its execution and returns the control of the program to whoever called that method. And we talked about how we can trace the execution of a program and what the program stack is and how we can see that in the debugger. And I hope this was useful for you. I hope you learned something new and I hope you can now use this newfound knowledge to organize your code better and to write it faster even. And of course, if you have any questions on anything we've discussed today, please ask them in all the channels we've supplied for asking questions about the lectures. Uh, happy to have... Uh, done this uh, lesson to you, uh, to done this lesson. Yeah, I, did, yeah I, I definitely did this to you, didn't I? So uh, I'm really happy that I could uh, teach you this concept of methods. It's a very important concept in programming. I hope it was useful for you and I will see you next time.